नमस्कार एवरी वन हैप्पी बर्ल्ड साइड डे रेनाउंड अमेरिकन ऑथर हेलन केलर वन साइड एंड आई कोट दी ओनली थिंग वर्स देन बीइंग ब्लाइंड इज हैविंग साइड बट नो विजन देयर इज नो बेटर वे टू थैंक गॉड फॉर योर साइड देन बाय गिविंग अ हेल्पिंग हैंड टू समवन इन द डार्क थैंक यू एवरीवन आई एम सोना कमल वर्किंग एज सीनियर ऑप्टोमेट्रिस्ट इन जायद मिलिट्री हॉस्पिटल गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन I am Palni Apan Lakshmanan, working as a senior optometrist in Al Zara Hospital, Dubai. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this Knowledge Fest, October 2, on this occasion of World Sight Day. Representing optometry all over the globe, so we call it as October, and this is our second version. We are happy to collaborating with Emirates Society of Ophthalmology for this event. A special thanks to Dr. Omnia Hamam for enormous support. As we all know, World Sight Day is observed annually on the second Thursday of October month since the year 2000. The aim of this day is to draw attention on blindness and vision impairment. Myopia prevalence predicted by World Health Organization will be 50% of the world population by 2050, where 10% will fall under high myopic category. At least 2.2 billion people live with vision impairment. In that. 1 billion cases could have been prevented in order to prevent we need awareness and to spread the awareness we are here today as we all know prevention is better than cure let's move on to today's scientific session and our first session will be the opticals as an eye care professional every day we are measuring pupillary distance but do you know what is the terminology used to mention the distance between the eyebrows it's called glabella by saying that i would like to call optom sana merchant to moderate our first session any questions please put it in the chat box after each session there will be a panel discussion to answer the queries over to you ms sana thank you everyone and good evening to all let us start our session by welcoming our first speaker for the day mr murtaza ibrahim he is currently working as a senior manager and trainer with revoli vision academy and has previously headed professional services in lenscar he is going to be sharing his experience today on progressive troubleshooting like an expert over to you mr murtaza the podium is yours thank you sana for that introduction uh, and uh, happy world sight day to everyone uh, connected uh, i'll quickly share my screen Can I get a quick confirmation if my screen is visible? Yes, it is visible, Mr. Murtaza. You can proceed. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, it gives me an immense pleasure to be a part of this uh, forum, and um, progressive is always close to heart, uh, a topic which is always uh, uh, considered to be unique uh, when it comes to dispensing. And uh, today, I'm just going to cover on. Uh, progressive troubleshoot although the time slot given to me is quite cramped it's just 15 minutes but then i'll try to uh, cover as much as possible so uh, just going along to keep it simple basically i would uh, uh, always uh, suggest uh, to follow uh, your own uh, abbreviation here i have taken a very simple abbreviation which is lens model this is something which we uh, follow and uh, it gives us an autonomous result so whenever there is a double shoot uh, basically uh, it is important for us to understand uh, from the customer shoots or the patient's shoots what actually they are feeling so uh, it's a step wise process and uh, to, to remember what exactly we have to do when a customer or a patient visits your clinic with a complain so basically uh, i just follow this lens uh, which says lens l stands for listen e stands for empathize n stands for know and s stands for solve so it is important for us to even before stepping into troubleshoot at the first place we should always ensure that uh, we take uh, the best possible care uh, so that the customer not fall into that troubleshoot category but if they still fall in that category then it is important for us to take the step wise approach so we don't miss on important areas the first thing is no matter how expert you are with your progressive troubleshoot 
it is important that you listen carefully to what customer is complaining about uh, make sure that you empathize with the customer empathize which is the second step is important because there can be uh, the effect of uh, bad optics which uh, customer has faced over a period of time and it is important for us to make sure that we empathize we apologize if there is any uh, problem from our end because of any mistakes that is there then we have to get into a stage stage which is like noting down why uh, a particular uh, complaint occurred and make sure that we go into the final step which is solved but before getting into solving the case it is important that first three steps are clearly documented and we don't leave any stone unturned before suggesting a final solution now solution once you arrive at the solution the only stage that is left over is the follow up uh, that is something which we need to uh, add here which is like for customer experience and engagement it becomes very important now going ahead i'll just quickly uh, share uh, how the dispensing happens uh, in an any uh, given dispensing setup any given optical setup the very first step which uh, uh, plays a major role is the prescription of the customer based on the prescription we get on with the frame selection and then we go then we go for the design recommendation and then, then finally we uh, uh, take the measurements and we get into qc and the delivery stage so this is uh, something which goes uh, stage wise um, and uh, this is absolutely okay but when we come for troubleshoot basically any customer walks in for troubleshoot the first uh, intention is uh, like you know um, be it a store staff be it a, a support staff who is helping with the dispensing or be it optometrist the first mistake that we do is we directly jump uh, on with the prescription which is uh, uh, which actually has to be the last stage when it comes to troubleshoot so basically my approach or a simple way or say uh, if you want to be expert with tr troubleshooting you go in the reverse uh, stage so i would start with the qc and delivery process then on to the measurement segment then i'll go to the design segment then the frame selection segment and finally i'll think about the prescription uh, i will not speed up go to the prescription uh, check um, unless and until there is a, a complaint from the customer which directly uh, shows that the prescription is a major at fault so prescription will always come at the final stage for me to check the check if there is anything wrong but then i'll go stage wise on first and coming the qc and delivery process was clearly explained then it will be checking the measurements then whether the design recommended to the customer was correct then the frame selection and final description Though few steps will interlink, and you may have a frame and a design on the front and back, but always ensure that prescription is the final one which you will be considering for a double check before providing any solution. Now, let me uh, just quickly uh, speak on the delivery process. Basically, uh, when we are doing a delivery, it is important that for first-time user, you dispense them inside the bin. now when i say dispense them inside the clinic it is important we give uh, all the proper tips on how to use the lens where they will find the distance zone where they will have the near zone make them also feel the distortion zone and it is uh, important that uh, um, you go stage wise where you show them distance show them near and then make them feel the intermediate and finally the distortion areas for existing user make sure that you allow time for them to get used to the design allow some time for them to you know uh, feel the lens and then wait for the queries uh explain about the adaptation time now when i say delivery process this happens at the first stage but many a times because of the busy schedule or the customer drops in the uh, shoot for uh, delivery or sometimes customer will get it collected from some friends and relative we may actually not be able to We will not be able to actually go for this step, and then when they come in, the, come in for the first troubleshoot, it is important that you know you, you follow the step. Also, give assurance of timely assistance, uh, just in case uh, when we are talking about adaptation. Always ensure that we should be uh, available to customers, so the follow-up has to happen from our end. 
is the delivery process will not explain properly. Now coming to uh, QCA measurement, basically on a progressive, this is very important. Every progressive lens is going to have micro etchings. So uh, make sure that uh, you are actually marking the micro etchings. You are using the layout chart and you know you are checking for the fitting process in this. And then you will be checking for PDs the moment you take the frame here and put it on this scale. You'll be able to check for PD and you can check the fitting height here. Right from the fitting curve to the bottom of the thing called the fitting height. So this is going to uh, help you understand if uh, the measurement that you have taken uh, during the ordering process and the final measurement which you have done. Uh, if QC was all okay, then it will, this step will help you understand uh, if the fitting was okay. And then it will also help you understand if there is any problem at this stage, then if majorly the fitting height and the PDs are not in place, then you will have to take a call wherein uh, you will have to, you know, replace the lenses to fix the issue. Going forward, uh, let me uh, just uh, share a few important uh, uh, terminologies that will uh, be required when you are trying to troubleshoot a progressive. Now, when we talk about troubleshooting a progressive design, uh, there are a few adjustments and alignments which can happen on the frame surface, on spectacle frame. And this is going to help uh, solve many problems. So the first one is the vertex distance. Now, when I say vertex distance, the distance between the back of the lens to the front of the cornea, very simple one. Uh, basically, the vertex distance can be adjusted uh, using the NOSAT. Uh, you open the nose pad and the vertex distance actually goes closer. If you close the nose pad, it increases. Also, vertex distance can be adjusted by end piece. So you have temple and the end piece can be adjusted in such a way. If you are keeping it tighter, the vertex distance is going to reduce. If the temple end is going to be loose, then the vertex distance increases. So this actually helps you. Uh, uh, this will give you a clear understanding on. Uh, how you can play around with the vertex distance. Uh, moreover, uh, to uh, use as a golden rule, uh, you should have an optimum vertex distance or uh, try to maintain the vertex as close to the eye as possible because every MF change in the vertex distance is going to give you an angular change in the field of vision. So, this is very important that you keep the Excuse me, point. Mr. Murtaza. Yeah. Your voice is cracking in between. It's not clear. So if we can look at that and uh, we can continue. Am I okay now? Yeah, that's better now. Better? Okay. Yeah, better. Continue. Sorry. Yeah. So okay. the first thing which we discussed was what existence. Now let me uh, go on with the uh, other uh, term. Basically, this is a very famous term when it comes to a progressive uh, dispensing. So we have uh, something called as pantoscopic tilt, which is very famous. And uh, any troubleshoot that we get, the first thing we jump is into looking at the pantoscopic tilt. So let us understand what is this pantoscopic tilt. Uh, basically, the frame that you see at the top, this is orthoscopic. So in relation to the ground, it is like exactly 90 degrees. It is not over the cheek or away from the cheek. So this we call it as orthoscopic. So the frame uh, which has an orthoscopic tilt will require some pantoscopic uh, to make sure that uh, the progressive uh, adaptation is better. The one which you see here, the second one is your pantoscopic. So it is uh, the frame angle towards the cheek. So the plane of the frame at the bottom is angled towards the cheek. This is something which is acceptable uh, for any frame particularly when it comes to progressive design. So if this auto we should ensure that we actually try to give... Murtasa, your voice break. is cracking. Your voice is uh, breaking in between. Just, just a second, let me check mine. Okay, uh, am I audible now? Yes, you're audible now. Okay, just a second, I'm just... Which on my camera, I'm just sharing the screen. Okay, is it good now? It is much better. We can much continue. better. Okay, thank you. Welcome. I'm sorry for those break. Uh, um, actually, did not recognize it when it was coming in the in messages. Okay, so let's continue going forward. 
Now, I just have a case and then, you know, I'll just uh, want uh, all of you to just respond on the chat box here. I uh, don't want, to, uh, want people to be um, unmuting yourself. So I'll just present a case here. And uh, I just want uh, you to just think of, uh, you know, the approach which I was talking about. I was talking about, uh, you know, a step down approach, which is think from the uh, delivery perspective, then the uh, QC and measurement perspective, then your lens design, frame design, and finally refraction. Okay. So this is a, a case wherein a 43 years old female, existing progressive wearer, uh, she has a complaint of, uh, you know, uh, on reading newspaper, books, or looking at Android phone, the image appears to get narrow. Okay. Narrow uh, in the sense to just like, uh, take a bit more specific. When she looks at the top of the book, it looks to be broader, but the bottom of the book seems to be narrower compared comparatively. So this is the complaint. Now, pro by profession, she is a librarian, and uh, this happens to be her old RX. Just for discussion's sake, I've kept very simple. Right eye is 2.25 spherical, left eye is plus 250, addition one, and uh, we have A size uh, of the frame, which is 52, B size 30, DBL 16. Uh, the frame is rectangular metal full frame with no spats, right? PD for both the eye happens to be 32. And fitting height for the frame is 21. Now, the design that uh, this particular uh, customer was using, it was a basic progressive design. Now, new RX for this customer was 225 for the right eye, which is same. Left eye was 250, and addition was 125. A size uh, for, uh, you know, if you compare it with the old glasses, it is 53. B size was 31. Uh, the DBL was 17. And with re regular rectangular metal full frame with no spat. So the frame was almost similar to what she was using earlier. PD again was 32 in both eyes. So this is the uh, case. And uh, this time around, um, the second new pair was a wider design. So uh, I just want uh, the participants to just respond in the chat. What do you think uh, could have been wrong here? What went wrong? The new glasses were received as per the parameter which were ordered. but. What do you what do you think? What could be the cause, and how how would you rectify the thing? The case is just in front of you. Just for the want of time, I'll just uh, you know uh, keep this uh, case on for another 30, 35 seconds. Uh, just in the meantime, I'll just check if my uh, voice is clear. Yes, you're clear and it's okay. clearly audible. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I've seen like you know, there are some some responses coming in. Uh, I'll just okay. Some says we can adjust the nose pad. Frame size should be same. Uh, nose pad adjustable. Add pantoscopic tilt. Okay. We can adjust the nose pad. Fine. Good. So response are coming in. Keep, 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 keep them coming. So what I'll do is like, uh, uh, as you are thinking about the case, I'll just, uh, you know, get into the next slide, which will talk about, you know, what all uh, observations or what all note or analysis that we, we should be making from this case. So first thing is like, you know, we fit, we evaluate the fit. So when we when I say we evaluate the fit, please consider the fit which might which might be one of the major cause. When I say fit, this is like you know how the frame is sitting on the face. Okay, that is one area. Uh, next, when we talk about design, if you see the previous case, I'll just go back one slide. You can see the design. It was basic design earlier, and now it is a wider design. So definitely the design is taken care. Because there's some increase in addition power. So if uh, you understand the basics of progressive, as the addition power increases, the distortion may increase on the lens, and 
that is why the customer is already upgraded to a wider design but still she is complaining of a narrow image when she looks at the near objects so here customer is already upgraded to, okay and addition has slightly increased now frame selection if you go with the frame selection there's not a major change except for 1 mm in the a size 1 mm in the b size and overall 1 mm in the dbl okay so there's no not a major change in terms of frame uh now evaluating the prescription if you see overall the prescription the only difference uh, that you have is uh, you know for reading but uh, for distance there is no change right so distance remains same only reading 0.25 changes there so now overall when you see the other three areas are not majorly getting impacted but you have this fit which is one area which needs consideration so the from the solution perspective if you look at it then you know the first thing that like, you know there were definitely there were some answers coming up on the chat box which was talking about pantoscopic tilt so here yeah definitely when we think about uh, giving the solution if you want the impact to be really uh, good then you know club it on with uh, the vertex distance and that is why uh, in the previous slide i was talking about those terminologies you can increase the pantoscopic tilt and decrease the vertex distance so if both are done together it will it is going to improve the overall uh, optics with the lenses now that can also be a possibility that you check the check and verify the fitting height and pd okay if this is not working but the primary solution can be here and finally you can also verify the add power once again because not necessarily uh, that uh, the customer would need the add which is mentioned uh, the customer may need a lower add as well so first solution which would be coming for this particular case would be trying to do the adjustment on the frame if it is still not working then you go for fitting height and pd measurements and finally like you know verify the add power once again so that should be the sequence uh i would just request uh, the the moderator to just let me know how much time i am left with you have actually exceeded the time so you okay, so can I'll, quickly wrap up yeah so i'll i'll just stop here basically i just wanted to uh, quickly move ahead and just share the last two slides basically this is a grid which uh, is uh, which is there which talks about like you know uh, two stage of troubleshooting stage 1 is going to be like if you if you consider your prescription pd and fitting height to be accurate then based on what customer is complaining which is in the first column you can do these adjustments to ensure that the progressive can be these lenses can be saved all you have to do is you have to wisely choose what kind of adjustment you are going to make on the frame so that it gets adapted to your customer so one is first stage troubleshooting wherein you need not replace the lenses for customer all you have to understand is what kind of uh, complaint they are highlighting and what adjustments you will do on the nose pad vertex distance wrap angle and pantoscopic tilt right and then you have a second stage troubleshooting wherein here your prescription pd or fitting height actually is that question mark right now for this the customer complaint is going to be something like this wherein they say they have to move the reading material or the distance vision is blurry near vision is blurry intermediate vision not clear at one side and close an object appearing oblique you know it's not uh, straight throughout so this will actually give you a heads up that uh, there is some error which has happened on the prescription or pupillary distance or the fitting height so there are two stages stage 1 which talks about uh, you know you can actually make adjustments and alignments on the frame and still save your progressive lens make sure that your customer is happy but you should be why on what kind of adjustments and alignments you you will do and stage 2 which talks about uh, error which would have happened during measurement or error which can happen because of prescription so with that i'll just wrap up thank you over to you sir. thank you mr murtaza it was indeed a insightful session to understand 
when a customer comes to us with a complaint, how do we resolve the issues? So let's move forward with our next speaker. Our next speaker is Professor Ramchandra Vishet, who is currently the HOD of AJ Allied Health Institute, and he is the Joint Secretary of ESCO in India. Welcome you, Mr. Ramchandra. You can take the session forward. He will be discussing with us today on artificial intelligence in ophthalmic field. Over to you, Mr. Ramchandra. Thank you, Sana, for that lovely introduction. I'll just share my screen first. My voice is clear? Yes, your voice is clear. Are you able to see my slide? Your slide is also clear. Okay, thank you. What? So, <clears throat> good afternoon, uh, all the who are participating in Dubai. Uh, I thank uh, UAE Indian Optometry Forum on behalf of ASCO India uh, for giving opportunity to talk on the this virtual e international webinar. So uh, before I want to start uh, my this talk, I just quote myself to uh, Peter F, who has said that. If you want something new, you have to stop doing something old. So innovation starts with the creativity and imagining new things and exploring the idea into the real world. Education system being a creative has explored into many parts and now has taken the stage of virtual e-learning. So this COVID era has got a lot of opportunity for the mankind to think innovation in the healthcare sector. However, this technology is changing the way diagnostic methods are likely to be carried out in future. However, this not a replace traditional method, but to add the armor matter of our optometrist or ophthalmologist. So this, this is the reason uh, I was made to take this talk, artificial intelligence in ophthalmic or optometric field. My voice is clear, right? If any interpretation is there, kindly stop me. Sure, yeah. your voice is clear. Okay, thank you. So let me start with the asking question and at the end, you may get the answer for you. Are you ready for future? Uh, the question, you can answer it in the type chat box. Okay, some questions are answering with some yes. Yes, we are. We have to be in future. We have to think about future. So that is the reason I'm taking this uh, talk. Uh, next slide, please. Not moving. Yeah. So this is the objective of my today's talk. I'm going to briefly uh, talk about this because of the time constraint, which is given only for 10 minutes. So I'll just try to finish as much as possible with this objective. So we all know that uh, future is uh, AI, artificial intelligence. There is a study which is done by Jan, uh, artificial intelligence in healthcare, past, present, and future. So according to his study, what he has seen that, so one of the important way to understand or diagnose the clinical, uh, uh, clinical clinically is the diagnostic imaging. So diagnostic, diagnostic imaging is a currently the highest and most efficient application of artificial intelligence based and will likely to further expand as imaging modality become advanced and multimodal. So with this, you can see in a pie chart uh, where you can see that diagnostic imaging was one of the important area of our, uh, even in, uh, in, even in, in uh, ophthalmic, ophthalmology or optometric field. So with this particular study, we can able to understand what is the importance of the uh, artificial intelligence. So, so what is the role of artificial intelligence in optometry? So the question should be raised over here, why artificial intelligence is required when optometrists are doing so many things. So that's another, quite, another way to understand about the artificial intelligence in other part of the other part, other end of the, our uh, 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 other end of the discussion. So uh, as we said, 
So why uh, when optometrists say quiet, when machine can uh, screen and do everything, so still there is a lot of requirement will be in between. There is a bridge has to be uh, between the bridge between the artificial intelligence and optometry. So with this knowledge, what I, I can I tell you about that. So there are uh, during the COVID era, there are so many uh, uh, there's so many things was happening because we are not able to understand certain things and all because this is the area where we can able to promote ourselves for the clinical evaluation. So, what are the application of artificial artificial uh, artificial intelligence? So, there are several artificial uh, applications will be there. I, you can see that corneal topography, dry eye diagnosis, smart intraocular lenses, glaucoma diagnosis, fundus topography or fundus photography or optical coherence topography or contact lens fitting assessment, binocular vision assessment. All these things can be done in in the in the form of artificial intelligence. But due to the time constraint, I am going to just touch uh, certain part of the of models. I'm not going to talk all the model because it will take longer time for you to understand. I'm to, uh, explaining this each model. It will be very difficult task for me. So let me understand how artificial uh, intelligence, uh, how artificial intelligence working. You can see in this particular picture, you can see that you have an input over here uh, in the form of a fundus image. Here the, uh, the, as an optometrist, we enter certain features in the uh, computer and the machine try to classify that and we'll get as an output. So that's what the difference between the uh, the normal machine learning. And when we're talking about the deep learning in the form of artificial intelligence, you have an input over here, we, depending upon the artificial intelligence, it extracts the features and classify the feature. And that's what we get the output as a, our, uh, whatever the, this one. So you can see this particular graph where you can see that the you have x-axis as, as amount of the data and y-axis you have a performance. You can see that both classic machine learning and deep learning, you can see that artificial intelligence has a major role in our uh, practice. So you can see that so even though optometrists are there, even though they are doing the uh, evaluating the patients with the help of the instrument, but still there is a lack in the diagnosing the clinical conditions. So this is a, that is the reason. So artificial intelligence plays an important role where you can able to diagnose, you can classify them accordingly. So this is about how the uh, uh, artificial in, uh, artificial intelligence working model. So I'm going to talk certain models you to understand how that is artificial intelligence working in optometry field. So one of the model to predict the refractive error. So there is a, a study which is done by Vadirajan, uh, a deep learning for predicting refractive error from the retinal fundus image which is published in the 2018, what he has done that he has taken the fundus image and with the help of the artificial intelligence, okay, he extracted this feature and as a, in the form of output, he has classified them as a spherical out component and cylindrical component and pseudo cylindrical component. That's what he has done that. So with this, with this model, we can understand that fundus image from the input of a deep neural network consisting of three residual blocks and the alteration layer to learn the most predictive eye feature and to fully connected layer. So that's what we can predict the what is the uh, refractive error which is uh, uh, that particular patient has got. So this is the one of the models. So I already discussed one model now. So we'll go ahead with another model. So when we uh, when we want to diagnose a dry eye, it's the most sophisticated uh, way to diagnose a uh, clinically. It is most sophisticated uh, diseases to diagnose uh, this one. So we have a lot of no, the algorithm will be there to diagnose this one. So there are different tests will also there. So you can see that there's multi uh, multi type of tests are available to diagnose the uh, clinical condition with the help of the artificial intelligence where we can furtherly evaluate this thing and we can able to diagnose the uh, dry eye condition. So this is how we can, uh, it, it can uh, this is the way you can approach over there. So you can see that DVS2 algorithm approach, it will overcomplicate yourself to diagnose the clinical condition. So when you do certain alteration in your test methodology, it will oversimplification will happen with the help of the artificial intelligence where you can able to diagnose the clinical condition in accurate manner. So with this uh, three models, which I was able to explain you, there are multi, uh, multi way to explain about other model also. So that's what we can able to diagnose the clinical condition about the dry eye. So in near future, the artificial intelligence will play an important or very helpful role in the many points in certain, uh, in, in the chain of uh, prevention of prevention, diagnosis and treatment of ophthalmic diseases. The term team in ICAR team, 
will become even more important than even uh, because uh, uh, than the ever become artificial intelligence will allow for an unpredictable level of appropriate delegation to team member with sufficient uh, level of the training and supervision of uh, supervision of the optometric field with this i conclude myself okay so technology won't replace teacher but or even optometrist but teacher or optometrist who use technology will probably replace teacher who do not use the technology thank you any questions you can ask me thank you professor ramchandra it was indeed a wonderful session and it has surely thrown light on how artificial intelligence predicts refractive errors and how it helps us diagnose clinical conditions thank you so much for your presentation let's move forward with this and we will have a audience poll right now there will be some questions that will be shown up on your screen after this audience poll we will move forward for a panel discussion with our speakers for this session so the audience poll is up right now you all can read the questions and answer them so our first question is it's difficult it's difficult to measure pd in an iso cornea true or false select the best possible answer that you think is right our next question is even 1 mm error in centration of progressive lenses patient will be still comfortable true or false a third set of question is normally calibration tool is used for calibrating pupillometer true or false and the last question for today is the first fda approved ai based instrument to detect diabetic retinopathy is idx dr true or false so i hope our audience has answered this question let's move forward with our panel discussion here so we will be taking some questions that our audience has highlighted here so our audience would like to know mr ramchandra how would artificial intelligence be applicable on contact lens fitting so if you can highlight yeah. uh, some aspects of contact lens fitting with artificial intelligence it will yeah. be helpful for our audience definitely so it is a very good question as i told you it has a wide variety of uh, 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 artificial plays an important role so i will share my one my experience uh, i have invented one device uh, uh, to measure the sharmas uh, with the help of the sharmas and ph i invented this particular instrument and we have done a study on this to understand how ph and sharmas value can be measured so when we doing a study so we are uh, what we have understand that so when we giving this study to uh, to re, uh, uh, record the value of ph value okay that there were two examiner both examiners were doesn't know how uh, they you know they not don't know anything about this particular test and they were graded when we analyze that particular test okay so it was giving a lot of uh, surprise to us both examiners not able to judge proper value of the ph value so this is how the things will happen even in the simple way can uh, we are able to understand that so when i put this in artificial uh, we have made an algorithm to record this ph with the help of the uh, programming okay so we have the, uh, developed a program and to measure this ph value and sharmas value so we have then planned that way and we have come as, uh, we have done a study on that we have come to know lot of things from the uh, this particular aspect so this have one simple example even when we were talking about the contact lens so where especially uh, soft contact lens doesn't make much a difference when you can practice very easily where we can evaluate it easily especially in the cases of uh, uh, rgp uh, or special contact lenses uh, you take the picture even in the uh, topography system we have a some called as a fit assessment you before ordering the contact lens the instrument will try to analyze certain parameter in the topography system so this artificial intelligence will tell you so whether this lens is going to fit or how that difference is that all the things can be able to judge with respect to that particular patient so this is how the things we can we can change a lot of things in the artificial intelligence good to know that it's good to know that different contact lens measurement aspects can be used through artificial uh, intelligence technology good 
We have another question from Mr. Murtaza. So our audience would like to know, how do you measure pupillary distances in squinted eyes or pediatrics who have skid, squints? So would you like to answer this? And yeah, clear our so, audience doubts? So uh, generally, when you measure PD, basically, uh, you know, for measuring PD, you have this PD device. Uh, when you are using this for kids, again, you need to see whether the kids are cooperative when you are using these devices. Uh, there is a knob available in your PD meter which can actually close one eye at a time. So it is always important that you close one eye when you are trying to record the PD for any customer at any age who has a squint. For kids, at times, it becomes important that you do this uh, without the PD meter because uh, you know you just uh, show show them some interesting thing and then you can just try taking the pd pd marking on the frame that they are using so basically uh, it is always important that when you are marking or measuring pd uh, if they are cooperative kids it is fine to do it with the pd meter if not then just the frame which is selected for the kids ask them uh, you can make them wear that close one eye show object of interest and then start taking the mark make sure that you are exactly in the straight line you you're, you should be in the same line uh, as as the kid is to avoid the parallel error. so basically monocular pds should be taken for squinted exactly. patients this is what yes. is the conclusion out of this discussion Correct. good thank you our speakers thank you thanks to both of you to help us understand uh, whatever topics you all have taken let's move forward with the session and i hand over it to our host to continue with the next session thank you so much over to you host thanks sana and all the panelists now we'll move forward to our session number two the posterior segment of each eye is composed of 130 million photoreceptor cells each one of these cells composed of 100 trillion atoms do you know that more than all the stars in the Milky Way of a galaxy. Let's move on to our second session, the rear view or posterior chamber outlook. I'd like to call upon Optum Ujjal Kumar Roy from Murphy Lai Hospital to moderate this session. We are open to questions at the end of the session. So audience keep ready your question. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon all and uh, happy all side day. So for this session, our first speaker is uh, joining us from Australia, his optometrist, Mr. Soumya Mukherjee. He has completed his master's from Melbourne, University of Melbourne, and currently working as a clinical tutor over there. So today he'll be presenting us on uh, population variability of temporal raphe in myopia. Mike is yours, Mr. Soumya. Good evening, everyone. Um, greetings from cold and rainy Melbourne today. And thank you, Optivist team, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, my topic for today is population variability of temporal raphe in myopia, as you have seen. So what is, give me one second, I'll just share my screen. So what is temporal raphe? Temporal raphe is a, is, a, is a line which bifurcates the retina into two halves. And it was first in the, identified by Wallace in 1836, uh, Michaelis in, in 1842, and many others. Ballantyne in 1947 described the anatomical structure as a space that makes the two hemisphere of the retina, otherwise known as temporal raphe. As you can see from uh, the, the, the uh, picture over Somia. here. Mr. Sorry. Mr. Somi, sorry uh, to interrupt. Can you please sit a little far away from the camera? Then uh, the picture will be much better. Yeah, because of the fact, I think I'm, I'm working on a Mac and it doesn't, the, the, the thing doesn't work. OK. Uh, one thing has happened. Okay. Yeah. So it's, as you it's can fine, no? Yeah. Can, can, can you? All right. So as you can see from the, from the picture, when we talk about temporal raphe or about the perimetric parameters, we refer to a systemic symmetric measurement of uh, visual fields. 
Thus, glaucoma hemifill test plays an important role in glaucoma evaluation in today's world. So this picture is a schematic diagram of a temporal raphe. That's the phobia, that's the peripapillary nerve fiber bundles, and uh, obviously that's the disc. Why temporal raphe is important in myopia? For reasons poorly understood, myopia increases the risk of glaucoma. It is possible that progressive axial length may cause some bio mechanical stress, resulting in thinning of peripapillary nerve fiber. And these factors could in, in turn indicate susceptibility of other glaucometer stresses. So myopic eyes differs in shape from non-myopic eyes, which can potentially change the inter, inter, interpretation of clinical tests in context to glaucoma management. And therefore, it is important to understand how retinal uh, tissue changes with myopia. So if you can see the schematic diagram of, of here, it's the fovea, that's the disc. And uh, give me one second. And that's the raphe fiber, raphe, which is, goes from the fovea to the temporal part of the retina. And that's the fovea to raphe angle. The fovea, raphe, and the disc angle is a larger one, which you can see over here. In all these landmarks will help us understand how the raphe orientation in a general myopic page, uh, in a myopic retina works. So if you see this image, it was taken by Johan B.C. Tall in 2014. You can see the on-fast image of the OCT. Temporal raphe is clearly visible in this on-fast image taken by the uh, SD OCT. There's other two images, A and B, uh, from the same group, and it clearly shows the orientation difference in different subjects of the, um, of the temporal raphe. Now, as we go to the to the to diagnosing how the orientation of raphe temporal raphe is, we surely have a question in mind: Can we really measure temporal raphe? So, when we talk about temporal raphe, give me one second. It's just it's not working well. So when we talk about temporal raphe, we talk about measuring the temporal raphe. So in this study, we recruited 83 individuals of which uh, we took the 80 subjects and three of them were excluded because of uh, poor quality of image. So we took also the actual length and the uh, vitreous chamber depth. We measured through A scan ultrasonography and all of the SD OCTs were performed in one eye of the subjects because it was very tedious job and we couldn't uh, do both of the eyes for the time constraint. In the right hand side, we see a spectralist OCT image uh, uh, taken by my dear friend Juan who was very angry having sat there for nearly three hours for the image. And the left-hand side is the on-fast image taken from his eyes. You can actually see the temporal raphe structure uh, quite visible in that, um, in that image. Analyzing uh, the retinal image was a tedious job. Image was taken in the sequence shown in this picture. So the right, we, we had to have a reference point of the disc and we took some uh, low resolution image in the center in, in orientation with the disc and the, and the three images were the high resolution image. The last one was very difficult to take because it was extremely temporal to the retina. The fixation was uh, difficult. So we end up uh, doing the two um, high resolution images, which is one and two. Uh, so here is a nutshell, is a nutshell we see the, 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 the way we took the image. So if you see here is the disc, uh, which, we, which we offered as a reference point. And then we took the low resolution image to where the tilt on the base of the tilting of the fovea to disc angle. The other two 
are the high resolution image as you can see from here. In this table, you will, all, you, will, you will see how we have taken and proceeded towards taking the temporal raphe. Uh, the, all of them, all of the last uh, images were high resolution images. And the last two was scanned 261 frames, uh, sections in frames so that we can have a very good quality image. And so that we can also see the uh, different raphe gaps and orientation of the images. Now, the next thing we needed to do was to grade the images because uh, as you know, the taking of this kind of high resolution image was a kind of a tedious job. And then we do have the reflective artifacts coming into our way. So four um, expert graders, uh, including me, if you call me an expert in that, having done so many OCTs by then, the grading was done keeping in mind that the reflective artifacts are um, and avoiding them while marking the images. So the, the first image shows you the grade zero, which is a quite a good temporal raphe structure. The second one is a kind of a, a, a dismay because of the fact there are certain, but still we can have a look at the rim temporal raphe gap and the nerve endings. And the third one, we had to discard them because of a severe, um, artificial artifacts and reflective defects. Now, what we found from the, uh, from the study, it was, it was, it was a very um, interesting finding and we, uh, what we set out to found, find the, uh, the correlation between the landmarks and the Rempelal Rafa structure, we found a very weak correlation between the uh, phobia to disc and the phobia to raphe angle for different axial lengths. So axial length was the parameter for us to identify the high myo patients, um, including we also had to do the uh, vitreous chamber depth because it was also a kind of a better biomarker for to know the higher myopic patients in general. Now, the temporal raphe positioning is related to the axial length of the eye, which we set out to um, discover was a dismay to us. We found that there's a very, uh, very weak correlation or rather no correlation between them. The raphe optic nerve, optic disc angle changes with the axial length of the eye, which there is, a, there is no correlation for that matter between the fovea to raphe angle and uh, in, in high axial length or high myopic patient in general. As you can see that the, the correlation was very, very weak between, the, between both the uh, 4RAF and the axial length. And similarly, we could find the same uh, weak correlation in the vitreous chamber depth with the 4RAF um, angles as well. The position of the optic nerve head relative to the phobia depends on the axial length. It's also a very mal um, uh, discovery for us that there is no correlation between the phobia dysgraphy angle and axial length too. So what's the major takeaway from this study? So temporal raphe structure provides an insight in diagnosing diseases like glaucoma. It has been found that structural changes in the temporal raphe occurs due to disease like glaucoma, such as enlarged raphe gap. And it's therefore relevant to understand its dynamic and anatomical knowledge. Considering varied size of eyeballs, it also uh, widens our view on how we perceive raphe position and trajectory in high myopes. We also came to know that raphe correlation seems to important, less important in diagnosing diseases like glaucoma. Even though we know that raphe angle increases in, increases in, in, in its size in the, in the degenerative diseases like glaucoma with progression, it becomes more and more difficult to see the raphe orientation. 
future pathway of this study was quite an insightful thing, which we always, always contemplated to do. Um, and uh, the for, first and foremost, we actually do not know the etiology of the temporal raphe as a whole. So raphe trajectory in hyperopic participants would be a great um, future path to follow. And uh, it would be worth to know about the raphe gap in stretched eyes because that's, that's a very important part of the retina which we, have, we, we haven't discovered as much. We know that the raphe gap increases in myopia, in glaucoma. What we do not know is the raphe gap in stretched eyes like high myopes. At the end, yeah, we do recommend you to go and have a look at this paper, which we have uh, published in 2019 in IOVS, which holds a more detailed uh, uh, presentation, what I have just put on tip of an iceberg through this uh, presentation. And uh, if you have any queries, do write to me to this email address mukherjee.s at the red email.edu.au and thank you and a very good night. Thank you, Mr. Mukherjee for your uh, wonderful presentation. Thank so you. now I'd like to call upon our next speaker who's Dr. Manish Singh. He's uh, predominantly worked in the field of uh, glaucoma as a senior consultant and currently holds the post of executive director in Netralayam Super Specialty Eye Care Center, Kolkata, India. So he'll be joining us from Kolkata and today he'll present us on OCT basic interpretation and fallacies. Uh, over to you, Dr. Singh. The mic is yours. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Thank you so much. So thank you for having me in this Optoverse. It's really a pleasure to be part of it. And uh, it's nice to meet so many old colleagues. I was just listening to some more very interesting presentation. Also, especially thanks to Swarna Kamal. So I'll be sharing a bit about role of OCT in glaucoma, a bit about the interpretation and the fallacies. So when Sonakuluma uh, approached me to share a topic, so I thought OCT will be a good topic because why OCT is so important in glaucoma? And if you see, now as a diagnostic modality, OCT has become the most important imaging tool for glaucoma. 10, 15 years back, when we were doing our training in glaucoma, we had multiple options. We had the HRT, the GDX, the OCT, and that time HRT was regarded as one of the gold standards, especially for disc evaluation. But over the next 10 to 15 years, OCT is the one which survived. The reason is one, because it's evolved over time. There were software evolutions. They had much better database. And HRT and GDX were very specific for glaucoma, but OCT was used a lot by our retina colleagues. For retina, I think it has almost become indispensable now. So OCT has become a very good tool for glaucoma also because of its good availability. Now, what we actually see in OCT, one, mainly the retinal nerve fiber layer around the optic disc. We also have a look at the optic nerve head and the ganglion cell complex. But primarily, something which is most commonly seen is the parapapillary nerve fiber layer thickness. And we try to correlate with the normative database to see whether this is normal, borderline, or thin. And that way, OCT will give you a red color for thin, a borderline yellow, and a green, which means normal. So it gives you an idea whether the peripapillary nerve fiber layer is thin, normal, or abnormal. It won't tell you whether it's glaucoma or not. We'll just tell you about the thickness of the arm apple. Now, what are the important indications of OCT in glaucoma? One, definitely ocular hypertension. You can see over time how the patient's disc is changing, whether there are early changes developing or not. In my practice, pre perimetric glaucoma is extremely important. We'll come to it. We'll share some cases of pre perimetric glaucoma where you can diagnose glaucoma before perimetric changes can be seen. 
also to document findings to support your clinical finding in hypertonic maculopathy oct macula can be good and useful to see early cystic changes in the macula and also in certain patients who have problem in hands eye coordination a very old patient not able to fixate properly or not able to perform perimetry these patient definitely oct can be an alternative let us, let us take some clinical example to understand these points one is pre perimetry glaucoma so this is the patient who comes to our opd if you see the disc definitely there is some inferior thinning you can see and there is a you can see the wedge shaped rnf defect can be seen but the perimetry is normal so if the perimetry is normal but the clinically looks glaucomatous these are the patient which we call as pre perimetry glaucoma in these cases oct can be helpful if the oct finding for example in this case you can see the inferior thinning seen in oct correlates with the finding what you had on clinical evaluation so if the oct finding matches your disc finding it gives you an extra evidence to treat this patient but very important it should match just any red area on oct is of no value unless it clinically correlates so for example in this case you have inferior thinning but on oct you can see inferior is more of a border line superior is thin but clinically if you see the disc there is no superior thinning so there is a mismatch if there is a mismatch then you should not go by the oct it should be more of a clinical evaluation and based on other parameters you should decide whether to treat or not also certain cases to exclude glaucoma like this particular patient already diagnosed as a glaucoma as a suspect comes to you for opinion you have done a perimetry perfectly normal if you see the disc it's a large disc very suspicious superior room looks to be suspicious but the rnfl is overall okay you have a gut feeling that this is not glaucoma but you are not very sure you have done a oct oct is showing all green area it sort of gives you an extra evidence to exclude glaucoma so these type of patient oct definitely is helpful to rule out glaucoma so one in pre perimetry glaucoma and second to rule out glaucoma oct can be really a big help now coming to interpretation there are multiple machines available in oct and every machine print out is different they are not clinically correlated so if a patient is having an rnf thickness of say 18 in one machine to do it in another machine it can be different so you can't directly correlate two different machines so what is important whatever machine you are having you should go into detail of the print out try to understand how the machine works what is the normative database what is the signal strength required for the machine it will help you better interpret these report for so this is a serious machine and the one on the right side is spectralis or the heidelberg machine so there are some important point which is applicable for all these for example three key point i'll say you should see before you go to these clock hours and rnfl quadrant because what happened initially when we are seeing oct the first thing which we see is the red and the green areas we think okay this patient has got red area so there is a thinning there is glaucoma don't jump into that first see the signal strength for example in this case you can see the signal strength is normal so in a serous machine 6 and above is normal then you see whether the rnfl thickness map is correct or not whether there is any disc margin blurring or not whether the images are clear or not so whether there is any motion artifact also look for centration in the rnfl deviation map so signal strength motion artifact centration and segmentation you should see first then you should go to the quadrant tsnit graph and the clock hours so this should be the approach again signal strength different machine have different signal strength currently we are having an uh, top con where the signal strength of above 45 is regarded as acceptable in spectralis it is more than 50 so you have to know the signal strength of your particular machine i'll again share a few clinical examples to make it more practical like this is a patient who was suspected as glaucoma and oct was done you can see right eye superior thinning left eye inferior thinning so just looking by the oct looks to be definitely there is thinning could be a glaucoma but again very important clinical correlation if you see the disc there is a temporal slope in right eye left eye again there is temporal slope but there is no obvious thinning as such which is matching so if you match the two eyes right eye there is a superior thinning on oct but the disc superior looks to be fairly okay there is no clinical correlation rather inferior is looking more suspicious 
Same in the other eye also, superior looking slightly thinned out, but in the, uh, OCT, it is more of inferior thinning. So there is no clinical correlation. But I've told you, before you go to this quadrant, you have to see three things. The signal strength, the centration. The signal strength definitely is much lower for a Zeiss machine, which should be six and above. Same thing, we repeated with another machine. We found the signal strength has improved. And if you see the quadrants, they are mostly green and yellow. So if the signal strength is poor, you can have a fallacious result. Personally, I believe if I have a patient with, with OCT report where the signal strength is very poor, I'll prefer not to diagnose based on that report. So artifacts are fairly common and we have to actively look for that. Dr. Asrani has shown that even in the most advanced spectral domain machines, you can have as high as 40% patients with artifact, which can give you a conf confuse you and can create a false diagnosis of glaucoma. There are certain conditions which affect the signal strength. For example, cataract, coronal opacity, vitritis, severe dry eye, vitreous hemorrhage. So in these patients, you understand the light is not able to reach your retina. So patient is having a hazy image. When the image is hazy, the image processing by the machine is defective. It will give you a fallacious result. Machine will not be able to delineate the layers of the retina. And we know there are 10 layers of the retina. So if you can't delineate the layers properly, machine will not be able to tell you what is the correct arnacle thickness. So in these type of cases, personally, I believe you should not use OCT for diagnosing. I used to go as a visiting consultant to Jamshedpur, which is another town in eastern part of India. So this was a machine which was purchased by them. So just a new machine, almost 50 to 60 lakh rupees. And the patient was a disc suspect. When they did the OCT, you can see there was a gross thinning of RNFL in both the eyes. You can see here all the red area. But clinically, it was more of a suspect, not such a severe form of glaucoma. But again, I told you three things you should see. One, the signal strain looks to be fine. But if you see the RNFL thickness map, there are black areas, means there are certain area machine is not able to see the image. Then the disc is totally fuzzy. You can see the disc margin is not clear. So this means the patient was moving his eyes and there were motion artifacts. So this particular report should be discarded. We took the patient back and we repeated the test. Another point you can see here, the TSNIT graph, you can see it is touching the baseline. A very practical point I tell you, rule of thumb, RNFL thickness will never go below 40 micron in any machine. Even if you have most advanced glaucoma, there is total thinning of RNFL, some amount of soft tissue is always there, what we call as the flow effect. So if you see a patient with the RNFL thickness going less than 40, this means there is some problem in image acquisition. So in this case, the segmentation was not proper because of motion artifact. And that is why you can see a 20 and zero micron thickness can be seen. So this report should be discarded. We repeated the OCT and you can see this is much better. You can see the disc here, disc margins are clear. The TSNIT graph is fine. And in this case, definitely there is thinning because the patient had some glaucoma, but it is not as bad as shown in the previous. So you can see the difference here. First disc image and second, you see these were the motion artifacts which we're seeing. And you can see the marked improvement in the RNFL clock hours. So again, I was the point I was going to highlight, sometimes when we purchase a very costly machine, a 50 lakh or a 1 crore machine, we think this is, a, this is the best machine, the best technology. Whatever report I'll get will be perfect. That is not the case. You have to understand your clinical evaluation, your interpretation of report is more important. We cannot blindly go by any of the machine, however costly it is. So segmentation error is another important thing. As I was telling you, machine has to delineate the layers. So suppose there is an epiretinal membrane or there is a macular edema. So RNFL thickness will be increased. So machine will not be able to tell you the correct RNFL thickness. So there will be a segmentation error. Also in myopic patient, we see there is often Coretinal atrophy, because of that, also you can have a problem in delineation. Most machines will have a database between minus five to plus five diopter. So if you have a patient which is very high myopia, more than five diopter, say eight or 10 diopter, these cases, these patients using an OCT for diagnosis of glaucoma can be very tricky. 
again related to uh, segmentation error you can see if suppose there is a high myopia or suppose there is a cystoid macular edema or disc edema a parietal membrane or uvit these cases for example this case which i have shown there is a macular edema so the thickness has increased if you see the tsnit graph the graph is going almost into the white area so it is a abnormally thick arnacle which is not true because of the cme because of macular edema the machine is not able to tell you what is the correct arnacle thickness so the point what i want to highlight if i have a patient with a diabetic macular edema or a erm with glaucoma i will not use oct for diagnosing glaucoma because that result will definitely be fallacious fluorophet i have already discussed because of the residual glial tissue the thickness will not go below 50 never below 40 micron so whenever you are seeing less than this definitely there is some artifact in the machine nowadays we have been using lot of macular scan also this is mainly as a supplement to arnacle thickness the reason is the macula contains almost 50% of the retinal ganglion cells in just 2% area so it has a very high concentration of retinal ganglion cells so it can be used to see early thinning of arnacle early thinning of the retinal ganglion cells and here because of thickness the concentration of cells is very high the flow effect is seen much later compared to what we see in arnacle but in the current use i'll say if you are using oct for diagnosing glaucoma the first thing you should see the arnacle second thing should be the macular scan before i finish i'll just touch two important thing what is the red disease and the white and the green disease the red disease basically is condition where oct by mistake indicates that there is something abnormal for example in this case a myopic patient you can see there is a peripapillary atrophy and oct is showing that there is a thinning and which is touching the baseline also this is thinning is not because of glaucoma because of peripapillary atrophy because of coronal atrophy there is thinning of retina and oct is falsely showing something abnormal this other patient he is an ophthalmologist he was diagnosed as glaucoma elsewhere when we saw the patient large disc you can see large disc with large cupping typically what we see in physiological cupping patient had a spectrolysis done definitely there was inferior thinning in right eye and superior inferior thinning in left eye it confused us because clinically it was very much like a physiological cupping with normal pressure but if you see the report see this is again a 1 crore machine which is a lot of money in india you can see here there is definitely decentration in the left eye and slightly in the right eye also but definitely in the left eye so these machine have auto centration but even in these machine you can have some decentration we repeated the test with proper centration and you can see the report was normal so again i was telling you before you go to the clock hour you have to see these three four points like centration signal strength so this test also shows that these machines can give you a fallacious result green disease again is a condition when the oct is shown everything is green everything is normal but actually the eye is having glaucoma so this is a patient where you can see the left eye disc is normal the right eye definitely there is a disc hemorrhage and very early thinning but the oct is normal in this case what happens there is a thinning of nerve but oct gives you an average you can see this clock hour this is an average of that clock hour so in the average what is happening although there is early thinning but the arnacle thickness is still within the normative database so oct is showing that it is normal when the disease will further progress then there may be early changes in the oct so sometime oct may show everything normal even when there is a glaucoma what we call as the green disease another patient you can see this was a this suspect on oct the clock hours were perfectly normal that day we were also were having a topcon machine with it a topcon there was some early thinning in the right eye inferiorly which was not picked by the spectralis but when we went back to the spectralis what we found that although the clock hours were normal but in tsnit graph definitely at one point it was touching into the red areas and this was perfectly matching with the top cone so before you go to the clock hour you should see the tsnit graph because it will give you a thickness in all the zones what happens in clock hour it gives you average but tsnit graph will give you thickness in all the zones along the circle so before you see the clock hour you should see the tsnit graph also and if you see any dip into the red area that can be clinically significant last case this is a patient 
who was again diagnosed as glaucoma. When he saw the patient, the pressures were normal. He was a fairly young patient with normal central corneal thickness, advanced field loss in both the eyes. So this type of field loss we have seen terminal stage of glaucoma, the last stage of glaucoma. Those cases, this will have total cupping. But if you see that OCT, definitely there is thinning in both the eyes, but some area you still have green zones. But OCT is showing glaucoma, the perimetry is showing advanced field loss. But if you see the disc, the disc on the right eye is around 0.9, but there's a lot of pallor and left eye is around 0.6 with a lot of pallor. So whenever you have so much of pallor and so little cupping, you have to think that probably there is something more. This was a case of methyl alcohol poisoning, which was mimicking as glaucoma. The point again, I'll have to highlight a patient with methyl alcohol poisoning, traumatic optic neuropathy, ischemic optic neuropathy, will have problem in the optic nerve, will have some atrophy of the RNFL thickness. These patients on OCT will show you a picture typical like glaucoma, but it is your clinical evaluation where you will be able to differentiate it. This is a patient where the discs were perfectly healthy. Again, patient was suspected as glaucoma based on OCT done two years back. You can see the age is just five years. In five years, most machines don't have the normative database. So don't use OCT for these patients. This patient OCT was done. There was thinning. Patient was treated for glaucoma. When the patient came to us, we just did a simple perimetry. It was normal. And if you see the disc also, perfectly healthy disc. The pressures were normal. In young age, you don't have high, uh, you don't have normal tension glaucoma. So OCT can be fallacious if you're using in less than 18 years of age. So to conclude, there are a lot of artifacts. See the report properly. Look every segment of the report. Remember, there can be machine to machine variation. OCT is a great tool for diagnosing glaucoma, for helping in seeing RNFL thickness and disc parameter. But whether the patient is having glaucoma is a clinical diagnosis. It is for us as a clinician to decide so I'll just conclude saying the machine can be useful, but the man behind the machine is more important. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Singh. This was indeed a very uh, informative session. Hope this will help our fellow people to understand OCT better. Now I would like to call our next speaker, who's optometrist, Dr. Vasant Mutuswami. He is currently working as a optometry and vision science research, innovation and commercialization in University of Melbourne after completion of his uh, PhD from there. Today, he'll be talking on a novel method to assess visual field in moderate and advanced glaucoma. The mic is yours, Dr. Vasan. Thanks, Rajwal, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, Octavos, for uh, inviting me for this talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, novel methods, uh, a new method we developed in Australia recently to uh, assess uh, visual fields in uh, moderate and advanced glaucoma. So as we all know, uh, static automated perimetry is commonly used to diagnostic technique for uh, diagnosing and monitoring glaucoma and uh, other various ocular and neurological conditions with visual field loss. And uh, so, for example, when someone performs an automated visual field testing, uh, you get a visual field map like this. This is an example 24-2 uh, visual field report uh, of a patient with uh, glaucoma. You can see here that uh, this visual field map produces uh, various ranges of threshold values. Uh, and threshold value is approximately close to close to 34 or maybe about 30, depending on the age. It's considered normal when, uh, when, you, when the threshold value goes down. Uh, this uh, uh, perim if, it, if it reaches zero, it's perimetrically blind, or uh, the other region, you have an, uh, relatively abnormal defects. So why visual fields? So visual fields is really so when you have a visual field reports, uh, usually clinicians, they um, follow patients for every two years or every year or twice a year uh, to monitor change on visual field threshold values, that is a vision loss over the years. And uh, it really helps uh, clinicians in uh, deciding appropriate treatment strategies along with various other diagnostic techniques. Um, so, 
clinical study, uh, study cardiac perimetry has uh, several issues. Uh, one of the common one is the poor precision, that is uh, high test status variability in damaged visual fields. Uh, here we can see uh, uh, the threshold values. These are in the normal uh, uh, visual field area for this patient. Uh, if you test this visual field once, and if you test the visual field again in the same day or in a different day, or maybe after uh, six months or a year, uh, if the threshold values are normal or close to normal, uh, if you look at the left uh, figure here the, within the green box, when you test once and when you test twice, uh, the uh, threshold values are, will be almost similar or maybe close to the previously tested values. But when you uh, look at the damaged areas, uh, here you can, if you see, if you test once or maybe test tw twice or thrice, uh, for example, if an actual true threshold value is around uh, uh, 10 decibel in this in the damaged area, you could get threshold value between uh, uh, 10 decibel or maybe far less than 5 decibel to 20 decibel. This is the high variability. So when you have a high variability of visual field thresholds, uh, clinicians can't decide whether it is a true visual field change over the time or whether it is due to variability, even though you have uh, various statistical measures to compensate for this uh, pro um, uh, variability, mainly for, uh, for the progression assessment. So recent studies have shown that uh, with this uh, highly variable threshold, uh, we can't extract any clinically meaningful information. So the other uh, issue with uh, uh, clinical perimetry is uh, the number of test locations tested. So to keep test duration, that is uh, approximately around five to nine minutes, uh, the perimetry companies have decided uh, to test only 52 locations of the central visual field. So when you have these uh, abnormal threshold values and you don't um, have a clinically meaningful information for uh, deciding on treatment strategies, the option is to uh, test more locations. That is uh, placing test locations between each of these threshold uh, already tested test locations. So, uh, but the problem is when you keep adding test locations, uh, it increases the test time. So when it increases the test time, uh, you get mostly unreliable results. So uh, we have seen lots and lots of improvements over the years. For example, uh, if you look at the common improvement in uh, common development in the perimetry uh, in the last 30 years, uh, that is test speed. Uh, previously, we were using uh, full threshold test procedures, which approximately took 13 to 18 minutes. And uh, recently, uh, a few companies have, uh, one or two companies have introduced faster thresholding procedures, uh, which you can uh, do a perimetry test for glaucoma patients in uh, three to six minutes. Uh, even though uh, test speed has considerably improved over the years, uh, its precision uh, in estimating threshold values remains the same, or sometimes it even goes worse. So you have to test the visual field a few times to get a better reliable uh, visual field reports. And uh, to compensate for this precision, studies have also recommended uh, for uh, more frequent monitoring of visual field uh, tests. That is, instead of going for two visual field tests uh, in a year, may, there are some studies have recommended for three to six visual fields in a year or two. And uh, there are new forms of tests have been introduced uh, recently. Those are uh, uh, portable uh, perimeters based on the tablet based uh, tablets and uh, the computer tablets and virtual reality based uh, perimeters uh, to increase the frequency of visual field testing. And uh, people have also tried uh, using robot assistants uh, to uh, give voice instructions during the perimetry testing. And these improvements are based on assumptions about uh, patients without asking them. So what we did, we asked patients in Australia uh, about their preferences for uh, uh, perimetric developments. And we gave them options such as uh, uh, whether like, uh, uh, we asked the options include uh, similar whether they prefer similar test times as currently used perimetric procedures with an increase in uh, level of information about uh, their visual field and the longer test times but greatly increased information about their visual field and tests that they could do regularly at home to monitor their own visual fields and the shorter test times uh, with a similar level of available information and uh, tests with automated device instructions such as uh, robots or uh, speakers and with, without uh, human interaction and tests that are much quicker, but pro, uh, provide, uh, provide, that provides less information about uh, their visual field. So we asked them 
uh, to rank their uh, preference in uh, uh, by their choice. So what they uh, what they think that is important for new perimetric developments. And here is the result. So most people in our study cohort. Uh, they preferred similar test time. Uh, they ranked similar test time, but with an increase in uh, level of information about their visual field or a longer test time, but greatly with the greatly increased information about their visual field. And uh, as I said before, we can't increase the test time than currently used because increasing the test time can result in uh, fatigue, tiredness, uh, you get unreliable results. So, so we published this paper in uh, ophthalmology glaucoma. Uh, if you're interested, you can... Go ahead and read it online, or if you would like to have a conversation regarding this paper, I'm happy to discuss in future. And uh, the other highlights in the study included uh, patients were uh, include uh, uh, patients were willing for more frequent follow-ups, uh, and contrary to current assumptions that uh, patients don't like doing visual fields and uh, the, uh, there is a dropout in uh, follow because they hate doing visual fields. Uh, on average, uh, the study cohort in Australia, they preferred uh, uh, three or more visits in a year. And uh, they were also willing to do visual, uh, uh, two visual field tests per eye on average in a single visit. And uh, so, and there are lots of expectations from patients, mainly related to communication. Uh, they expect improved communication uh, during uh, or before and after visual field testing by perimetrists as well as uh, they expect detailed feedback and more interactions uh, uh, with clinicians about uh, their results related to visual fields and other uh, clinical parameters. And uh, we uh, hypothesis that uh, uh, when you have, a, when clinicians and patient interaction is improved, uh, this may also improve the clinical uh, compliances for patients. And uh, so we came to the next question. So when patients prefer uh, uh, increased information, uh, is it possible to increase uh, uh, number of test locations without increasing the test time? So what we did was we developed a new perimetric approach called the Australian Reduced Range Extended Spatial Test. So in this uh, procedure, we perform the same uh, similar thresholding uh, as commonly used in like CETA standard or maybe in Octopus where you have dynamic strategy or uh, other uh, faster procedures. So, what we uh, the, how this procedure works is it normally thresholds uh, uh, as in the common uh, commonly used procedures. And uh, when a threshold value is in abnormal region, for example, if a threshold value is less than seventeen decibel, where you have a high test rate test variability and you get no clinically meaningful information. So we just, instead of thresholding, we just check whether the particular location is blind or within the, uh, uh, between zero decibel or 17 decibel. And if it is blind, we flag them as a red, or if it is between zero decibel and 17 decibel, we keep them as yellow. And uh, we save some uh, uh, time in that. So by saving some time uh, without uh, thresholding those abnormal locations, we try to automatically choose test locations in the edges of the scotoma that is close to the borders of the uh, defects, we try to place points. So what happens is, so when you uh, when a patient comes back for a new visual field test after six months or three months or four months or maybe a year, our perimetric, this perimetric approach keeps increasing uh, uh, number of test locations over the time with an aim to gain more information for clinical management. So the uh, specification of RS, uh, this particular approach, uh, is, as I said, it tests more location without increasing test duration. And uh, it automatically places, uh, decides where to place these test locations without any human interaction or human error. And uh, it does not waste uh, test time uh, in this by unnecessarily testing these highly variable locations. This is frustrating for patients as well because uh, when they don't see lights, they keep, uh, they have to look into the bowl for a few minutes without seeing any light and they lose interest. And uh, when you get the report, sometimes you get unreliable report. And this is what makes them you know, angry. And sometimes they don't want to continue doing visual fields because uh, uh, when they have progressive diseases like glaucoma, they have to undergo visual field testing uh, throughout their lifetime. And uh, for uh, progression analysis, you, could, you would expect that, okay, so how is this is going to help in for assessing visual field progressions? Because we've been using a standard test grid like 24-2 or 30-2 or 10-2. Uh, uh, so how this is going to help? So we have also uh, 
are simulated this uh, real um, glaucoma cases for over for few year uh, uh, visit, few visits and then uh, we developed an, a new approaches for progression analysis as well which i'm not going to discuss in this talk um, but uh, our studies have shown that uh, without any modifications to current strategies our uh, our progression analysis method for arrest works and uh, this particular arrest approach is independent of type of visual field defect and this is not only specific for glaucoma or a specific patterns of visual field loss this can be customized to different uh, uh, defects with visual field loss for example in stroke you can customize this arrest approach and uh, you can also incorporate this particular approach in any perimetric algorithm for uh, for example if you if, if you want to incorporate this particular arrest approach in CETA, you can uh, use this particular approach in CETA. and if you want to use it in octopus procedures you can use it in octopus procedures or any other uh, clinically available perimetric algorithms without uh, needing for a new normative database collection and uh, I would like to reiterate that this arrest approach is not a new algorithm. This is an approach to test more uh, locations. Uh, so this is easy uh, without exp much expense, uh, expense. You can incorporate these particular procedures in uh, any clinical algorithms. So here's an example. Uh, we have uh, followed two patients uh, uh, after a year when they had their first arrest visit. So if you look at the middle panel, uh, Arrest approach have added uh, almost like uh, four to six locations in this first patient, the top figure. And when 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 they came back in uh, after a one year three months, you can see uh, that uh, Arrest have added a few more locations. The, these locations, if you look at these locations, most of them were almost uh, close to near normal threshold. And these thresholds could really be used used for assessing visual field change over time. And uh, as I've already discussed about progression, and uh, we could use any mean deviation uh, progression as well, and you can also use uh, point by point progression as commonly used in uh, clinical procedures. Uh, you can integrate those approaches in with RS perimetric algorithm. And uh, yeah, thank you, Optovers, for the invitation again, and uh, thank you everyone who is listening to uh, listening to my talk. And if you'd like to connect with me, you can use uh, LinkedIn to connect. And if you have any questions or interested in visual field research, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vasan, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, for this session, I would like to request our uh, next speaker, Dr. Satya Kakade, who is a well-renowned uh, vitro-retinal surgeon in Abu Dhabi and uh, currently working with Burjil Medical City, Abu Dhabi, and has a vast of 16, ex 16 years of experience as a retinal surgeon. Uh, today, he will be talking on hypertensive eye diseases. So the podium is yours, Dr. Uh, Satya. Yeah. Yeah, good evening, my dear friends. Uh, at the outset, I would like to uh, thank the uh, team from Optoverse for giving me an opportunity. Um, is my slides visible to you? Yes, Are the slides visible? Yeah. Yes, yes. All right. Yeah. So after an overdose of diagnostic, uh, as a clinician, I would be talking on a very important topic. Uh, that is uh, hypertensive eye diseases. And uh, the reason why I chose this particular topic is in most of the presentations and the conferences, you would be speaking, uh, you would be hearing more on diabetic eye diseases. So I just thought that uh, here it would be an opportunity to discuss on hypertensive eye disease, which is a growing concern among the uh, general population. So with this, um, what is the importance of uh, hypertension is the, uh, it is a profound disease and most of the times it is, it is asymptomatic and the worst of it is it involves multiple organs so there is a multi-system effect and the eye is not spared of the effects of elevated blood pressure and certainly as you are aware um, the retina gives us an opportunity to examine the blood vessels in vivo life so with this, we can actually know what is happening with the blood vessels and more so in diseases like hypertension. So hypertensive retinopathy is also a risk indicator for systemic morbidity and mortality 
and this explains why hypertensive retinopathy is of prime importance. So coming to the effects of hypertension in the body, we know that when it affects the central nervous system, there is a huge impact in the form of stroke. In the eyes, there can be loss of vision, which we are going to discuss. And in the heart, it can be in the form of heart failures and heart attacks. You can have hypertensive uh, problems in the kidney in the form of renal failures, as well as uh, sexual dysfunction and other problems associated with this. So having said this, most of the times what happens is the elevated blood pressure has a key role both as uh, effect by itself as well as on the pathogenesis of diabetic retinopathy. And hence, a control of blood pressure has been shown to prevent progression of diabetic retinopathy and prevent blindness as a sequel to it. Several retinal diseases such as retinal vascular occlusions, retinal arterial emboli, macroaneurysms, as well as ischemic optic neuropathy and age-related macular degeneration has its bearing with hypertension. And now coming to the manifestations per se, hypertensive retinopathy is nothing but a spectrum of retinal vascular signs that typically includes retinal arteriolar narrowing, AV crossing changes, the retinal hemorrhages, microaneurysms, and in severe cases, it can involve the optic nerve head in the form of optic disc edema as well as macular edema. So these signs develop due to acute as well as a chronic elevation of blood pressure and the initial response is either a diffuse or a localized vasospasm and a consequent narrowing because of which it can be in the form of generalized arteriolar narrowing or focal arteriolar narrowing. Now coming to the arteriolar narrowing, it is one of the defining signs of hypertensive retinopathy and it is an autoregulatory response to control the amount of blood which has been received by the retinal capillary blood, uh, capillary bed. It is also commonly seen in early phases of hypertensive disease before the onset of sclerosis. Also, the blood pressure remains chronically elevated, then it causes changes in the surrounding venules, and this is called as the arteriovenous leaking sign, that is the AVN and shot. And in advanced stages, as I was just discussing, there can be exudative changes. As you can see in this photograph, on the left, you can see early hypertensive changes in the form of retinal hemorrhages. However, with advancement of the disease, you can have cotinal spots, you can have hard exudates with the uh, appearance of macular edema. So in order to brief it, you can have the manifestations either in the form of acute hypertension or in the form of tonic hypertension. In acute hypertension, it is usually a vasospasmic episode with increased vascular tone. And in chronic hypertension, it can be in the form of intimal thickening as well as medial wall hyperplasia. And clinically speaking, there can be either in the form of copper wiring or silver wiring of the arterioles. In severe hypertension, there can be exudation and no fiber layer ischemia, both in the form of cotinal spots as well as retinal hemorrhages. The, the worst part of it is the accelerated hypertension wherein which it can be associated with increase in intracranial pressure fibrinoid necrosis, as well as uh, the choroidal arterioles. Now, all this while I was discussing about what happens in the retina, equally important is what happens in the choroid. A chronic elevated blood pressure can cause uh, necros uh, necrotic changes as well as sclerotic changes in the choroid, which can be in the form of speaker three, as well as the Elsnick spots. So the retinal microvascular signs of hypertension can also be seen in other systemic diseases, like diabetic retinopathy, radiation retinopathy, anemic or leukemic retinopathy, trauma, HIV, as well as in other in infections. And appro appropriate investigations may be necessary in order to differentiate hypertensive retinopathy with its differential diagnosis. So what does the fundus picture actually mean? So when there is a generalized retinal arterial narrowing with AV crossing changes, it can be a sign of chronic hypertension. So what does it mean? When a person is having hypertension for a prolonged amount of time, it can manifest as generalized arteriolar narrowing. And in contrast, if there is any focal arteriolar narrowing with retinal hemorrhages or microaneurysms and cotinal spots, it just says that it is a recent episode. Also, there is an association between the blood pressure and retinal microvascular signs with older individuals where in which you can have more of sclerotic changes in the blood vessels. 
I will not be going into the greater emphasis on the correlation between hypertensive retinopathy and stroke, but nevertheless, it is very evident that most of the patients who have prolonged hypertension can have stroke with associated cerebral atrophy as well as other risk factors. And also the type of stroke can be in the form of lacuna strokes, or it can be in the form of non-lacuna thrombotic or cardioembolic strokes. Again, there is a huge association between hypertension and heart disease, which can be in the form of congestive heart failure, or it can be in the form of increase in the coronary artery calcium scores. Also, the retinal arterial narrowing can be associated with decreased myocardial blood flow, and there is also a correlation between hypertensive changes and the internal carotid intimal medial thickness. So certainly, it is not only in the brain as well as in the heart, it can also manifest in other places. And um, as widely been discussed, uh, the most uh, accepted classification is the Kate Wegner and Barker classification of hypertensive retinopathy. In grade one, there is a uh, mild generalized retinal arterial narrowing. So when you just see the fundus pictures of generalized arterial narrowing, it generally means that it is a mild form of hypertensive retinopathy. Moving up the ladder, in grade two hypertensive retinopathy, there can be foveal uh, focal um, arterial narrowing with AV processing changes. In grade three, that can be flame-shaped hemorrhages as well as hard exudates and partner spots. And in malignant retinopathy, it can be in the form of uh, optic disc, edema, as well as exudative changes. The newer classification is in the form of mild, moderate, and malignant, which has a association between the systemic features as well as the hypertensive retinopathy changes. Also, it has a huge impact on the management of uh, diabetes and the progression of diabetic retinopathy. And it has been seen that the renin angiotensin system controlling drugs have a better impact in the control of hypertension and the associated hypertensive retinopathy. Now, what are the other diseases which can be associated with hypertension? It can be in the form of retinal, retinal arterial or occlusions, or it can be in the form of retinal venous occlusions, which can either be a central retinal vein occlusion, or it can be a uh, temporal retinal vein, or uh, one of the segments, the tributary retinal vein occlusions. Also, the branch retinal vein occlusions can be very commonly seen, and it can be uh, also seen as uh, a subsequent event where in which you can have recurrent episodes of vein occlusion, unless and until the hypertension has been under control. The retinal arterial emboli as well as retinal microaneurysms are also one of the commonly uh, seen features of hypertension and the kind of plaques, whether it is calcium, a cholesterol plaque or a platelet plaque can also have a huge impact on the, uh, uh, the future course of the disease. The carotid artery and the heart are the source of emboli most of the time and a thorough cardiac evaluation may be essential. The retinal vascular signs such as AVN, the arterial wall opacification and the vein occlusions are documented to correlate with the presence of retinal emboli. And it can be seen that persons with hypertension at baselines are shown to have 2.5 times likely um, episodes of embolism. Also, the retinal arterial macroaneurysms ram as what has been constantly seen in older individuals with hypertension. These are nothing but the sacular dilation of the retinal arterioles which can sometimes burst open to call or uh, to lead into a ruptured arterial or macular aneurysms. And if it is very close to the macula, it can cause macular edema, which can be amenable to treatment by lasers. The visual recovery typically occurs spontaneously in such patients unless and until it is involving the macula. And finally, one of the most important other manifestations of hypertension is the ischemic optic neuropathy, which is uh, usually seen in the anterior segment of the optic nerve, wherein which it is called as anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, which can which has to be differentiated from other optic nerve head uh, changes like papilledema or optic neuritis. There are two kinds of ischemic optic neuropathy, which can be in the form of anterior ischemic, uh, the arthritic and the non-arthritic type. The arthritic type is usually associated with inflammation, and the non-arthritic type is usually associated with hypertension. So to conclude, the diverse development of hypertensive organ damage and its correlation with changes in the retinal microvasculature 
gives us an opportunity to have periodic checkup of the funders and when there are early changes we can make corrective measures in order to prevent endorgan damage so i just thought that it was important for us to again reiterate on the importance of uh, examining the funders especially in patients who are having hypertension so that we can prevent a catastrophe so thank you for your patient listening if there are any questions i'm ready to take thank you dr satya for this wonderful presentation and thank you all speakers no. uh, so now we will be going for the panel discussion in a while but uh, prior to that there will be a pop up uh, poll for the speak for the audience so once you get the pop ups yes so you can answer try to be as quick possible so it'll be like for autosomal dominant optic neuropathy which type of color blindness mostly seen red green color deficiency blue yellow color deficiency ac acromatopsia or none of the above enferocardiopathy or pi on the floor caused by the four options you can choose your best and which of the following set of test would be least urgently indicated for patient presenting with iop or od22 os46 and the fourth question is in crao like central retinal artery occlusion a cherry red spot is due to so whether it's hemorrhage at macula in cristoidal perfusion and it's in retinal perfusion at macula or contrast between the pale retina and the reddish choroid okay so now we are moving for the panel discussion for this i have a couple of questions uh, first is for mr somya mukherjee like is temporal rafe visible in pathological myopia and what program is used in oct to measure the temporal rafe so the, the temporal rafe is uh, is actually it's not visible uh, it has to be a very high resolution image uh, it, it it has to be uh, taken with more than 161 frame per second and that's why it took a very long time for us to have a cohort of uh, individual to get an assessment because it was tried many a times before but at at a lot at, at at very low population uh, estimation so we did an 83 uh, uh, patients to have a, a, a understanding of the population as a whole and what was your second question sorry uh, like what program in is used in oct to measure the temporal rafing if there is any particular uh... no there's no particular program but there is an art uh, which you have to select in order to get a high resolution image um it is a horizontal and and vertical we tested both of them but uh, the horizontal one is the preferred uh, 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 type of uh, imaging frame that has to be selected in order to get a higher visibility in terms of because if you don't then there are very high uh, ref, uh, what you call reflect reflections because we all tested the the, the normal individuals with a less uh, age like less than 35 years of age and because we have to have an understanding of the structure of the temporal rafe as a whole uh, so it was very difficult for us to get a clear image so uh, we tried many times many methods were used but uh, with the, the vertical uh, high resolution at art 2 261 or more can give you a better visibility okay thank you for your answer from mr somya now we have another question for dr manish like how do you describe the thinning of optic disc by looking at fun at a fundus photo
think Dr. Manish is uh, not available. You can uh, carry forward with the other okay. questions. Uh, if any other speakers would like to answer to that? Or uh, uh, can you please? What, what was the question? The question was like, uh, how would you describe the thinning of optic disc looking at a fundus photo? The thinning of the optic disc, cause, I mean, unless and until you have a stereo photograph, it would be difficult. But as such, the thinning of the optic rim can definitely be seen based on the cup. Okay, thank you for the answer, uh, doctor. So uh, there is another question, like if there is any age limit for performing OCT, any lower age limit or upper age limit for OCT scan to be done. So, uh, the, I question mean, this question, the question was uh, directed towards, uh, I think, one of the glaucoma specialists. But yes, um, so, yeah, having... uh, we don't have them. Uh, I have another question, uh, which is uh, for Dr. Vasant, probably. Like, is the ARREST algorithm that you mentioned, is it available with Humphrey or other visual field machines available in the market uh, currently? Uh... Alas, this is still in development stage. It's almost done. Mm -hmm. So we are validating the procedure in a different population. But it's at the moment, it's not available with any commercial perimetric procedures. And it, even if it starts, uh, if I, even if it's available, it won't be with Humphrey, for, at least for the moment. So it just, uh, it's in a preliminary research test, uh, proof of concept, concept stage. So it will take years to come. It will be it will be there in few years time, but uh, not now. Okay, uh, thank you for your answers. And uh, just one more question that I have: uh, How important is OCT for the peripheral retinal tear, or uh, like to differentiate the ret uh, you know the full thickness tear or a zero hole kind of? All right. Uh, so, in fact, uh, the peripheral OCT, um, this as a diagnostic modality is not widely available. I mean, uh, it is only a lucky few people who can actually capture the peripheral retinal degeneration on the OCT. But having said that, I don't think that should be one of the determining factors for the treatment. Uh, I'm sure clinically we are able to differentiate between retinoschisis uh, as well as a complete retinal hole. Uh, so having said that, that shouldn't really deter. Thank you for the answer and explanation, doctor. And uh, I would like to conclude here the session for the time constraints. I'll not be able to take uh, other questions for today. Uh, for yeah. all other questions, we'll try to answer later on maybe. And uh, yeah. thank you all the speakers for your wonderful time and the presentations. Uh, hand thank over you. to the host. Thank you. Thanks, Ujjal, and all the panelists. The fastest moving muscle in the human body is orbicularis oculi, the muscle that helps to close the eyelids. Do you know how many times a normal person blinks in one day? It is more than 11,500 times. I would like to call Optum Tapashvi Joshi from Rivoli and for moderating our next session, the Ocular Alliance. Dear attendees, use this opportunity to clear your doubts and send in your queries in the chat box. Over to you, Ms. Tapashvi. Thank you so much. Good evening and a very happy World Side Day to all. Let me to introduce our next uh, speaker for today, uh, Dr. Jamil Rizwana. She is a clinical diplomat in binocular vision, pediatric and perception and pediatric optometry. Currently working with Rivoli Group UAE as a Rivoli, as a head of the Rivoli Vision Academy. She's going to share her experience and knowledge on handling asthenopic symptoms in primary eye care clinic. Over to you, Dr. Rizwana. Thank you, Tapashvi, for the introduction. Happy World Side Day to all of you. So just tell me if you are able to see my screen. Yeah, is it clear? And my audio is clear? Video yes, is we clear? can. Yeah? Okay. Yes, we okay. can. Okay. Okay, so first of all, big congratulations to this uh, to this organizing team that put up a brilliant show. 
nice compilation of topics and of course wishing you all a very very happy world side day i'm really proud to be an optometrist and before i start my session i would just like to ask a couple of questions um you just can type in the chat box while i would continue to speak in your own clinical practice how many number of patients you actually see uh, with self reported eye strain or asthenopic symptoms and um, uh, mr bala just said you know like we blink more than 11000 times a day and uh, now all of us staring at the screen we know like we really forget to blink and then we end up with all sorts of asthenopic symptoms so how many how many patients do you get to see in your own practice just think about it and how do you manage them what tests do you do what sort what sort of advice you give and as you keep just thinking about all of this i'm going to just move into my presentation uh which is um, you know i usually uh, people who listen to my talks must have seen this quote of uh, a famous quote that i invariably use in every talk of mine which is from the fine arts of prescribing glasses without making a spectacle of yourself by benjamin milder and melvin rubin so the quote goes like this by now you all know it's a fact there are machines that can refract that's progress and it must be faced but you will never be replaced there are some things machines won't do and complaints still come back to you and especially in this world of artificial intelligence machine learning um uh, augmented reality uh, robotic intelligences remote testing and all all sort of sophisticated tools that are available right out there that really looks like as if it's going to remove the human workforce especially in healthcare we should all remember one thing that when it comes to um, problems it's definitely the human interface that can sort out the problems with the uh, cognitive uh, you know uh, realms that we have and so with that i think i'm going to start with uh, with a couple of cases uh, that uh, i got to uh, interact with our optometrist at rivoli vision so as you see here this is a case uh, of course an auto refractor print out that you would see here of the same patient apparently but as you just see visibly you just see three different readings and uh, and then you just see the fluctuating myopia that's going on and definitely uh, those of us who use auto refractors day in and day out get to see such things but definitely this is a large deviation as you would see here but more than just looking at these numbers as just numbers as you see here every number every average that you get is an average of at least three readings right and of course these machines also take an average of multiple readings even before it gives you a reading depending upon the resolution of the instrument that you use in your practice but what is really key in here is that yes you do see a huge jump okay but you also see a change in the pupillary diameter here okay so something is going on there's some fluctuation accommodation is overacting there's something that's going on but the message that i want to convey here is that generally how many of us take more than just one auto refractor reading i mean we just click tap 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 we print out and then we start our subjective acceptance with just one output but at least when you are handling with somebody who is giving you symptoms of asthenopia and fluctuating vision and then you see a jump in from their existing prescription or all of a sudden you see a newer onset or the first time onset of myopia then i think it's important to sort of keep your eyes and mind open and then um, inquisitively look at what's really going on that's the first message now this is that of a younger patient actually about a this this customer was about 17 years old and then comes the next one this one is about 38 years old and this patient as you see we generally think okay somebody is about 35 entered into the pre press biopic world and maybe accommodation is done but even yesterday we got a patient that was 38 and we saw a very very similar uh, sort of uh, you know a fluctuation where as you see here you just see something like minus 1 at one point of time and all of a sudden moving into plano and plus and uh, and again all of these fluctuations happening more in one eye compared to the other eye and so it's not that you know accommodation is sort of done done at a certain age no anybody who strains the visual system to a certain extent ends up with spasms and fluctuations at any age for that matter 
and so it's really important not just to you know ward off this this whole concept of asthenopia and accommodation accommodation issues beyond a certain age don't do that okay so today i will be in the next 10 minutes uh, sort of give you a glimpse of why it's really important to consider integrating binocular vision into your primary ik practice don't just look at it as a speciality and don't think you need a full fledged orthoptic clinic or a vision therapy clinic to be able to practice and how this covid 19 changed this whole um, you know the, the 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 onset and the prevalence of these problems because everybody talks about myopia but as someone who considers bv as very close to my heart i think it's it's really important for me to tell you that it it, it was not just myopia that sort of went through a big boom but also asthenopia and binocular vision anomalies and also to give you a very very um, sort of a distinctive framework and uh, i'm going to use some cases um so so as you look at these cartoons you see that on to your left you have mr cyclops uh, who has this one single cyclopean third eye and that's all he has of course he has just one eye he doesn't have a third eye just one eye and uh, if you see such a patient in your practice all you need to do is to just give one glass that provides the best vision or if you end up seeing a uh, seeing uh, you know a creature like an octopus um you know that any any um, uh, insects okay or even octopus here for the matter have multiple eyes um and uh, and each of these eyes operates independently of each other so there is no point or there is no concern for you to think about how do i put both these how do i really care about binocular vision no you just have to provide multiple spectacles so that each eye operates independently and has the best possible vision but apparently we are dealing with uh, human beings which are the most evolved species um with frontally placed eyes uh, and uh, as the species evolved in the in the whole origin in the you know in the evolution spectrum we did we did uh, observe the fact that the eyes came closer and closer and then as human beings it has the highest cognitive capabilities um with more evolved neural networks uh that not just helps us to fixate well as you see here but also helps us to bring both eyes together converge on a particular object so that despite having two eyes you continue to see an object as single because of the finest ocular motor coordination and also you are able to follow objects very smoothly and also be able to make rapid refixation eye movements so so we sh we should just stop propagating uh, vision as just you know a matter of 2020 or 66 but rather as something more which is the process of fixating converging accommodating making sense of what you see so vision is the process of deriving meaning from what you see rather than just being able to see clearly and that is where this whole concept of binocular vision comes into existence and as part of my doctoral research work when i you know uh, um estimated the prevalence of binocular vision anomalies among school children what i found is that uh, even at that time this was in 2014 to 17 even at that time the prevalence of binocular vision anomalies has seen a huge jump compared to the data that was uh, you know that came out from the western world almost 2 3 decades back so during the same time when we were researching different papers came out from different parts of the globe okay from south korea from africa from australia and all of these papers also pointed out to the fact that this is pre covid world pointed out to the fact that binocular vision anomalies are sort of like undergoing a rampant increase and there are two important problems that you need to keep in your mind the first problem being convergence insufficiency which is the inability to converge or um you know or poorer conversions present and that's like 16% so what does this number tell you if you're going to see 100 patients in your clinic 16 of them are going to have convergence insufficiency and about 11 of them are going to have accommodative infertility and these are numbers from the 7 to 17 years age category and of course as when the visual demand increases in the work space as you see here the famous word digital eye strain that replaced the word computer vision syndrome came into existence we do see that 
convergence issues and accommodation issues can also precipitate or exaggerate any symptoms of digitalized strain. So it's not just that you look at digitalized strain as a matter of just you know infrequent blinking or dryness or or any of or uncorrected refractive errors, but also look at it from the perspective of accommodation and virgins anomalies that could potentially exacerbate uh, the symptoms of digitalized strain. This is a this is a you know an interesting paper that came during the COVID nineteen times from uh, Spain. So during the twenty five days of confinement during the COVID nineteen period, the authors looked at what is the impact of this isolation on physical activity and also convergence insufficiency. And what they saw is the cumulative screen times almost increased by two hundred hours during the 20, uh, 25 days of home confinement. And all of us can resonate with that, right? I mean, we started depending more and more on gadgets and laptops and digital devices uh, for not just, you know, work purposes, but also the whole world changed, I think, after uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And this trend hasn't actually changed and, and it's only increasing apparently because of the increased dependency and the whole paradigm shift that the lifestyles have seen after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic was set. So in, um, so in this particular study, the increase in convergence insufficiency in these individuals that had an increased number of screen hours was 100%. So apparently, even when you do not have a problem, but if you have a vulnerable binocular vision system, you end up with the convergence insufficiency. Now, how do I put this to practice? Okay. And this is a conceptual framework that I sort of used in my, uh, used in a, in the binocular vision book that I recently published, where yes, the base of the whole uh, optometric uh, assessment is comprehensive assessment of the eye and visual system where you have to correct for refractive errors. But after you do that, it's important that you look at binocular vision and then other specialized testings. And unless you put all of this together, you're not going to get um, a clear understanding of how the visual system is functioning. And so today I'm going to just focus on the bottom two uh, aspects of the testing. So the first case that I just want to share is that of a 34-year-old female who presented to us with complaints of eye strain. And she was just telling us that she couldn't see the near uh, text very clearly. And as someone, you know, you look at the age, not really presbyopic, and then the auto-refraction values give plus 0.5. Vision is 66, distance visual equity is fine, but near vision, she is reading with uh, stress but she's not able to accept any plus on monocular acceptance. So how do you really manage these cases? Generally, some of us end up giving near addition. Some of us end up even going ahead with progressive glasses, but there are ways that we can manage. The very first test that I'm going to pull out from the optometric textbook that you all must have read in your second year or third year is what we call as the Boris delay testing. So what you basically do is that first, you just show a near, near text to this patient ask them to hold it at 40 centimeters and start adding plus lenses in 0.25 diopter steps. You could do this in the foropter or I would recommend doing this test outside the foropter using a trial frame. The whole idea is to look at the maximum plus that's re required for someone to relax their accommodation at 40 centimeters. Now, after you do this, then you redirect the patient's uh, uh, focus to the distance visual equity chart and you do all of this binocularly. Then you start defogging. So whatever value that you got with the uh, with the test, with the negative relative accommodation test, with this patient, we got plus 2.5. You start defogging for distance binocularly in 0.25 diopter steps. Okay. So first you add point, you add plus in 0.25 diopter steps until the patient reports blood at near. Then for distance, you defog in 0.25 diopter steps and you do it really, really uh, patiently. And then you look at uh, what is the amount of plus that's required for the patient to be able to read the 6.6 six or even 6.5 line clearly, comfortably. And that's what is required for you to close the case or to solve the asthenopia problems in such scenarios. So in case if you are like, you know, do not want to even spend that much time, if you have a retinoscope, then put up what I call the MEM retinoscopy cards that you see here. Ask the patient to read those letters on the card at 40 centimeters and you look at how much plus you get and use that as a starting point to look at how much plus I should uh, push for distance. 
if you are somebody who uses foropter day in and day out then you must have seen this target in the near card in the foropter which we call as the fused cross cylinder procedure so what you do is put the fused cross cylinder procedure at a uh, fused cross cylinder test at 40 cm ask the patient which lines are more sharper vertical or horizontal if they say vertical is more clearer the accommodation is good decent but in these cases where plus lenses are um, latent hyperopia is present they usually say horizontal lines are more clearer then you put plus until both the vertical and the horizontal lines become equally sharper and that's the amount of plus that you need for this particular patient and you can go ahead and prescribe it as a single vision glasses that they can use all time now uh, whenever you see a larger plus with these procedures uh, think about latent hyperopia overcorrected myopia or if the patient does not want to wear glasses full time then you can think about um, lenses uh, what we call as anti fatigue lenses or anti eye stress lenses which where you can prescribe lower additions if there is visual fatigue present at uh, near distance the most important test that i would recommend in addition to the uh, borish delayed is doing a cover test outside the foropter so this is a patient that you see here which will uh, which is really important for the next case where as you see this is a patient when you just you know when without the prisms when you see you see that uh, the patient has just just look at the eyes okay just look at the eyes the eyes are moving from inside to outside okay so doing a cover test outside the foropter will really help uh, will provide you with insights if this patient is over converging or under converging so if you see a eso the patient is really exerting too much accommodation if you see an exo this patient is not accommodating as much as they should and if you are using a foropter then you can use what we call as the muscle imbalance measure card at one shot you can really find the amount of near foria that is present so for people who need more information i will explain to this at the end so the next case that i want to talk about is that of a younger uh, patient 16 year old male these are cases that invariably i i bet you will see one or two patients every week um, if you are on to a you know really hardcore refractive practice so this this is a uh, child that came to us uh, with the new glasses prescribed 3 months before the new glasses red minus 3 and the old prescription was 1 minus 1.5 so he gone to a near a near by optical shop where he was prescribed with the newer prescription visual acuity was good immediately but later he started to see that started to experience eye strain and when we refracted again auto refracted through through different values the near foria as you as i showed before when you do a cover test in such cases if you do with an existing prescription of such an overcorrected prescription you will start to see uh, esophoria coming in because this this patient had to now exert more accommodation than what is required with an overcorrected minus prescription the best practice in such cases generally in all cases is to do what i call what is what all of us know uh, binocular balancing so in binocular balancing as you know after you do your monocular subjective acceptance you put plus lenses in both eyes generally you use plus 0.5 or plus 0.75 you redirect the patient's attention to a distance chart you can alternately occlude the eye so generally when you put a plus lens in both the eyes then you see that the visual acuity chart becomes blurred you can put a vertical prism two or three prism based down in front of one eye so that they see two visual acuity charts they are able to compare the clarity of vision in the right and the left eye if you really done a proper monocular subjective acceptance and defogging you expect both the targets to be equally clearer but if they say one is more clearer over the other then you need to add plus lenses to the eye that sees things more clearly and then after you make both equally blurred okay then you start defogging you can also do the same procedure with duochrome but all of this is done binocularly okay the whole idea of binocular balancing is to balance the stimulus to accommodation in both the eyes in that way you ensure that you not over corrected uh, the patient and especially this is so very important in your first time myopic prescriptions when you see a larger jump in myopia and then uh, and like as you saw in this previous case where 
all of a sudden you see auto refractor giving you a larger value and the patient is also accepting a larger myopic uh, value then it's important that you ensure that the patient is not over accommodating so definitely make use of procedures like that of borish delayed and if you want to read more read these papers which is a pretty much extensive version of the borish delayed procedure okay so i'm not going to get into the detail of this procedure if you want to get into a comprehensive orthoptic binocular vision practice then definitely these are all the procedures that i would recommend but the one that i have put it uh, highlighted in red which is the foria the near points of convergence and the near point of accommodation these are three tests that you, i would recommend that you do not miss for every patient and if you just incorporate these three procedures in your primary ik practice by using this conceptual framework which is do a proper history taking ask for what exactly these asthenopic symptoms are all about when does it get precipitated do your refraction right do your basic procedures foria near points right do a proper fogging fused cross cylinder procedure if required refer the patient to an ophthalmologist for a cyclo refraction and then you start recommending your visual hygiene in 2020 rule look at the uh, requirement for vision therapy and prisms and all of it okay so to just summarize whatever that i just spoke even if your patient can read the finest letters on the chart it does not ensure that they have a very efficient visual system because vision is not just about 2020 vision is about vision is more than that and it's all about integrating binocular vision which is aspects of accommodation convergence and your ocular motor movements and doing simple procedures definitely can help you provide much more uh, comfortable and single and clear binocular vision to your patients and if you want to read more you can read the uh, the uh, what i would call the bible for binocular vision by mitchell shyman clinical management or i the one that i wrote which is keep it single and simple binocular vision testing made easy so it's all about making those small baby steps and i would be happy to take up questions during the panel and happy integrating binocular vision into practice and you can reach out to me on forums like uh, linkedin facebook youtube and insta that's all thank you so much dr rizwana for sharing your experience it was indeed a very helpful session we shall definitely get back to you during our panel discussion moving on uh, let me introduce our next speaker mohammad uliullah abdul he is a co-founder and director for binox a vision therapy software and one of the pioneers for vision therapy research for amblyopia and anti suppressions he is going to share with us his experience on the topic of amblyopia management advanced technology over to you mr oli Thank you, Tapasvi, for the introduction. First of all, I uh, wish you happy World Optometry Day, and it's uh, amazing to share the stage with all of you, and especially with Dr. Rizwana on the same forum, and talking about binocular vision uh, outcomes. Though it's a little uh, different than the one that she presented, it's more about amblyopia and its newer modalities or advancement in management. during my presentation if you have any queries please drop into the chat box so that we can take up the questions during our uh, panel discussion mm -hmm. so today's topic uh, to demonstrate or to give you more insight about a little bit uh, about amblyogenic defects in the visual system because that's holds the key of the management that we do and what are the available newer modalities we have at this point of time so that you can manage though there are uh, numerous technologies emerging up but i'll give options which are uh, available so i'll try to get into more of overview rather than get into deep into the uh, research part of it so as definition is a quick review we know that it is mostly unilateral but sometime it is bilateral reduction in the base corrected visual acuity which is not attributed to any Uh, other visual pathway defects uh, or posterior visual pathway and the prevalence is quite huge to 4% of the population and more so till now we used to think of like it's more of amblyopia related to kids and we never thought of adult amblyops who are suffering so it is overall is a huge population which are affected with this binocular vision problem and it is most commonly unilateral as i mentioned but you can uh prevent all these visual loss which are there due to amblyopia if you look at the neurophysiology as i mentioned this holds the key of the treatment 
So we know that the ocular structures are usually normal. Optic nerve pathway is also normal. But what actually happens in the binocular pathway, which are uh, starting from lateral genitric body and the primary visual cortex. So if you look at the next slide, it would give you more information that the primary issues are happening at the fourth order neurons and fifth order neurons. To manage in a way that we want to look, the amblyopia. So first and foremost, you have to correct the cause of it. So if somebody having anisometropia or any refractive error, that needs to be fully corrected. Uh, we do have tendency of undercorrection, uh, but if the focusing of the image is not happening properly onto the retina, then the, the purpose of treating amblyopia gets defeated. So first, a proper refractive correction needs to be there in place before even we think about any any kind of treatment. Even sometimes just prescribing right pair of glasses can resolute the amblyopia. Second, again, any kind of deviation that needs to be managed. Now, this is again a little controversial thought in terms of way we manage. So if somebody is looking at a monocular approach, yes, doing uh, uh, the correction of the strabismus at the later stage makes sense. But if you're looking any binocular approach, for that, you need to manage the strabismus prior to doing the binocular uh, involvement of amblyopia management. And the very simple reason of uh, correction prior doing it is when you keep both eyes open and there is a manifest deviation at any given point of time, you will not able to stimulate the fovea of both eyes simultaneously. Hence, the correction of strabismus, whether you are giving a prism or you give a stick on prisms or a surgical strabismus correction, which is utmost important for any binocular approach. Again, if you have any stimulus deprivation, source of stimulus getting obstructed, uh, whether it's a congenital cataract, dosis, any other corneal opacities, that needs to be connected for amblyopia management. So once we get into the part of treating the visual uh, reduction of the visual acuity, then comes are the most uh, commonly practiced one, which is penalization or patching, then why do we need a different approach? So if you look at this face of the child, that says it all that, okay, there are so many limitations that are there adhered to the penalization or even uh, patching therapy. Let's summarize those quickly. Uh, first and foremost is the compliance. So even though if you try to get the best out of it, the compliance becomes poorer and poorer when the child grows. And it is reported to reduce by less than 50% time when the child is more than five years. And in adults, it's impractical to patch the good eye being the work profession or work environment or demand of the visual acuity from the better eye that is in place. Next, the residual. Even if you overcome the compliance issue, then the outcome is limited to a certain level and it is being observed again, residual amelopia two lines or more, it is usually be there even though if you do uh, six hours full-time patching for the pediatric patient. And next, the time it takes to improve is very slow. Uh, the highest reported is 4.8 line is four months, but mostly it is a line for every three months that gets uh, like reported in the literature. Adult amblyopia, we know that people do try penalization or patching, but the outcome is very, very limited. Uh, it might improve by a line or so, but the moment you stop the patching, it recurs. So recurrence is uh, another issue with the traditional mode. And all this point of time, we never thought of what happens to the patient's binocularity, as Dr. Alzana just mentioned. It's not about just reaching to 2020 or six by six, it's beyond that. And those are the points we never looked at in a traditional mode of treatment. And thus, the emerging concept of amblyopia management is considered to be binocular in nature, and you treat both the eyes together. Now, there are digital therapeutics coming up, but before the digital therapeutics came, it uh, seems to be appeared from a very well-known uh, concept of creating a MFBF environment, which is monocular fixation in binocular field. Just to elaborate what it happens. So if you can create an environment where you have a specific task for one eye uh, under an environment which is binocular in nature, so your uh, 
the process of the visual information happens in the visual primary visual cortex in the binocular way, and that results in very good uh, outcome for any kind of uh, vision therapy. So this was very uh, basic concept to create, and based on this, uh, there are multiple technologies are emerging with some variation in contrast. Somebody takes care of uh, the frequencies, somebody takes care of the spatial frequencies. So many things can be altered and create this environment to tackle the AMLA RPR. Let's see a couple of them available in today's time. So this is one uh, you can do at home, just give a red and green filter to the patient and give them a like sketch paint or red and green color and ask them to draw. Uh, the only thing you need to remember in the environment of white background, so the same color will strike it off. So if you are particularly taking care of uh, any particular eye, make sure the felt tip pen is to be of opposite color to the filter which is put it into the amyloidic eye so that the patient can use uh, the information from the amyloidic eye more. Uh, this chart is uh, quite known to all of us and you, you can increase the difficulty or create the environment of MFB just introducing a red filter on top of it and use the red green glasses and creates a perfect environment for MFB once again. And these are modified. Now, based on the same concept, you can see these Android games are available called Studio Blocks, Regi Blocks, or Duo Vision, and you can play them. And these are all based on similar principles. So the, the, there is no uh, huge innovation into it, but you can see how a basic concept of MFBF is getting incorporated into the digital therapeutics so that more compliance is attained from the patient and you get a better outcome. That is Lazy Eye Snake. Couple of few more games I'll take example. In Apple, you can get Lazy Eye Bubble Shooter. You can get Lazy Eye Breaker and Jump and Fly. So there are numerous of these opportunities or different games are available to try on. Having said that, now when you have these games, you do not have direct control over how patient is doing, how they are doing, or, or, or the customization of the target as per the need of the patient, which is lacking. So the outcome is limited only because of uh, the proper customization as per the patient need. Now, the way in the binocular approach, we can greatly control. I think uh, many of us know this as the Bangutter filter. You can actually uh, control the amount of contrast of the dominant eye or use the um, uh, different graded filter, reduce the visual acuity to the level that you wish to do and attain the binocular environment. And this is one of the greatest tool that you can directly control how much patient should see from the dominant eye in terms of uh, reducing the contrast. Now, this is again, one of the innovative tool which is there available with us. We can utilize them and help the patient managing in a binocular way to get a better results. Let's see what happens to uh, digital therapeutics now. So there is a concept called occlude pad and they, they have just replaced the patching in the digital format. So what would it do is it will just replace uh, the compliance level of uh, what you do a physical patch. Now it wipe out the better eye visual acuity completely as you see is a polaroid glasses being used. So the filter is a polaroid screen uh, um, they use on the uh, iPad and one of the eye, which is the dominant eye, strikes off completely. So patient do not see uh, any target, practically do not see by from that particular eye, only a white screen scene. And from the other eye, patient is seeing the target. Now this is a great, again, a monocular approach, but it's converted into digital therapeutics. Now, as the compliance improves, the outcome is very similar what the patching therapy does. Now, moving forward, this is another option available in today's time, uh, it, uh, named as Luminopia. So they, they are more of a partial patching method. So if you look at this target, uh, it's typically giving a binocular uh, image. Uh, and the summation is happening because there is certain part is blurred in the uh, dominant eye so that the amyloidic eye can see a better quality image and brain can integrate together. And this results is again nice way and because it is uh, a video content which are available and can be utilized so there is no limitation of the content there are uh, more than 500 
contents they have converted into this uh, principle and child can just watch. This is just like watching a video game for them uh, to work with. Uh, then we have Vivid Vision, that's very similar concept. They converted it into a virtual three, uh, reality model. Uh, they use the uh, very similar approach of what uh, the other uh, the program does uh, and also gives you a uh, effect of binocular approach and give you the visual equity. I might have certain uh, animation or video to show in this particular rigors. So as you see in this case, uh, in a virtual reality, it separates the very similar image being projected into two eyes in a different way. And the amyloidic eye, uh, it like tends to get uh, a different kind of images uh, when the adjustment is happening. So, and at the point of time when patient performs, they uh, yield a better visual acuity because it's done under binocular environment. The advantage is being here, again, the compliance goes up, patient or the child plays the activities and it fills the region. But only major limitation can come across if somebody already having a dense separation, it may not work. A very similar, we have something concept called cure site. Again, uh, as a mix of the concept of previous technologies, as you see, very similar technologies are coming up in a different concept. So again, they have a lot of content, like whether you watch a Netflix or a cartoon network, anything, but on their particular specialized device, which based on eye tracker, and they use this dissociative goggles, red, blue, or red, green, you can use. And the content is being uh, dissociated in a manner that the particular, uh, the focus of the target, which is for, from the dominant eye, they blurs that image in that particular zone, and then uh, it pushes the amyloidic eye to see. And this, as you see from the dominant eye, uh, this portion is blurred. So it is forcing the amyloidic eye to see the target and watching uh, it's like a movies kind of thing. So again, the compliance goes up, uh, acuity improves, a uh, major limitation stands still with a dense separation patient or a patient who has uh, tensor amyloidopia. Then somebody tried to mix it up and uh, use combination of both monocular and binocular approach. So there, there are uh, publications there that it can be used as the adjunct therapy or it can be com combined as a monocular and binocular therapies. Uh, to our experience, we say that if you combine two opposite mechanisms in the monocular and binocular pathway, then the results can be suboptimal. In this particular program, they try to combine two technologies or two pathways together and try to get some results. Hence, results in very poor outcome. So if you see over here is the activities which are available, it is monocular. And at the uh, point, some point of time, it becomes binocular as well. So that a specific device with control of the environment, it gives you results in a binocular approach. Now, this is a very interesting concept to get into a binocular treatment. Now, use of Gever patches by Revital Vision is one of them. So what it does actually, it uses a very specific special frequencies, uh, then uh, arrangement of the Gever patches, the level of contrast, orientation, task order, then context, exposure duration, these all are very critical to stimulate a very specific part of the primary visual cortex. And it usually improves the efficiency of the binocular neurons and it increases the CSF function, the contrast sensitivity function. And as you know, if you can improve the contrast sensitivity function, it may result in improvement in the visual acuity. So it's more predominantly to improve the contrast function of the uh, eyes and that results in improving the visual acuity to extend. And this is a great tool again for adult amyloids who has amyloidopia and also limitation in their or a reduced contrast sensitivity for them. Then we also have a program Binox, which is uh, again a dichotic based principle where we try to adjust, uh, we try to overcome uh, some limitation which are there with the earlier technologies or many technologies try to use the concept of uh, either blurring the image or uh, giving a partial occlusion or um, taking care of only the uh, perceptual part of it, which is there in the earlier technology just now uh, explained. So we combined uh, a complete binocular pathway with the perceptual learning to improve the visual acuity. So in this, if you see how things are working, so in a normal condition, 
uh, when there is a suppression present, the brain do not see the image from the amyloidic eye. Now, what we do in Minox, we reduce the contrast of that particular dominant eye, and then brain starts suddenly seeing from the uh, amyloidic eye. And why do it happen? Is because the inhibitory interaction in the visual cortex that goes down when you can reduce the contrast. Now is about the contrast part. Now what happens to the resolution activity? So you start. We start with certain uh, activities which are based on the patient baseline visual acuity, and as the visual functions improves for the patient, like contrast, resolution, uh, the perception of vision, and then the games become more difficult by reducing its size, speed, other spatial and temporal frequencies. So it's a combination of uh, binocular treatment along with the perceptual learning. And at the end, it has a program to improve patient fusion and stereopsis. So overall, as a, a treatment protocol, as you see, the advancements are happening in the landscape of amyloidopia. So it is moving from a monocular approach to a binocular one and more of into digital therapeutics. The reason being with the digital therapeutics and binocular approach, the compliance become very good. And that is the key factor for improvement. And usually the improvement is very fast. You can gain three to uh, six lines on average from different protocol or different technologies. You can gain this kind of visual equity improvement. It can distort the binocular vision effective in older age group, few of the programs effective like revital vision you saw, uh, Binox, you uh, know that these are the program can help only in, uh, only even in adults. And we do not see recurrence once you attain the BSB. So once somebody is already developed stereopsis, a very unlikely brain is going to suppress again and one of the eye and gets into the amyloidic states. So this is the key uh, holding factor of improvement that we get into a treatment. Now, what could be a potential limitation on the newer digital therapeutics is you need to correct the strabismus first. As I mentioned, that if you have a manifest deviation, that correction require prior before the binocular digital therapeutic enrollment. Uh, in case of microstrabismus, it has very, very limited role. So if you have a microstrabismus, you do not, uh, actually the density of suppression for the small area is so strong uh, for a microstrabismic patient that you, uh, really get an opportunity to break the separation of that small photoma. And poor visual acuity again in presence of eccentric fixation. Now, this is directly related to the density of the photoreceptors, which are cones. As we move away from the fovea, the density as well as the size of the cones are less and less. So, uh, the away we are from the fovea, less of the outcome. So, overall, uh, this is how the treatment is evolving. Uh, it's time to embed the right kind of protocol for a right patient so that you can get a better visual outcome. Thank you, Optiverse, for giving me this opportunity to share a newer invention and modern advancement in the digital therapeutics for amyloidopia. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your experience, Oli. It was really helpful to understand some recent advancement technology in amyloidopia. Now, uh, before we get over to the panel discussion, requesting you all to answer a few questions, which will be shortly seen on your screen. Okay. The site for Virgin System Control is located in the... There's only one option, which, which is supposed to be selected. Second, adult levels of uh, stereo acu acuity using titmus stereo test achieved by. Third question, eccentric fixation can be detected by. The fourth question will be the average amplitude of accommodation as per Hofstetter's formula for a 25-year-old will be. Okay, thank you so much for the wonderful session, Dr. Rizwana and Oli. Due to time constraint, we would be taking a very few questions uh, as of now. So first question will be for you, Mr. Oli. How to monitor patient adherence progress for home-based vision therapy? 
Thanks for the question. I think uh, so. It's very interesting when you treat amblyopia from home. So the monitoring of the patient, how they're doing the session, whether they are rightly uh, following the protocol or not, is key factor again to give you a better outcome. So with advancement into the digital therapeutics, you can really control what patient is doing from home, uh, whether they are deviating from the given protocol or not, uh, from uh, the a tool or the backend uh, control system that you get with the, uh, any, any kind of newer digital therapeutics like Binox or maybe uh, Vivid Vision. So you, you can control them. And that is definitely gives you a better tool to yield a better result. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Oli. For you, Dr. Rizwana, what can be the solution which can we offer for the patient suffering from accommodative insufficiency in our primary eye care practice? Okay, so the first thing is to diagnose accommodative insufficiency because uh, as the, in the poll you asked about the Huff-Tages formula. So people should know what is the expected uh, average amplitude of accommodation for a given age. And first, diagnose accommodative insufficiency. Second thing is uh, management is plus lenses. To uh, you know combat accommodation, it's always plus lenses. But whether you want to push plus for distance or you want to prescribe it in the near addition form, depends on some of the tests that we just discussed. In case if there is no significant refractive error, I mean, there is no latent hyperopia, uh, they are like purely emetropes, but still they have accommodation insufficiency. So even if they are belonging to a younger age group, you can always go with nearer additions. You can prescribe those nearer additions in the form of progressive lenses, then start vision therapy. So once you provide near the minimum plus that's required for them to be able to manage their near vision, then you start vision therapy, improve their accommodation amplitudes and facility and slowly wean them off from the near addition. So that is the treatment protocol for younger patients with accommodation insufficiency. Of course, when you cross 35 or 37, you don't call it accommodation insufficiency. You start calling it pre-presbyopia and presbyopia. Thank you so much for the answer. It was really helpful. We would uh, take last question for uh, this particular session and it will be for Mr. Oli. Uh, how different would be analogs versus digital vision therapy for amblyopia? Uh, interesting question. So analog model, as, as you remember, the presentation was taking through the, the entire digital therapeutics uh, started from or based from analog models. So whether you take care of the creation of MABF concept, which I've showed with the pair of analog glasses uh, with uh, whether it's a red filter or a blue filter or a green filter used. So those are the base of uh, starting of your uh, digital therapeutics. So only major different happens in a digital therapeutics is how the patient is doing. So the control over the compliance as well as uh, the parameters that you can customize in digital therapeutics. And that stands out in terms of the outcome. If a patient is sincere enough and doing rightly, analog model gives a very similar results what a digital therapeutics can give. So it's more of compliance and the customization of program, which is added feature in a digital therapeutics. Thank you so much for the answer, Mr. Oli. It was uh, really great having you people over here and uh, uh, giving some knowledge and sharing us your insights. Uh, over to you, Mr. Host. Thank you, Ms. Tapusi and all the panelists. It was a wonderful session, I would say. As we all know, Karne is avascular and needs oxygen for its metabolism. Do you know how much oxygen Karnia requires? Karnia requires about 5 microliter per millimeter square of Karnia per hour. This value varies with ind individuals from 3 to 10 microliter oxygen per millimeter square. So let's proceed for our session number four, the front dome. Let me call upon Mohammed Shuhel from Zayed Military Hospital to moderate this session. A reminder to attendees regarding panel discussion, type your question, then and there. Over to you, Shuhel. Good evening and thank you uh, all. Uh, our next speaker is Optom Pail Khatak. Uh, Optom Pyle is a graduated from, she's graduated from University of West Bengal. She's currently practicing as a head of optometry, Shankar Netralaya, Kolkata. Uh, she has more than a decade of clinical experience. She'll be speaking on corneal lactatia and pendagam advance. Welcome, Optom Pyle. Uh, over to you. It's fine. Thank you. Thank you.
uh, for the nice introduction uh, good evening everyone uh, hope you all are doing fine and uh, today i will be speaking about the cornea lactacea and how to uh, see its quantitative measurement with the help of pentacam i'll be speaking about the various cases So as you all uh, know that cornea lactacea is a non vascular disorder with with which the protrusion of the cornea occurs with the thinning and associated with blurring of vision and distorted images the common kind of cornea lactacea is are catacornas catoglobus clerosid marginal degeneration teres marginal degeneration post lactic ectasia so uh, we all see these things uh, in a normal uh, detection but we need to uh, measure this in a quantitative way so uh, pentacam is uh, one of the instrument which gives us a very quantitative analysis of different kind of corneal ectasia so i first move on to my first case where a 21 years female came to our clinic with a complaint of blurring of vision and otherwise there was no as such major complaints only there was a frequent change of cylindrical power she has noted and when we did a retinoscopy we have observed there is a scissoring in reflex uh, reflection is noted and uh, we could see what is the what is the outcome of the best sighted visual acuity the vision has improved to around 6 6 parts and around 6 9 but the the clarity of visual uh, visual acuity was not there for the patient and the patient was advised to go for a uh, pentacam to rule out the any kind of disorder so when we had done the uh, pentacam the first in the right eye we could see it was the keratometry was almost normal and we could see a, around elevation of around plus 10 which is so showing in the back vertex and when you have uh, moved on to the map uh, which the bellings embrasure enhanced ectasia map we are seeing that there is a suspect in the both front and back vertex though there was no as such elevation noted and in the left eye it the elevation was noted in both front and back and the it was detected at okay, as a keratoconus of kc stage 1 for the right eye but for the, what is the uh, for this what is the right eye there was no as such elevation only the elevation was uh, it was a suspected so we and in the bellings embrasure the sus uh, the suspect we could see so we can say that it is a right eye is a former first keratoconus with this two kind of maps we could keep a keep the patient on a judgment and we could re uh, we have reviewed the patients for few months and after a year we have seen that the this right eye has also moved on to a kc1 stage so this pentacam has given us an idea about where that it the right eye is a suspected keratoconus so i moved on to my next next case which where a 49 years old female visited the clinic with a dimness of vision since childhood uh, as such the patient has been diagnosed as a cataract no such uh, other things was been noted and when we have did the retroscopy we have seen that there was no as such cylindrical power noted for both the eyes but the vision in the left eye was was quite less compared to the right eye where the vision has improved to 69 there was no improvement with pin hole and when we did a slit lamp we have seen there is a <coughs> thinning in the thinning in the posterior corneal thinning was noted but which that was not the significant which we can see through the slit lamp 
and early uh, early posterior capsular opaque ossification was there the cataract was not that much and there is a nebular haze for the patient for in the both the eyes again for a quantitative analysis of the cornea we have done a pentacam and we have seen for the right eye there was no as such elevation noted we can see the maps it was quite normal there was no such elevation noted the keratometric values were also normal and the packy value is also fine but when we have the, when we are analyzing the left eye we could see that there is a, a one keratometric value is a very steep k when the elevations as noted as there was a quite good amount of elevation both in the front and back surface and the packy value was quite low with a thinness packy of around 331 micron and the bellins embrasure chart shows that the detected of keratoconus in both the front and back surface we could and when we was the packy progression map we could see there is a deeping at 4 mm zone and then again there is a upshoot and the main thing is when we have seen the shim flag image we could see that as because of this elevations are there we could make out that the ectasia was quite prominent and it was also detecting a case keratoconus of stage 3 the tkc was showing case 3 but we could make out from it was not a normal keratoconus and we could see the shim flag image how beautifully it has shown there was a posterior fading so we can make out the how petacam is helping us to detect the details of the uh, corneal uh, ectasia where the thinning is been noted where elevation is taking place and how much the yeah, ectasia has moved on so when i'm moving on to my third case a 27 years male visited our clinic with a complaint of distorted of image with a blurring of vision and shadowing of images and he was wearing only a minimum cylindrical value for in the right eye which is around minus 1 we have done the retinoscopy there was uh, the a reflex was quite clear and <coughs> sorry when we have uh, done the, the, the base corrected visual acuity we have seen there is a change in the right eye with the cylindrical value has come around to 3.5 and the, and the vision has improved to 66 in the right, left eye also the vision was quite good it is 66 only and the near vision was also very good but after all all these things the patient was not that happy because still he feels that the shadowing of images is there and he has also a history of recurrent redness for a long time so all, keeping all these things in mind he has also been asked to go for a pentacam analysis and when we have done the pentacam analysis we could see the right eye you see you can see the quite good amount of elevation is noted both in the front and back it in the front you could see around 25 to 27 within 4 mm zone and it is coming on 14 like that in the back vertex and see the map where the you can see there is a superior thinning is noted when we have seen the bellin embrasure map you see there is a superior suspicion is there and for the left eye also as such there was not that much of elevation noted <laughs> bellin embrasure was not showing any kind of suspicion or detection but when you have analyze the relative pachymetry map for both the eyes we have seen that there is a good amount of thinning in the superior portion so all this kind of maps are giving us a qualitative and analysis of where and how much the corneal ectasia is there and it is was a clear suspected case of tense marginal degeneration So my next case is a 31 years male who has come to our clinic with a history of lasik done around 5 years back in 
one eye, his vision was quite good, but he was complaining at quite de gradual decrease in vision in his left eye and the best corrected visual acuity. We cannot see that there was any changes if we have corrected with any kind of refractive error. And it is, uh, it is up to six uh, CF at 15 centimeter. And the near vision was also very poor. So as the case was a post elastic, uh, so it was automatically uh, see, uh, we have to refer the patient for a pentacam analysis to see the corneal things. And when it's slit lamp, that flap of the uh, flap was clearly visible. And in the left eye, we could see a fresher rings with some horizontal stripes. And when the patient has undergone a uh, pentacam evaluation, in the right eye as such, it was only in the front and back we could see in the 4 mm zone, there was a, uh, a, it was a borderline elevations we can say, but as such there was, no, everything was within normal limits. What we see in mostly in the cases of uh, corneal, post corneal surgery patients. But when we have done this left eye, we, you all can see how much the elevated the cornea has become. It is showing around 34 and more than that when we are seeing the maps individually in the back vertex and in the front vertex, it has comes around more than 20, 21, which is quite a good amount of elevation. And you see the catometric value of this patient, such a steep cornea for a post elastic patients. And the Packy value is very less. And there is a, this is the Bellings for the right eye, Bellings abrasio map. So it is normal for the right eye. We could see it is, there is a detection and the keratoconus screening, it was showing a KC of two to three stage. So it is a, quite a case of a post-lastic ectasia. And this is how the pentagram has taken beautifully a shimp -like image. You can see how the thinning and cornea. So moving on to a fifth case. Moving on to the fifth case. Uh, it is a male, 45 years male, has visited a clinic with the same complaint of a dimness of vision. Uh, he was been detected as cataract and he, was he has mainly come for a cataract surgery. But at this 45 years of age, when we have studied the patient, the, the patient's vision was has improved only 624 with a high amount of cylindrical uh, value which the patient has never used any glasses and when we have seen the slit lamp evaluation was done there was this inferior thinning was noted and there was a cataract of around where uh, nuclear sclerosis of grade two but the, it, which was not as such matching with the vision loss of the patient and because of the peripheral thinning the patient has been advised to go for a pentacam analysis again and we have did the same thing for the patient we have seen uh, butterfly butterfly like pattern can be seen over here and we can see within the 4 mm zone the elevation is also noted but the very interesting unique thing when we see these cases if we, <coughs> how to differentiate between a keratoconus or with some other ectasia uh, you can see the K reading of the patient. One of the axes is very flat for this patient and the other axis is very steep. It is the same way for the left eye. You can see how the colors has changed. It has become more warmer. It is showing that it is more ectatic in nature. And again, see the unique thing, the, the K reading. It is uh, very flat, very, very flat in the one axis and very steep in the other axis. We can see the crab-like uh, structure or a butterfly-like structure pattern. <coughs> and the relative pachymetry is showing an inferior theme. 
valence embryo for the right eye, it was there was no such much of suspicion. But in the left eye, you could see the inferior thinning with an upshoot after 6 mm. And the shimflak image, we can clearly see how much thinning is there in the left eye. So it is a clear case of pellucid marginal degeneration. And one more thing, when we are studying this kind of uh, elevation maps, I will be going back. So this is, in this maps, we'll be seeing uh, in the pellucid marginal degeneration or any other kind of generation, which is which differs from the keratoconus, is we'll be saying in keratoconus, in a specific typical keratoconus, we'll be seeing the stiffening and the thinning and elevation, everything taking a place in the same place only. Where it will be the thinning, the stiffening will be also in the same position. But in uh, the other kind of ectasia, we'll see where the stiffening is there. The maps are not moving in that direction. It will never coincide. And it is a clear case of a felicit marginal degeneration. So with all these cases, we could see how quantitatively and in detail the Pentacam can analyze the various ectatic condition of the eye. And it also helps us to see the progression of the disease and helps us in various and the treatment and it helps also helps us in detecting the uh, whether the patient wants to go for a uh, CXL surgery or anything like that. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Okram Pal, uh, for this wonderful and informative session. Um, uh, our next speaker. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Aditi Kosh Destidar. Uh, Dr. Aditi is a senior consultant of ophthalmic surgeon in the Cornea and Ocular Surface Department, Synergy Eye Care India. She is also a visiting consultant of Netralem and Trinetralem. Uh, she was worked with uh, one of the prestigious uh, eye institute, uh, Shankar Netralaya, uh, as a consultant corneal surgeon. She'll be speaking on uh, corneal transplant in complex situations. Uh, welcome, Dr. Aditi. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. The yeah, I'll just share my screen. Uh, a very happy World Side Day to each and every one. Thank you, ma'am. Is my uh, thank you so much for having me with you all. It's a wonderful program. Uh, are my slides visible? Are the slides visible? Hello. I hope the slides are visible. Can someone just tell? Yes, 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 ma'am. It's visible. Oh, it's visible. Go thank ahead, you please. so much. Okay, so I'll be speaking about corneal transplant in complex situations, battling the Pandora's box. So corneal transplant is an ever-evolving art. And yes, the patient demand has increased. The technicalities have improved. So now we, have, we are beyond PK now. But it still is a challenge in many complex cases. And PK does become the plan B, the fallback option, or the savior option in such complex cases. So the main aim for any surgeon is how to give the optimum result in such complex cases. So PK, still a savior, yes. So I'll be speaking about few complex cases. So we already know that PK, you know, we were always taught the indications being optical, tectonic, and therapeutic. So I'll be taking a few cases from all of these complex situations and deal the Pandora's box. So maybe we are not able to give 2020 vision to these patients, but why not give a 20 happy and the best optimum uh, result in such cases? So the first case scenario is uh, PK in keratoconus. So now you'll say why PK in keratoconus now that we know DALC is there, but there are few conditions that we might have to switch to PK from DALC or from the primary uh, sitting only, we might plan and a PK. So uh, what all will be the indications? So advanced keratoconus, status post, or resolved height drops. So this is a very big indication. A CL non-tolerant, non-compliant patient. So now what are the challenges faced? The optical decentration of the host, horizontal torsion during the surgery, and the vertical tilt of the host and toner. So now why this acute height drops? Keratoconus is a very good case for planning a diet. But these acute hydrops, we cannot. 
even once we have managed it with a conservative treatment, sometimes what happens is when we are even dissecting the plane, there might be these DM tears which give away and there's a double bubble formation and we have to switch to PK. So many of the times when we know there are multiple uh, tears, even auto resolution, we know that it might give up. So in such cases, we do plan a penetrating keratoplasty. So intraoperative pearls are an optimal graft size selection. It shouldn't, it does not have to be too large or small. The trephination has to be accurate. Cardinal sutures, especially the second suture that we put at one uh, opposite at 180 degree is very important. So this avoids the tilt. Tension-free graft position is the main aim. It shouldn't be very tight. Suturing technique, it can be an interrupter or a uh, continuous suture. Depends on the surgeon, what best results he or she can give with their own hands. And peripheral iodotomy in such cases is very important. And sometimes we do miss up. And post or medical management and imaging. So now this imaging, ASOST is a very big boon because even in early post-op patients, we can see the, uh, you know, the host and the graft, the till, and these anterior and posterior segment, whether they are lying correctly in the position or not. Or if there is a positive or negative step formation, that means there's a non-congruency of the two uh, tissues. So now one of the cases, the 24-year-old male presented to us uh, last in, during the COVID phase with acute high drops managed uh, with conservative treatment. And then, so because you can see the thinning, and I knew there were multiple uh, tiers, so we planned for the primary PK only in such case. You can see the ASOCT, the graft and host is well opposed. There are not much of any uh, exaggerated step formation. The patient is CL tolerant, but is not using CL because it's already 6-9 unaided. So now coming to the second one. That is penetrating keratoplasty in chronic chemical injury cases. So these are the cases which come to us with a surface, epitalized surface, a quiet surface, might need surface reconstruction, lid adenexal deformity reconstruction, taking care of the limbal stem cell deficiency or any exposure. And we have to treat that before planning or penetrating keratoplasty. So now the challenges faced are that these chemical injury, the limbus is already compromised. And some of them, they are so well, uh, surface is already covered. We do not know what we are going to deal with, where the imaging comes to our aid. So there's a two school of thought of a sequential versus simultaneous limb and stem cell transplant and penetrating keratoplasty. But a gap of three months between the two can be followed. So now, Pre-operative, as I said, it is, it is a very complex case. We have to know what is the underlying corneal status, what is the underlying, whether lens status is okay, how is the optic nerve hit, posterior segment. And in such cases, we cannot get the keratometry. So in some cases, we have to take the k-values of the other eye. So now we have to know all these prior to planning our surgery. And we have to keep a backup tissue because sometimes on table, we might find a scleral deficiency as well. IOL has to be at backup. Because no matter what, how young the patient of such chemical injury, chronic chemical injury patients are, they might come with a very hard cataract. Why? Because they have been using steroid for a long time or they might have had some trauma. So intraoperative surprise, we have to be prepared in such cases. And modification and the ease of modification of a surgical plan should be always be on our mind. Post-operatively, these patients do require immunosuppression and additional surgical uh, procedures in the future. So here's a very short video showing such case. Here you can see the limbus is bad. It is a total corneal obesity. So now you see it was a young patient, but he had a total, uh, a total cataract. So now I put an IOL because we had already measured it. We have put the IOL, I put the sutures, I put an amniotic membrane as well as, well as uh, slit bits from the other eye because the other eye was doing well. So here are the post-op results. Here you can see the amniotic membrane has taken out well, and you can see the sled bits as well. So such patients too, if we have, do a good uh, proper pre-op plan, we can give good results. Another patient, now here, this patient also required on the same table, the lid reconstruction, so a symbophonic session, amniotic membrane transplant, sled. Also you can see the IOL well there. So here is the post-op picture and similar procedure just the lid uh, reconstruction was added on the same setting as well. Now coming to large diameter keratoplasty. So these are done when the patient is planned for a second uh, PK. 
that is the patient has already gone a large therapeutic transplant perforation because of infection or a tectonic one for perforation or in ectasia cases and the fire ma'am very nicely she uh, you know elicited all the cases for pmd advanced keratoconus or refractive for post radial keratomy cases very bad ones post high drop or very irregular astigmatism so now the advantage is that in such because the diameter is large so we excite the inciting pathology now it also helps in reducing post op astigmatism gives a good tectonic stability and it is single stage the procedure gives us limbal transplant as well but the biggest challenge faced are chances of high graft failure because of the proximity to the limbus limbal vasculature and glaucoma development why because we are passing the sutures through the trabecular mesh so in such patients we might need and a very early uh, glaucoma intervention as well so here is a video here we could see that the graft is doing well but the iop so this iop checkup is very important a very clear graft in early post op period should not stop you from taking your intraocular pressure so if you see we did an agv through the pre existing graft and put a few more sutures and the patient is doing well where we can see the agv tube and a good graft so this glaucoma management should be on our mind as well now coming to tectonic cases in acute chemical injury so we know that tectonic the anatomics integrity is the main aim problem is the hostile micro environment and surface in such cases we have to provide a vascular pedicle in such scleral ischemic thin and even melted cases so now what are the pearls pre operative we have to have corneal tissue scleral tissue amniotic membrane so backup of tissue and the support of eye bank is very important we have to follow the principle of chemical injury no matter what we are doing pk or not we have to debulk the necrotic tissue we have to provide a vascular pedicle through tenon plasty assess the graft size pre operatively and be ready for a uh, uh, during operation a scleral thinning or melt as well so post op medical management and additional surgical procedure the patient has to be counseled very well now i'm here i'm showing a surgery with you so here you can see the iris prolapse is already there so it's a corneal perforation and a pre scleral melt case so i've used the graft itself on the scleral and the corneal perforation followed by uh, using the non pedicle from 360 degree and conjunctival uh, remnant conjunctiva and amniotic membrane in such cases so here are the post op pictures so this patient came to us post chemical injury in such condition we could see this A, a scleral ischemia, more than three clock hours scleral ischemia, and this is in the first post-op uh, period when we could see that the graft is edematous, but it's taking in out well. The scleral ischemia is gone. There is no scleral melt, and amniotic membrane is well integrated. Now the patient post-op follow a one year has a panus, but has a vision of six nine. So definitely might need a panus excision only if the patient is concerned regarding the cosmesis. As of now, the vision is doing well. so now visual outcome post therapeutic cases so now the main aim is infection control not visual rehabilitation first we have to restore the glow so indication we do in such cases when the cornea is involved or there is an obscuration of the visualization for a vr that is a vitreo retina procedure challenges face is the extent of location how much is involved we are not able to assess because of the emergency of the cases and the adjacent clara involved so now in such cases what what comes to our aid is this temporary keratoconus processes or k pro which we after excising the infected cornea we put it over the uh, area so that the vitreoretinal surgeon can do the vitrectomy iob lensectomy and then we put a graft so in a way we are removing the uh, involved cornea using the we are not deteriorating the cornea with additional procedure during the primary procedure so giving the graft a survival uh, a shot at survival so microbiological analysis and backup tissues must in such cases flaring or scleral fixation ring is very important peritomy done to see whether any scleral involvement is there or not land is temporary keratoconus processes it's a very helpful tool for us cornea surgeons and micro and hp both are very important so graft uh, primary graft survival is might not be that well but still it gives a very good visualization during the surgery and it prevents a, a inhindrance caused by a graft edema so now here's a video 
So here you can see it is a patient of endo with a corneal involvement and vitreous. So now what we can do? So here you can see the vitreoretinal person has already put the ports. I'm removing the infected uh, cornea. And now I'll be putting a keratic processor, the temporary landers keratic processor. After this, you can see the, you know, vitreous exudate and the lens involvement. After this, the vitreal surgeon will do the surgery, followed by I'll put the good graft over there. So here, an ectatic graft has been put because the central cornea was looking good, but the scleral area was looking thinned on. So here we have used the graft ectatically. Thus, the central cornea remains preserved of the patient as well. And here you can see, so this is not a graft failure. This is the iris pigments have been removed during the wash and during the exudate pulling and vitrectomy. And a follow-up of two years, the kid is seeing 6'9 with a very good contact lens. So having a contact lens trial and a very good contact lens trained clinic and optometrist is very important and aids in our work as well. So the take-home message will be aim for the best possible outcome. Tailor-made approach, every case is different. So we have to deal it uh, differently. Patient counseling in all cases is very important. Intra-op surprises, we have to be uh, prepared. We have to be very comfortable modifying our surgery during such surprises. And PK, no matter what, old is cold, is a savior in such complex situations. These are my references. I would like to thank uh, my parent institute, Shankar Netralia, my excellent teachers, a uh, team of colleagues, optometrist department, Ms. Payal, Ms. Monica, Ms. Momita, and my fellows, and Dr. Mona Bhargava, and my present uh, team of Netralem, Synergy Eye Care, and Trinitralia. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aditi. It was a very informative and wonderful session. Uh, thank, thank you, you so for sharing much. your experience. Um, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Amna Almazmi. Dr. Amna is a, a consultant ophthalmologist and cornea, uh, in cornea and anterior segment in Zaid Military Hospital. She has completed her ophthalmic residency from Sheikh Khalifa Medical City. And she also has multiple clinical fellowships in cornea, uh, one from University of uh, Montreal and another from University of Nottingham. Uh, she has also uh, completed her clinical research training from uh, prestigious Harvard Medical School. Uh, She'll be uh, speaking on post keratoplasty astigmatism management. Uh, welcome, Dr. Amna. Uh, over to you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Suhaid, for this kind invitation and the thank kind you. introduction as well. And on behalf of uh, ESO, I actually would like to thank everybody for their attendance, their contribution, the fact that we are collaborating across the world in order to uh, spread the knowledge that we have uh, earned. Uh, so. Um, how can I share my screen, uh, Suhail? One second, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, you can see the green color share screen. So yes. just click this one. Uh, choose the first option from the top, top left. Sorry for this technical issue. It has to do with my computer blocking me to share my screen. I should have run a test drive uh, as uh, Kamal had instructed me earlier. So I apologize for, for this glitch. Okay, Kamal, I will send my email to you, uh, my presentation to you. It seems that um, uh, I have to quit uh, Zoom before joining in again. Yes, sure, ma'am. Then you can send me that presentation. In the meantime, we can uh, go for the Dr. Ahmed presentation, and then you can join after that. Is it okay? Of course, certainly. Uh, good evening, ma'am. It could be very quick. You need to just uh, allow it from system preference. And once you allow it, quit the Zoom and rejoin. It will be very fast. Okay. I've opened I'm sure you're using a MacBook. That's why it's uh, additional security okay. measure. Okay. I'll just look out. I'll come back then. Right. It's going to be very quick.
Rahul, Dr. Ahmed. No. Yeah, Dr. Amna will be joining us after next session, after this session. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Ahmed uh, Al Saadi. Uh, Dr. Ahmed is a senior corneal consultant. Uh, for, uh, he's specializing in cornea and anterior segment. Uh, he's one of the leading cornea and anterior segment surgeons in the region. He has successfully uh, performed hundreds of complex anterior segment and refractive surgeries. Uh, Dr. Ahmed will be speaking about uh, corneal aberration and its application. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Ahmad uh, will be joining us after a couple of minutes. So we have, a, he sent us a pre-recorded video, so we'll be playing that one. Uh, hopefully, he'll be joining us for uh, our panel discussion. Uh, over to the host. Uh, Kamal, I can start if you want. I think I'm up and uh, it's up and running. Yes, ma'am. Then you can uh, start now. And thank you for whoever gave me that uh, heads up. It actually worked. So uh, thank you again for having me. And I apologize for this uh, glitch. Uh, obviously, we know that post-operative uh, astigmatism may contribute significantly to the poor visual outcome in an otherwise much successful keratoplasty procedure. Uh, so in order to uh, give you a heads up of what I'm going to talk about uh, today, I know it's very late in the evening, especially with the time differences between us and in the other continent and the other countries. Uh, I'm going to discuss about astigmatism in brief and different approaches where we can address the astigmatism in addition to the advantages and disadvantages with each uh, approach. We know that uh, the vision, we know what aberration is and astigmatism is an optical aberration. And we know that there is no such thing as a perfect image. So as light passes through the optical system, it's always subjected to distortions. And the, we know that aberrations could be of low order aberration or higher order aberration. And that's the next talk where uh, Dr. Al Saadi will talk in depth and clarify whatever questions anybody has. We also know that uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the circle of least confusion, uh, where and and the other hand, it's the actually the circle of most confusion, and it happens when two rays that are coming perpendicular to a plane on the optical axis they have different foci, which results in a blur in one direction that is absent in the other direction. <clears throat> We know that regular astigmatism, astigmatism could be classified as with the rule or against the rule or oblique. And this simplifies when we want to discuss things amongst uh, ophthalmologists or between uh, optometrists because they come from different backgrounds and sometimes they use a positive cylinder or a negative cylinder in order to correct it. So what factors influence the amount of astigmatism following a transplant? So there are multiple factors, and I've kind of summarized what I thought were important. We know the stage of the keratoconus, the uh, trephination, whether it was eccentric or not, the graft uh, size and donor, and, and whether there is a recipient mismatch, the corneal thickness mismatch at donor-recipient interface, the way suturing technique is, and the timing of suture removal. And suturing technique is very important. This is something I also tell my, uh, I tell the residents who uh, come and rotate um, with us that, you know, the, the way, the, the bites, the uh, torque, uh, the tension you apply, uh, all matters uh, eventually. So, Sorry. This is just a diagrammatic presentation or a slit lamp image to show what kind of sutures uh, that could be done in a patient's eye. Uh, there is a continuous suture, the image you see on the left. It could be a mix of continuous as an interpreted, interrupted, sorry. It could also be uh, both uh, double continuous. Uh, so it's variable and it all depends on the, 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 the training you've had uh, during um, uh, your fellowships. So that's the important part, vision rehabilitation. Um, we know that when you want to address astigmatism, there are different measures in doing it. You can be conservative or you can be invasive. We all we tend to start with contact lenses, and then there is corneal-based refractive surgery, and there is lens-based refractive surgery. 
However, in order to choose the type of management that is uh, most convenient, you need refractive stability. You need three to four months uh, to elapse after the sutures have been removed. And obviously, the stability is confirmed through refraction and topography. To speak about each one briefly, um, I know that the majority of the audience today are optometrists and they, they have different expertise in fitting people with contact lenses and, it, and it's a skill that it is very important to maintain, especially when you practice in a, in a, in with a, with a cornea, in a cornea service. Uh, we know the different uh, kinds that exist, as you can see in the flow chart uh, in front of you, um, and the the, more, the ones that are coming uh, that are coming up uh, frequently are the corneal, the, the rigid um, gas permeable, and the scleral uh, contact lenses. However, with contact lenses, we know that they can induce a peripheral corneal vascularization. There is also risk of infection, risk of rejection. And also the, um, the 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 usage. So how how well trained is the person um, in fitting in fitting the contact lens and in wearing it as well? Uh, when we talk about uh, the patient, so if we move on to talk about the corneal based refractive surgery, we know that there is uh, it could be divided into two main categories. We have the astigmatic keratotomy and the excimer laser. If we mainly mention about the astigmatic keratotomy, we know that it has multiple nomograms depending on what is your normal approach, whether it is manual using a, um, a diamond um, uh, knife or using the femtosecond. And currently the norm is, le is, is leaning towards using the femtosecond because of the, re the reproducibility of the results uh, with it. However, it can be unpredictable. And normally when um, astigmatic keratotomy are performed, they are mainly performed as pairs. Uh, and there are mainly uh, several important considerations uh, that need to be accounted for. And that is the location of the graft host junction as we don't want to place the docking or, uh, and perform the incision at sites where the uh, graft host junction is to avoid graft dehiscence. Uh, and occasionally you may need to use augmentation with compression uh, sutures. Okay. If we look into the literature, the literature tells us that in order, the amount of astigmatism that can be corrected can be up to 15 diopters of astigmatism. However, that depends on three main important factors, as you can see highlighted um, within the um, uh, table in front of you. You have the uh, optical zone diameter, so how far it is from the pupil, the incision depth, and this is mainly related to the corneal, the corneal thickness, the thick, the corneal thickness uh, that you are um, uh, doing the procedure on, and the angular um, uh, arc, so the, the degrees of how big you want uh, your incisions uh, to be um, uh, created. The second corneal-based refra refractive surgery are the excimer laser, and that includes both, both the PRK and the uh, femtosecond LASIK. However, the planning is normally done according to the refractive error, the best corrected visual equity, and the degree of higher order aberration, because you may need to have a stepwise approach uh, if you had a regular astigmatism that, in, that where you may in, need to do uh, trans-PRK initially before uh, proceeding to, correct, to correction of the refractive error. However, as reported in literature, there is always risks of haze, uh, regression, uh, rejection and occasionally wound dehiscence when it's performed on uh, with the LASIK surgery. Uh, moving on to lens-based refractive surgery. Okay, we have um, different lenses that could be used, whether it was uh, uh, fake uh, or basically removing uh, the lenticular changes that can exist. The advantages of it, it, it can be done in a stepwise approach uh, where significant, if significant higher order abrasion exists, it can be addressed. It also corrects regular symmetrical astigmatism and it's effective uh, and predictable. However, it can be problematic if the graft fails 
And if you are to treat higher amount of cylinder, um, the chances of rotation uh, can go up to 40%. Uh, and obviously there is always risk of causing endothelial cell loss. Um, so if we are to talk about fake IOLs, we obviously need clear lens and a regular symmetrical astigmatism. The advantages, so why would you use a fake IOL in uh, post keratoplasty? The fact that the patient may have an isometropia, so they are glasses and uh, in, they are intolerant to the glasses because of an isometropia, or they're contact lens intolerant. And we know that keratoconic patients, for example, they, they have higher tendency to be intolerant to it. How about corneal-based procedures? We know that sometimes, occasionally, there is issues with wound healing, the graft survival, and obviously the, the risks of having uh, haze, um, as well as the complication ratio with less of uh, the predictability uh, as a result of the treatment given. Uh, with fecic IOLs, um, uh, it is uh, more predictable. It can preserve accommodation since uh, these patients normally are of a younger population. If we talk about the keratoconic uh, group, uh, there is minor manipulation to the uh, graft and there is no compromise to the structural integrity of uh, the graft. However, we need to pay in mind the uh, direction of the uh, wound construction. Uh, obviously, there is contraindications to placing a fake IOL to treat uh, the astigmatism. You can, uh, it's ideally avoided in patients who have uveitis, glaucoma, or a mesopic pupil, pupil of more than six millimeter because of the indu indu it inducing higher order aberrations. Um, you also need a comprehensive eye exam, as with any other um, uh, procedure we had talked about earlier. Uh, one of the commonly used posterior chamber uh, or sulcus placement IOLs we have are the collimer uh, lenses. Uh, as mentioned previously, the, 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 uh, the, the, the construction of your wound is very important. It definitely needs a bigger wound size, so you need to place a suture following to it. And what is important is measuring the wide to wide. There are different modalities for that. One of them is using the OCT or using a regular caliper, caliper in the clinic. Uh, performing an aerodotomy, it depends on the model you're using. Newer models already have a central hole that allows aqueous to flow um, through it uh, and decreases, decreases the chances of glaucoma building up. There are also other approaches that can be performed, such as lamellar wedge uh, resection, but that is unpredictable because it depends on how much tissue you want to remove and the tension of uh, suture, suture tension you are applying and the timing of when to remove the suture following uh, the resection. Uh, it's controversial and because what I had to mention is because it was uh, listed in the literature. That's the use of intracorneal segments, segment, seg uh, intracorneal um, ring segments, which is not normally used in uh, patients who are grafted. Um, and the other, uh, the last option, if the astigmatism is so high, is to undergo for a regraft, which we try to avoid with the previous um, techniques that was mentioned earlier. So prevention obviously is the key and intraoperatively that could be um, uh, achieved by the technique of suturing, the size and the centration of the trephination, avoiding override of your tissue and timely and progressive removal of your sutures. Um, that's for my talk and uh, I would all I would uh, take this opportunity and this window to invite everybody to adore. Uh, which stands for Abu Dhabi Ophthalmology Review. And we yearly talk about a specific uh, topic uh, within ophthalmology. And this year is going to be an intensive two-day uh, course talking about cornea and refractive surgery. Um, thank you, Dr. Amna. It was very uh, informative and wonderful session. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. I will move to our uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Saadi. Um, he's just landed, uh, so he'll be hopefully he'll be joining us uh, in a couple of minutes. We're expecting. So meantime, we'll be uh, playing a pre-recorded -pre video. So, yes. Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Saadi, and it's a pleasure to be amongst you. I'll just. Uh, uh, would like to take this opportunity to appreciate the organizing committee for inviting me 
uh, I'll be talking to you about wavefront aberrometry, a brief overview. Uh, I have no financial disclosure. And I would like to acknowledge Dr. Amn al Mazmi and Dr. Kashif a big. Uh, I'd like to start by talking about the, and outlining uh, my uh, talk. I'll define the aberrations, then I'll discuss how do we measure it, and then I'll move to show. Uh, show you how do we present aberrations to to the to the end user, and then I'll speak about uh, how does it affect the vision, and then an overview of the aberrometries uh, application in ophthalmology, and finally conclude. Wavefront aberrometry is not an easy topic to understand. It's pure physics to start with, with implication in, on, on the eye. But having the crowd here as an optometrist, I'm quite confident that you will enjoy this. So wavefront aber aberration is, is basically the, all the imperfections that the wave light will suffer during its travel from the tear film into the retina and then back as we measure it. So all the imperfections of uh, the optical system, which is our eye, cause to the light rays to deviate from their desired path is an aberrations. And in brief, this could be a lower order aberrations, which you guys deal with on daily basis. That's myopia hyperopia and astigmatism that's so-called lower order aberrations anything that you can correct with the glass and this makes up up to 85 to or more of all the ocular aberrations then we have what's so-called higher order aberrations and namely i would like you to concentrate on three things because these are the aberrations that affect the, uh, the vision the most which are spherical aberration coma and trophy later on so how do we measure aberrations? We measure aberrations. And generally, if you want to see how does that affect the eye, so the superluminance diode laser uh, will be uh, sent into the cornea, into the, uh, into the patient's cornea through the lens into the retina. And obviously, uh, it will not be distorted because it is a laser down to the fovea the reflection from the retina uh, comes out spherical while passing through the uh, vitreous as the wavefront passes uh, through the lens and the cornea it becomes retarded or advanced it depends some will go before some wave lights will go behind and this will produce that distortion to the wavefront. All of this will be collected, and this is, as you can, as you can see, the laser, the laser beam went in back through the lens and through the cornea distorted wave that will be received on lens lens slits, and it will give you this pattern, and that will be translated on the video. Uh, detector giving you the deviation which we talked about and here is how Hartman Schack is presented if you look at that image on the top that's a perfect eye which does not exist because our our optical system is imperfect and then we have what's so called the aberrated eye and you can see here so generally speaking, the aberrations of the eye that we presented through polynomials, and polynomials basically are mathematical equations. 
and one of the most important ways is the Zernike and Fourier. Having said that, that when we talk about Zernike, Zernike is a very important common way of presenting it, but Fourier can be the best method when you measure a very aberrated cornea like keratoconus. But for the sake of this talk, I'll cover the Zernike because it's the most commonly used uh, way of presenting it uh, to ophthalmologists. So let's just look at this image which we look at at times and we don't feel happy looking at it because it's a little bit complicated. But if we want to think about how do we present aberrations, generally we present it in a pyramid. So it's a Zernike pyramid and that's why it's called pyramid. And you have to think about it as each line from the top to the bottom, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the order is the horizontal. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, infinite number. But what matters to us is up to 5. So 5 for ophthalmology is what we care about. Then when we look at the vertical lines, you'll find that the vertical lines is number of meridional cuts, if you like. So if you have one cut, imagine this as a pizza. As long as the pizza is not cut, it's zero. If there is one cut vertically, it will be one. Or if there are two cuts, there'll be two. If there are three cuts, it will be three. So you have to think about the number of cuts and you can see this is very evident here one one two cuts here so you have two cuts here three cuts here and you can see that it jumps so usually one one is skipped every time one is skipped and anything to the left of the zero is minus and anything to the right is plus how do we write this so usually we have Zernike, which is Z, and the number below is the order. So it's the horizontal line, and the number on top is the vertical line, if you like. And as we just mentioned, the 0, 1, 2 are the low order aberrations, and anything above that is high order aberrations and I will go into some details so we talked about first order second order I'll just briefly um, tell you what does that mean so in zero order it's a piston and uh, it, the name comes yes from piston that that's in the in the engines but uh, a very common phenomena is the eclipse when the especially the solar eclipse because the moon is much smaller than the sun but still it can block it and this is because of the effect of the distance Uh, our ocular uh, vision uh, or our ocular um, quality of vision uh, even if you have it second order we just touched upon it anything that you can correct with the glasses myopia hyperopia and astigmatism and this resembles up to 90 percent fourth order fourth order uh, 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 there we have spherical aberrations and this can be positive or negative most importantly the use of it we induce high order aberrations in, which are positive aberrations when we do refractive surgery as a laser refractive surgery but when we use this in our favor we do the extended depth of focus lenses and this is how we treat some of the eyes or even when we talk about the Q, uh, this brings me to a, an important point for you to take is when we talk about Q value and spherical 
aberration. So Q value is basically the asphericity of the cornea, how much the cornea is aspheric. And in general, the ideal Q value for a perfect probola, uh, parabola is minus 0 0.5. In our cornea, it's minus quarter. And it has no unit, and it, it only measures the anterior corneal surface. While spherical aberration is part of Zernike, and it describes both the, uh, both the anterior and the posterior surface of the cornea, and it's measured in microns, which is the deviation of the light, and it's generally in the human eyes it's a plus 0 0.27. So please, and this spherical aberration, we change it in order to have extended depth of focus as well. So how to, how does it affect our vision in brief uh, the quality parameters is, are affected by the pupil size so we have to be careful about the diffraction and there is another way which is called modulation transfer function I will uh, I think it's beyond the, the scope of the stock So, uh, what are the application of wavefront barometry? Uh, generally, it's the wavefront guided excimer laser that we use in order to correct the surface, especially in regular corneas and in uh, refractive surgery. Also, when, when people design intraocular lenses, especially extended depth of focus, uh, in order to have a good quality of vision, and the last one is expanding depth of focus, um, uh, either by uh, affecting the cornea or the lens. In conclusion, aberrations are cardinal for the quality of vision. Despite the advances, advances no optimum technology yet. And the limitation are not only because of the technology, but also because of the tear film, pupil, and eyeball is dynamic. Age and most of our surgeries are inducing high order aberrations. Thank you very much uh, for having me and I will be ready to answer the question with the panel uh, later. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, uh, for joining us. We all know that uh, it's been a long trip and thank you for showing uh, a support. And it was a really wonderful session and uh, it was very informative. Now the forum is open for uh, panel discussion. Stay tuned for a few seconds while uh, the questions appear on the screen and kindly uh, choose the answers. And uh, uh, shortly we will go to the panel discussion. So uh, the question is, is DLK ideal surgery for acute high drops? We have a true false answer. You can choose one of them from there. Then we'll move to the second question. Uh, is visual rehabilitation primary aim of therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty? The third one, or the third question is modular transfer function, MTF signifies. The answers are there. You can choose one of them. Band-shaped keratopathy is commonly caused by deposition of, you can choose answers. This is end of the session. Thank you all. Thank you all. We really thank you for all the all the speakers, uh, all informative and wonderful session. Now we will move to um, another session. Thank you. Also, um, you know, if any uh, questions are there from the audience, so you can put it in the drop box. So we'll be asking to the, uh, just mention which um, speaker. So we'll be asking the questions.
to them specifically accordingly. Uh, we have uh, the one question from the audience uh, to uh, Pyle, Optom Pyle. Um, uh, what is the best method to manage uh, posterior ectasia? Optom Pyle. Uh, where best method is uh, we have to see the how much a dactatic condition is there. If the if the if we can do a correction with the glasses, it is fine. Otherwise, we have to move on to the specialized contact lenses. Uh, it is can be up to a Boston scleral lenses. Uh, after that, it depends on the. Uh, Consultant, they will be yes, doctors will be judging the corneal conditions and they can move on to the surgical options. Okay, thank you. Um, and one more question to uh, Dr. Uh, Pyle. Um, uh, in the day to day practice, we often find it difficult to uh, diagnose these FFKC cases, especially we, uh, we go for uh, keratorefractive surgery. So, which topographer would you prefer to have? Um, no, to diagnose why, uh, FFKC cases, early uh, yes. keratoconus Actually, cases. We, with, for yeah. any quantitative things for the cornea, we have to go through a, it is the Pentagon is the best where advanced technologies we are having. So it will be giving a detailed idea about uh, the FFKC cases. Uh, so we, where the, any suspicion of keratoconus will be judged so that we can do a review of this uh, screenings. Uh, so I feel that Pentacam is the best option. Okay. If I just may uh, and, uh, comment, thank you very much, doctor. Yes, sir. One important, one important thing for the audience to know, uh, we have different we are developed, uh, we are going into the OCT based, but be, before we used to, do, to use the <clears throat> Placido disc. So uh, generally speaking, Placido disc can uh, detect uh, the changes earlier, especially in form for keratoconus. Yet, having said that, some of those placido discs they do not have uh, uh, the uh, something like the bad KC or uh, Billin Ambroso or equivalent programs. So currently, we are developing this and form frost keratoconus is a difficult diagnosis at times. That we look at it, it's like a glaucoma suspect. It's still difficult to call. So just keep in mind that uh, the machines are good, but Placido disc sometimes can, the Placido uh, topographer uh, can show you uh, earlier changes, but today um, the shine fluke images are, are better than those uh, when you look at them collectively. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad and Dr. Pyle. Uh, next question is uh, to Dr. Atiti. Um, what is your opinion on tectonic keratoplasty and what will be your goal in such cases? Dr. Aditi, it's for you. Tectonic keratoplasty, so right. Thank you for the question. So in tectonic keratoplasty, the aim is globe rehabilitation, globe anatomically restored. Once that is done, so we, do, we have to counsel the patient very clearly that this is the primary aim. We are not doing it for visual rehabilitation. So it is going to take up only once we have anatomically corrected the global integrity. So this counseling nowadays to the patient attendant, medical, medical legally being safe is very important. So it should be done. Obviously, it is a primary, uh, you know, primary repair is very important. And if you do a good primary repair with a good ma medical management, sometimes the graft survival is also good if infective case is not there, especially if fungal etiology is ruled out. So in our institutes, we always send, you know, some micro and histopath analysis to rule out any fungal etiology so that, you know, we can start a steroid on an early basis for a better primary graft survival. So yes, tectonic cases are very important and they have to be dealt very correctly and at the proper time on the emergency basis. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. It was informative. Um, we have a couple of more questions also. Uh, we'll move to the audience questions again. Um, this is uh, for Dr. Amna. Uh, what is your best approach rather than contact lenses for the post-PK corneas with high astigmatism? Ma'am, for you. So uh, this is a very uh, vague question and uh, it basically depends on uh, how much the patient can see, what is his best or her, his or her best corrected visual acuity. 
and whether they have uh, certain irregularities on the surface that could be addressed prior to any uh, more invasive uh, approach. Uh, so as uh, mentioned earlier, like you'd want to, um, as Dr. Ahmed had mentioned with the higher order aberrations, if you can address that prior to uh, implanting a lens, uh, maybe that would be uh, that would provide with the patient the uh, the uh, the uh, the clarity that they're looking for. Sometimes it is not the lines uh, that that they want. It's just how good can the quality be improved. And following to that, you can see sometimes just by doing a regularization of the surface, the patient can be happy with the uh, glasses. You know, it also depends on what's the variation between both eyes, whether they have an isometropia, is it to to are they tolerating uh, other forms of um, vision correcting methods? And then you would consider the uh, the other approaches, whether they were the astigmatic keratotomy or the uh, uh, fake IOLs uh, surgery. And if the patient patient had cataract, then you would consider other modalities to address the vision as well as the touristy. I hope that answers uh, the question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. It was very informative, ma'am. Uh, we have a last question uh, to uh, Dr. Ahmad. Um, this is from, uh, yeah. Uh, as optometrists, we often find it's hard to manage these uh, uh, symptomatic, especially post lasic cases. Um, the patient comes with a starburst and other symptoms. So what is your, uh, you know, how do you manage these clinical cases uh, if this unhappy patients uh, post lasic uh, maybe like after one year, two years, maybe sometimes we often find these cases. So what is your perspective on these cases, the management? Well, uh, I guess the question is for me. Am I all right? Yeah. Right? Yes, 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 sir. Because for I'm losing the signal. Yeah. So yes, sir. The first for you. Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Ahmed. Yes. First of all, not all positive dysphotopsia are related to high order aberrations only. Definitely high order. Whenever we do any surgery in the eye, we are inducing aberrations. This is a common fact. But what we need to keep in mind, always I approach the patient by reassurance for six months. Sometimes it eases off after six months because the patient needs to hear the reassurance, number one. Number two, if it was pure spherical aberrations, I look again also for the, the I make sure that the patient is um, well, uh, is uh, lubrication very well no blepharitis that I am missing, no meibomian gland dysfunction, and uh, the, the tear film is, is very much stable. If there are issues, I address that. Uh, if the patient continues to be symptomatic, especially with spherical aberrations, uh, I give them some alpha gam brimonidine to constrict the pupil at night to minimize this. And if none, none of these modalities works, after six months to a year, I might consider uh, going for, for removing a spherical aberration, especially if you have um, uh, a platform, laser refractive uh, suite platform, which addresses specifically uh, the aberrations, the high order aberrations, uh, and they have no financial interest here. For instance, the Schwinda Maris gives you this, uh, this um, flexibility to address only high or certain high order aberrations, uh, like spherical or trefoil, you just choose your own. Uh, but I don't jump directly. I wait, give the patient time. At times, your epithelium will, will try to, to heal the cornea and give them better vision. Uh, sometimes reassurance patients, they can tolerate this because you cannot um, be sure if you do more intervention that you will not induce other high order aberrations. So always talk to your patient, uh, gauge it and uh, address other, other concerns. Look at times for the lens because sometimes the cataract might start or something. If, uh, so, and this might give you also false feeling that this patient is having glare or halos because, but the lens is having a problem. Look at their peritoneal membrane, if there is any peritoneal membrane. So do collective um, uh, look at everything. Don't assume it's just high order operations. I hope this answers that. This is crystal clear, doctor. Thank you very much for this, um, your clear answers. Um, thank you for uh, this uh, wonderful sessions. I thank uh, Dr. Ahmad, Dr. Amna, and Dr. Adidi, and Dr. Pyle. Um, thank you very much. It was very, indeed, it was very informative session. 
and we all we all learned a lot from you and thank you for sharing your expertise and experience with us um now i'm moving to the host thank you thank you once again thank you thank you very much thank you for having thank us you, thank you bye bye thank you thank you thank you thanks mr sohar and all the panelists. panelists that was a very lovely session as we all know people with high myopia have longer eyes and more chances of retinal complications do you know the probability for myopic maculopathy in in myops one diopter increase in myopia will lead to 67% of increase in myopic maculopathy so as an optometrist it is our duty to control the myopia now i call upon optom sharath raj from medicals international for moderating our next session myopia and contact lenses we are open to discussion at the end of the session keep your questions ready over to you mr sharath Can't hear you, Sharath. Your mic's off. Still can't hear. It. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all. A good evening, everyone. Let us welcome Mr. Zakri. Uh, currently working as a deputy head of the optometrist at Moorfield Sai Hospital, Dubai. He is an uh, active GOC member, practicing contact lenses and the myopia management for the pediatric cases. He is going to share his experience on myopia management. Hand over to Mr. Zak. Thanks, thanks, Sharath. Um, let me try to share my screen. Um, good. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yeah, we can see. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for having me. Just let me reduce that. And um, we've got quite a lot to get through here with myopia management in the next sort of 10 to 15 minutes. So it will be a very quick um, whistle stop tour of uh, what I use in practice and what's available out there. Um, unfortunately, there's no financial disclosures with this lecture, um, but let's get on with it. And what we want to do is we want to address the, um, you know, the big bad guy in the room, myopia, something that's on every practitioner's to-do list or to conquer list. So let's get on with it. So, let me start off just by very quickly saying that uh, I don't like the term myopia control. I think it leads parents into a false sense that we actually have the ability to stop children from becoming uh, more myopic or their prescription from increasing. A much better term that uh, we like to use uh, in practice here is myopia management. And as it's been discussed here already, you know, there are many risks associated with myopia. Some of, the, uh, some of the key problems or some of the key issues have already been highlighted tonight. And with this big bad guy, we've got, for example, myopic maculopathy. Each of the figures highlighted below in yellow is the increase per diopter of myopia. Okay, so retinal detachment increases by 23% risk per diopter. Glaucoma, we know that there's a strong correlation there. And then the last one's the overall chances of an increase in uh, you know, visual impairment from this. Now, these are quite staggering numbers. The next graph, um, I'm sure most of, the, uh, most of the practitioners on here have seen, you know, so this is where are we today versus where are we aiming for in 2050? And this is a massive increase with, you know, the, the commonly stated figures are 50% of people having myopia by 2050 and 10% of that cohort having higher than five diopters. So this is the future. Thanks, Thanos. So why is it important to delay this onset of myopia? So we know that younger children that present in clinic uh, with myopia, the younger they are, the more, the higher risk they are of becoming a high um, myope. Now, no level of myopia is safe, okay? So even if 
a patient is minus one, that is still an increase in the predisposition to some of these potentially blinding sight threatening or sight threatening conditions. So we really want to reduce that as much as possible. Now, obviously, if we have a patient that's three years old and minus one, they're definitely going to be at a higher risk than those are 16 or 17 and finishing up their growth cycle. OK, so something just to be uh, aware of that we need to look at not just the prescription, but the age of these patients as well. Now, the closest I could find um, to what we have at the minute is uh, what's kind of going on in a few of the Asian countries. And they've uh, summarized basically what are we giving to these children who are myopic? And unsurprisingly, 90% of children are fitted with single vision lenses. And we know that this is very little um, capabilities of actually reducing the myopia. Now, 8% is in regular soft contact lenses and only one to 3% of these patients are actually using at any aspect of myopia management, which I think, is probably unsurprising to most, most people on here. You know, it's something that's been pushed to the fringes, it's something that's potentially a little bit niche. Um, but hopefully today I'll give you some of the some of the options that we have in our arsenal to tackle this. Now, atropine's been around for a long time. It's been used since about the 1970s. And it, obviously it has the pupil dilating effects, the um, cycloplegic effects. But when we're looking at it from a, a myopia standpoint, OK, the evidence is very robust. It's been a lot around for a long time and it is an excellent myopia management device. With the low dose atropine, um, vision is still very good. But the issue is you know, the duration of treatment. Quite often when I'm giving atropine in clinic, I'll say this is something that we will we will use for the next two years every night. So it's still you know, a very big commitment from the family. Uh, it can dilate the pupil in the higher concentrations. And when we look at the uh, LAMP study, so the low concentration atropine for myopia progression, it's quite a mouthful. So I'm glad they summarized it to LAMP. What this showed us is that the 0.01% is uh, has the lowest rebound effect. So if we look at the, uh, the dark dark or the blackened out triangles, there is definitely still, um, sorry, the uh, sorry, the white circles, the, the lower, let me see if I can get it here, the lower line, it doesn't have as great of um, a myopic progression uh, reduction compared to the stronger concentrations. But once it's stopped at the dotted line, you can clearly see that it has much less of a rebound effect. Now, for those patients that are moderate risk, I would say starting at 0.1% is probably a really good um, a really good starting point, okay? And around 80% of the treatment group slowed uh, the myopia to less than half a diopter per year. So this is definitely something that is being backed up at the minute. Some of our uh, more modern options are the DIMS or the HALT, so D-Focus Incorporated Multiple Segments. And these are the spectacle lenses that we have or the highly aspheric lens targets. And I'll explain a little bit about what that means. The DIMS is essentially a spectacle lens that has a uh, plus 3.5 diopter bubbles on the surface. And what this means is you've got defocus in the periphery and then um, a clear area in the section, in the, in the middle. We only want this um, peripheral defocus um, in the you know, outskirts of the retina. OK, so that's why, obviously, we want to make sure the patient can see as clearly as possible through that tunnel of clear. And uh, these little um, sort of bubbles or these little uh, magnified segments are pushed out to the periphery. It's slowed refractive by about 50 percent. Um, so actually the numbers and the axial length is slowed by about 60 percent. Just give you a quick example of what that is. The halt technology is slightly different. Each of these bubbles is, is, is of a different dioptric par, a different dioptic prescription, which then uh, creates that uh, defocus bubble or that defocus sphere that you can see. 
on the left hand side of the screen. Uh, we've got some uh, uh, review papers of the DIMS and HALT, and again, about 60%, it's slow in both the refraction and the myopic progression. Executive bifocal, we know that doesn't look great, but it is reasonably effective at giving this um, sort of inferior on the lens or superior on the retina defocus, which does help to uh, reduce the axial growth. Some of the studies that we have here, um, this is one um, recently done in uh, 2015. Well, quite recent for bifocals. We've got a lot more modern uh, since then. But, you know, it's been shown for quite a while that bifocals are useful in this. Now, that's probably because it relaxes the accommodation to some point, but also because of this defocus. Progressive lenses, very similar, where the patient's using a plus two ad. Study used about uh, 450 patients. Um, this was done in uh, China. And again, reasonable control with the, uh, with the progression, but we have got better options. So the soft lens, like the MySight, has been used for quite a number of years now. Uh, we still haven't got it in the UAE, but hopefully it's coming soon. Soft lenses, you know, there is still a similar type of uh, reduction in uh, axial growth around about that 30 to 40% mark. But something that else that's been on the market for a long time is obviously ortho -K. Now I can feel the uh, corneal or the external disease doctors probably getting a little bit riled up by this, but the lenses, if they're fitted correctly, don't sit on the apex of the cornea. This is something that um, is in the mid periphery. And you can see here on the histological diagrams that the change in morphology is in the epithelium, okay, with very little impact on the anterior stroma. So this is very much fitting the epithelium. Again, we've got that sort of 30 to 60%, depending on the study of the effectiveness of this. And ortho-K lenses, they are very good when they're fitted well. Um, they can be used in combination with atropine, a bit of teamwork. And some things are just better without glasses. Okay, swimming, sports. Um, I had a horse, uh, a girl that was into horse riding. She was a jockey in this week, and the ortho K lenses are perfect for her. The infection risk in ortho K from the studies is lower than that of a steely silicon hydrogel wearer. Okay, as long as the lenses are well looked after, the infection risks in ortho K are quite low. We're just coming on to the last one here. I know that my time's almost up. I think we're at about 14 minutes. Lifestyle. This is something that you should be recommending to every single patient that has myopia, whether they opt for some of these myopia management options or not. Now, both the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Australian uh, Department of Health has said children under two should have no screen time. Okay. This excessive uh, screen time reduces language developments and increases childhood obesity. Two to five years old, maximum of one hour screen time per day. So this is the preschool children. They're recommending a maximum of one hour. And the 15 to 17 year olds limited to two hours of recreational screen time per day. Now, there's probably not many children out there that are um, being held to these. Um, and as a department here at Moorfields, we routinely recommend uh, two hours of recreational screen time, regardless of the age of the child. So any, anyone below 17 years old, we just say maximum of two hours per day. And this causes the kids to go outside and play with their friends once they have this, um, this limit set on to the, um, the screen time. You can screenshot this if you want. It's the myopic uh, effect effectivity against the myopia correction. So we've got here atropine, time outdoors, doesn't correct the myopia, but it does have a good effect. And then we've got ortho K, multifocal contact lenses, progressive glasses. And this is a really nice summary of what each of the, um, the options have. I'm just gonna finish up here. I know I'm just a little bit over my time. These are the six, uh, six options that we have. And with this, then, um, this is how you're going to defeat myopia. And I uh, hope I don't get sued by Marvel for this. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to message me on any of the uh, above. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Zach, uh, for your wonderful session.
let us welcome our uh, next speaker professor premjit currently working as a assistant professor manipal university india he is a fellow of ical and bcla practicing from last 14 years he is going to share his experience on advanced rgp and roske fittings hand over to professor premjit if my voice is clear yes we can see, see your screen as well thank you very much um, thank you everyone uh, um, thank you for joining i thank organizer for giving me this opportunity uh, i have been listening to this great session with all the great uh, audience um, well i'll be talking on advanced rgp and roske fitting and um, i'll just start with few fundamentals and then go with some of the advanced cases and then i will try to sum up about roske fitting um i may you know i don't want it to offend anyone but i try we may uh, touch the basic for a bit uh, just to in case if you of the audience are uh, not used to with this but most of you i'm sure will be aware of uh, things um one of the thing that what i have noticed in my uh, probably this uh, career while practicing contact lenses is this uh, uh, optoms are very used to with all this kind of soft lenses uh, uh, silicon hydrogel bead disposable bead anything uh, optometrists are very comfortable and they are also comfortable practicing high end contact lenses whether it is roske or even sclerals but we felt that you know the fundamentals of contact lenses is rgp being less practiced probably one of the reason is uh, you know it takes some chair time but anyway uh, with this we will just try to uh, uh, sum up this whole topic uh, in this uh, talk i'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, rgp lenses and for this presently i'll just try to focus on spherical multi curve corneal lenses now if you just see these uh, designs of a multi curve rgp lenses what happen is like you know from this to this as we know this is the total diameter and this we call as a base curve followed by we have secondary and tertiary curves one of the interesting thing is that what we need to understand the base curve when you just you know you extend the base curve and from the the final curve what is there in the actual lenses the difference is basically the edge lift so uh, from the cornea this actually you know the fluorescence enters here and we do see this the thickness uh, from this part is known as edge thickness uh, while fitting we will address this um normally in your practice we uh, see uh, uh our contact lenses we trying to uh, order as the base curve back vertex power and total diameter and often we see this but then as we can see from this a typical multi curve or here it is a tri curve lens design we see there are some peripheral curves which actually manufacture uh, based on their uh, algorithm they tend to flatten or while ordering you can change it depends on lab to lab uh this is another way of you know looking into the edge and uh, looking into the design and i'm not going to talk much over here uh this is a small video of tl lens and uh, i'm going to just uh, play this uh, video for a while and then i will uh, come back to uh, the talk Done. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. You can, you can. Okay. You're playing the video. Okay. Okay. Is it audible? My. Um... Can you play it? Oh uh, no. is audio is not audible no 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 all right i think i have to just all right uh um, this is the uh, the tear which um, which is trapped between the 
front surface of the cornea and the back surface of the lens, these tears actually connect this uh, corneal astigmatism. Now, why RGP? As you see this, uh, as I started with the talk, the RGP contact lenses, we can fit it into any uh, probably potential refractive error, but often we try to correct uh, because of the tear lens, we try to use them for irregular astigmatism, be it post PK or even PMD or keratoconus, keratoglobus, any other cases we do. And we get a very good tear exchange and a high decay um, RGP material. So before we start RGP contact lenses, we tend to uh, you know what is recommended that you uh, please start with an effective communication with the patient. You discuss your possible, uh, discuss the condition, and you present all the possible options to the patient. Um, you do uh, listen to the patient. You explain them the condition, and also you take a chance and you express your, uh, you know, uh, your uh, desire to correct and probably what you feel for the best, and let the patient decide what is best for the patient. Um, not going to touch much here, pre-fitting, you do all these uh, regular routine optometry examinations and you try to decide the best contact lenses for your patient. Uh, this is the case where you see the right eye is the minus 5.5 is a pure spherical where the left eye, there is a cylinder. And if you try to, uh, this is PGP, when you have given the final prescription, the right eye got the minus six and the left eye, there is a cylinder. When you try to correlate with the keratometry value, the right eye being spherical and the left eye, there is a three diopter of corneal astigmatism. So you can make out this three diopter of corneal astigmatism, what is present here, this three diopter of corneal astigmatism, what is present here, it is due to the corneal astigmatism. Whereas the right eye is a pure spherical. Uh, so, uh, how do you choose this base cover of a contact lens? Traditionally, you start with the flat K and then you move towards the average K. So here, if you see this example where this is the flat K and this is the uh, uh, steep K and the average is considered to start with the contact lens, whereas total diameter, uh, HVID minus 2.5, that is considered to be the highest T can be uh, tried for the patient. But uh, there is a rule of thumb on a, when you try to do this in a clinic and you see the cylinder is quite high, in order to save your chair time, as per the you know, IKL and the recommendations, what you do is you take this uh, uh, flat K, you take this steep K, and then after 1.5 diopter of cylinder, so that means after 1.5, we have remaining 1.5. Per each 0.5 diopter, you stiffen by 0 0.05 from the base curve. So here, three steps of 0 0.05, so from the flat curvature 7.5, you stiffen by this and you get this 7.35. So it is interesting to see that the flat K being 7.5, if you go by the traditional rule, and if you use the thumb rule, it's, it helps you to take the 7.35 or even average this. The idea is start with the flatter curvature and go by stiffen the base curve in order to get the best fit. That is a rule of thumb, which usually we uh, apply to uh, do the trial for a, uh, any toric corneas or keratoconus cases, or even uh, for any of this uh, regular elastic medicine. Before you practice, I know as uh, you know, you must know your trial lenses in the clinic, what is uh, present, and based on that helps you to even uh, try, meticulously helps you to uh, do this uh, trial of contact lens properly. Um, lens insertions, um, as you do the lens insertion. Now here is the one thing is whether we need to use anesthetic drop or not. Now, usually I don't prefer to use anesthetic drop until otherwise patient is very sensitive or if we are doing a trial for an anesthetic, a very pediatric patient. Uh, the reason is that uh, if you use anesthetic drop, then you don't actually patient don't understand the actual feeling of the contact lenses. Often when you dispense, patient try to deny to take these lenses because they don't get the simil, uh, same uh, 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 comfort as they got it, they uh, received during the trial because of anesthetic drop. Uh, so usually it is not recommended, but in case, uh, you know, it, if it is a pediatric patient, we may consider putting anesthetic drop. Uh, so you need this uh, fluorescent, and you need to apply the fluorescent. Then we give a settlement time, which is around 20 minutes to, you know, uh, for the patients to lens get settled, and then we do the fit assessment. 
Uh, fit assessment, we do the dynamic and static, and there's sort of things that we assess, centration, coverage, stability, mo movement, and lens lag, and we do see them. And we these are the things that you know we uh, see. I will just play the video without the sound. So you can see here that lens is movement, and the movement is around 2.5 millimeter. Whereas if you see this lens fit, so this lens are riding low and it's also not covering the pupil properly. Whereas uh, static fit, when you do, it is very important to understand the static fit, you basically check the lens cornea relationship. We tend to check the lens cornea relationship, the best you know, we can be viewed by the ratin amber or yellow filter, and we use fluorescent and cobalt blue. So the static fit where you know, there is no lead influence, you separate the, both the lead and you see the pure lens cornea relationship, and you basically check these three things, whether it's a touch or bearing, whether it is alignment or adequate clearance, or it is a pulling. Uh, the area that you see is the center, mid periphery, and the periphery. This is a typical example where you see this: there is a central bearing, there is a central pooling, and there is a central clearance. Uh, this is a typical flat fit where you see this lens is sitting on the center, and there is a probably there is a clear touch area as the sense lens is touching centrally. As you see this at the periphery, there is a huge edge uh, with an edge clearance. This is a, a typical example of a stiff fit lenses where you see the center part is purely, you know, there is a pulling in the center part and then the edge is very thin. The same thing is uh, visible over here. The center fluorescent is quite you know, thick, whereas the edge is quite thin. Uh, this is kind of an, an ideal feed uh, where you see this. Uh, you can see this fluorescence is distributed. Uh, the fluorescence is distributed quite well, and you see the edge is very proper, and you also see there is a good central clearance, and uh, the mid peripheral area is also. Uh, as per the requirement. Well, when you check this lens edge, that you see this edge width and you also see the clearance, that design part that I was uh, discussing. You, uh, this lens width is the, you know, it also reflects based on the design, but then again, how the lens is. If the lens is touching center very heavily, then the width would be very high. If uh, the clearance is the difference from this, you know, what you see, that you see the clearance. So what we need, we need a, we don't, we try to avoid the narrow edge width and we get uh, a good edge width and a good amount of clearance. But as you see, this edge width is quite thick and the clearance is also quite high. So we want a lens to, you uh, know, with adequate, um, with, with adequate clearance. Once you are done with this RGP, you do the over diffraction and you use with the trial lenses, you order the final lenses. That helps you to uh, finalize a RGP lens. Now, if you fit this RGP lens for a keratoconus, the keratoconus, we have this fitting philosophy is there. There's a cent there is this apical clearance, and then you have this apical bearing, and you have this three point touch. Now, uh, the, there are these fitting philosophies, you know, have their own merit and demerit in their own places. But then most popularly, we use this three-point touch or divided support where we divide the lens weight, we distribute in the three different zones. So base, apex, and base. This is how we provide this support to the lens. Where what happens is, though there is a touch, but the touch, what we expect in the center is the feathery touch. Uh, followed by the uh, touch in the uh, both the uh, base side. 
So we'll see the pictures and we'll try to understand. This is the typical epical clearance where they see this central, you know, so much of fluorescence is present. Here, there's an epical bearing. The bearing is quite high. Now, here, uh, we, uh, if we fit this kind of uh, thing, then the chances are there that, you know, uh, this cornea uh, can get eroded with the lens uh, uh, surface. Uh, kind of, this is not a very actual three-point touch, but if you see this, the touch is here at this first base and then center base and the uh, other uh, base. Uh, so this is one, two, and three. This is the three-point touch that we want uh, to uh, the RGB lens to be there. Uh, another interesting case to see the RGP is with the rule medicine case where you, uh, if you wanted to correct the corneal elastic medicine with RGP, what happened, the lens rock with the steep meridian and chances of there is lens moves much. Now here, what happened, uh, the lens sit across the flat meridian and the steeper area shows that there's a vertical dumbbell pulling, vertical dumbbell pulling, and you can observe that. And that you can make sure, you can make out that uh, 90 degree meridian being very steep. The chances is there that lens will move vertically with the uh, uh, blink. And uh, uh, mm, uh, so while prescribing, what is ideal is the lens, the upper edge of the lens should not cross the, uh, the pupil margin. At least there would be in one millimeter of cover area and the lens should not even cross the limbal uh, more than one millimeter. I think I'm. Um, I I think I crossed the time. Uh, shall I continue, or I just uh, end up uh, in this topic here? Uh, you have another two minutes. Kindly finish it off as soon as. Yes, thank you. Uh, now coming to these row scale lenses, uh, it is specifically invented by Paul Rose from New Zealand, uh, who uh, brought uh, this specially designed RGP lenses uh, to correct for irregular corneas. The main, I, initially the rose K, it was, so if you see this uh, spherical lenses, what happened, it touches the cone and then there is a deep pool. In order to minimize that, you know, we had this kind of an uh, specially designed lenses, which covers the cone and uh, helps to correct the irregular corneas. Uh, there are some challenges with the rose K lenses, so that, you know, rose K2 came into market with the aspheric back surface. Uh, this aspheric back surface helps to improve the optics uh, uh, so that you know we can correct the patient properly. Uh, these are the different types of rose scale lenses. For this talk, I would be preferring to a regular rose K2 lenses. Uh, and you can see, and probably uh, from this or the company uh, you know, available brochures, you can see all the details, uh, the indications, and the power, the available parameters. Once you fit a uh, rose scale lenses, once you get the central fit, then you can do these three modifications. The fit assessment remains same as RGP. You do these three modifications, which are the toric peripheries, asymmetric corneal uh, quadrant specific uh, changes, and toric back and front by toric lenses. So you'll see them flexible edge lift. In case if your lens, you are satisfied with the central and mid peripheral fit, but the edge is too steep and you wanted to improve the edge, you can flatten the edge from here, the zero till plus three, or if the edge is too flat, you can steepen the edge from zero to minus 1.3. The trial lenses comes with the standard lift of the lenses. This is for the rose K2. Similarly, lenses for the ICs and the nipple cone also comes in the similar uh, uh, um, uh, fashion. Now, this flexible edge lift, you can see this lens is fitting quite well where you get the central touch, you have this one touch, second touch, and three touch, and the edge is quite good. But here you can see this edge is quite uh, thick. In this case, a st stiffening in the edge would help this lens, and you can achieve this kind of fit. Where you see this picture, this is taken from their brochure, and uh, this is quite thin where you need to increase the edge lift or flatten the edge lift. Now coming to this asymmetric corneal technology, basically when you are satisfied with the 
uh, three and nine o'clock and 12 o'clock positions, but at the inferiorly six o'clock positions when you are not satisfied, what you can actually flatten that area in order to get that out. You can stiffen this area. Look at this, these are the grade. So this is the, being the lowest grade. This is 0.7 mm where three to uh, where this five to seven o'clock positions you can actually play. Around the six o'clock positions you can play and you can improve the fitting. This is the, when this, bottom in edge lift is quite high, you may need to go to SCA, SCT grade two, where if it is significantly high, probably in this case, you may need to try an X lens, but in this lens, if you wanted to change, then you have to change this SCT grade three. But uh, by looking at this picture, probably when you do this trial, you may need to try a different lens and to see the fitting again. They do have a toric periphery where what happened? In this case, the three to nine o'clock area you can flatten and six to 12 o'clock area you can steepen in order to improve this fit. Look at this fit where you see this area is uh, not that you know you expect to fit. Whereas if you apply the ACT, you can improve this fit so that you get a good edge and central fit. Uh, we will just see a few example. Just this is the last slide. You see this, uh, typically you want a row scale lens to fit like this. There is a very nice edge with an uh, excellent edge with an edge clearance and central touch. This is a three point touch as well as a very good edge. But what happened, actual patient, if you try to get this kind of fit, where you see this a typical rose to lens with the 8.7 mm of uh, total dia uh, was tried. But then what happened is that, you know, if you change this parameter to, or in this case, probably once the parameter was changed to a nipple cone, which is basically a smaller diameter rose scale lenses uh, to 8.3. And since they have reduced the size, what happened? They have stiffened the edge because edge was already plus one that was lifted. Now from plus one, you went to zero. Basically you have stiffened the edge because you are reducing the total diameter. Chances of this edge would be very thick and see the result in your screen. It is a quite uh, uh, comprehensive fit, which you can go ahead with this. With this, I end this, my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Premjit, for your wonderful session. Uh, let us welcome our uh, next speaker, Ms. Irene Sophia, currently working as senior optometrist in uh, Mediclinic City Hospital, Dubai, practicing ortho K and uh, scleral lenses for more than a decade. She is also a fellow of IOMAC, member of the BCLA, ICAL, SLS, ISEV. She is going to share her experience on basics of the scleral lenses. Hand over to Miss Irene. Yes, hi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Let me just share my screen here. First of all, uh, let me thank the Optometrist Forum here for letting me be part of this lovely program. And also I'd like to thank this 300 plus participants whom I would like to think are still logged in and listening after four and a half hours of uh, this extensive session. Uh, let me just check here one second. Okay. All right, so can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. And my presentation. All right? Yes. Just going to minimize this. All right, so let's start off with the, the basics of scleral lenses. So the objectives of this talk is gonna be uh, the history, the terminology, a little bit of the design and indications and contraindications and a little bit of the fitting procedure. Uh, Okay, let me, I, I think I'll be a little short of time. So I'll just rush through this. We all know how the concept of contact lenses started after Leonardo da Vinci uh, proposed this theory of uh, using the glass tube with the water to look through that. 
And then he realized that the vision was clearer. So from then, after like 400 to 500 years later, the uh, a lot of theories changed, and then we came up with this uh, lenses, which kind of looked similar to the modern day scleral lens, but only that it was made with heavy blown glass, and uh, it used to be very heavy, definitely, and it suffocated the cornea under the uh, glass, and uh, but that was the kind of scleral lens which was first made. And uh, after the, thanks to the World War II, then uh, people found out that PMMA was uh, very compatible with the human body. And then we started using PMMA for contact lenses. And then came the GPs. I'm not sure uh, how many of you are aware, but uh, a corneal lens was kind of an accident when uh, this optician, Kevin Tuohi, when he was kind of uh, cutting out a scleral lens, he accidentally made a smaller lens and he realized that that worked too. And that's how corneal GPs uh, were uh, working for a long time until the 1980s when after a lot of uh, improvement in technology in the lens materials and manufacturing techniques, uh, the sclerals came back into the market. So that was a quick history there. And uh, when the people started using scleral lenses, again, there were a lot of different types and um, many uh, researchers and practitioners use different names for these scleral lenses, from semi-sclerals to mini-sclerals. So uh, that was kind of a little confusing. So the Scleral Lens Education Society uh, published an uh, official guide for scleral lens terminology, and they uh, defined the scleral lens as a lens that fitted to hold over the entire cornea, including the limbus, and to land on the conjunctiva overlying the sclera. And that they termed as scleral lens and whatever be the size, they wanted to name it as a scleral lens with the acronym SL. Uh, so let's look at a design of the lens a little bit. Basically it has uh, three main zones, uh, the optic zone being the central part uh, with the refractive correction. And uh, then comes the transition zone, which kind of connects the optic zone with the uh, landing zone. And this trans position is over the cornea and the limbus and just over towards the sclera. And the last part of the scleral lens will be the landing zone, which is uh, which can be either spherical or toric, and it's kind of, uh, we can customize it depending on the fit. And that's the last uh, or the lens edge of the scleral lens. So basic design of a scleral lens is this, it has three major parts. So once we put a scleral lens on the eye, we see that uh, uh, to assess the lens fit, which we will look at uh, later, uh, we're going to put a scleral lens with a saline and then fit it on the eye, right? And then the space between the lens and the cornea is known as the fluid reservoir. So that's where the saline is. So like how we saw in the previous presentation, the tear film, that's the part which neutralizes optically the corneal irregularities and improves the vision. So the amount of uh, uh, the clearance is a little different from the GP lens and the scleral lens, uh, depending because of the change in diameter. And uh, this clearance is uh, going to vary depending on the diameter again of the lens. So the fluid reservoir usually is indicated uh, in terms of uh, the depth and the location. So it can be like say 300 microns. Generally uh, for an optimum fit, it should be anywhere between 100 to 300, depending on the diameter of the scleral lens used. So we're going to mention it as 300 microns, for example, in the central zone and uh, 50 microns in depth at the limbal zone. So it's specified with the location also. So why scleral lenses? Uh, basically, it is to improve the comfort, the stability, and the centration of a GP lens. So uh, if, G if the corneal irregularity is high, then if a corneal lens is uh, not fitting, if a corneal GP lens is not fitting well, like how you see in this image, then that's when we need a larger lens, and that's where the scleral lens helps, right? Because cornea being a sensitive uh, a tissue, a sensitive uh, layer, and uh, because of the nerve endings and then the pathology is present, then it's going to be even more sensitive. Hence, the patient will not be comfortable 
uh, and hence they need a different option. So that's how scleral lens helps. With the scleral lens, the movement of the lens is minimal and lens, uh, there's less uh, interaction with the lid and hence less awareness of the lens on the eye. And that's how it becomes more comfortable. So let's look at the indications and contraindications a little bit. So mainly uh, research has uh, in, shown that uh, the scleral lens wear is more for like 74% it's used for corneal irregularities and 16% when there are uh, ocular surface diseases and about 10% also for uh, like, even if it's an uncomplicated refractive error, you know, for regular refractive errors, uh, scleral lenses are being used. The main purpose being for vision correction, comfort, and to protect the ocular surface. So in terms of vision correction, we're going to use it uh, more in cases of primary ectasia, say for keratoconus, keratoglobus, for PMDs, and also post-surgical secondary ectasias or even if it's just a very high irregular uh, corneal astigmatism. And also for regular refractive errors when there's high myopia or aphakia. And we also recommend scleral lenses for sport activities like water sports, then the recommended lens is a scleral lens. And the next purpose being for ocular surface protection, especially when the, there's a condition of exposure keratopathy or persistent epithelial defects, the stricticases or entropion, and even if there's a little bit of uh, moderate dryness, then scleral lenses help a lot in protecting the ocular surface. And uh, in severe conditions like autoimmune uh, conditions such as Jobrens or uh, ocular psychiatrical pamphigoid, or even if there's an allergic uh, Steven Johnson syndrome, then to protect the surface of the uh, uh, ocular uh, surface, then scleral lenses helps a lot. So uh, contraindications, uh, we have to be a little careful when we fit uh, scleral lenses. We have to, uh, we look at what we're going to test, but generally when there are corneal endothelial abnormalities, then uh, we'll need to avoid fitting scleral lenses if there's glaucoma. And definitely these are not for overnight wear. And even if a patient is having some intolerance to lens wear, uh, then we'll need to avoid that because it's going to take a, a little more effort than a regular lens. And if, they are, uh, if there's poor compliance to hygiene or even the wearing schedule, then we're not going to uh, give them uh, scleral lenses. And this is an image of a bleb, which is not a contraindication, but just to indicate glaucoma. And uh, to look a little bit into the fitting, and fitting starts with any regular, uh, like any regular contact lens. We've got to look at the history, the ocular and the medical uh, history of the patient. And if they've used any other contact lenses before, and we'll have to do an ex a comprehensive eye exam before starting the lens fit, so that we know that if there's any other condition which will affect the vision improvement, and uh, what kind of surface irregularities are present, like pterygium or pendicular, or even blebs. And then we need to do some baseline corneal measurements like specular microscopy for scleral lens. I would uh, definitely recommend that before we fit the lens and our topography and tomographies. So along with these, if we're fortunate, then we can even do the uh, shape of the anterior ocular surface uh, topography, like scleral topography, okay? Um, uh, example like the uh, eye surface profiler by the eaglet or SMAP 3D. So what are these? instruments, these kind of give us a topography of the sclera too, a little more than the cornea, okay? Because to fit a scleral lens, we know that the actual uh, part of the eye where the lens lands is on the conjunctiva overlying the sclera, right? So we need to know the uh, uh, structure of that part. So hence an eye surface profiler will be a, a very good additive in, uh, in terms of instrumentation uh, to check the uh, surface of the sclera. So this is how it's going to just an uh, image. You can see that this is the whole cornea and you're going to get more information about the surface even further from the cornea. I think it's around a 20 millimeter overall. And this is an image from the SMAP 3D. So it's going to measure three parts and then put it all together and give us more information, just not about the corneal topography, but also the scleral topography. So why this is going to be important is uh, because we need to know, we know that the corneal junction is not 
uh, really spherical, right? It, or it can be a tangent and it can be different shapes. So we need to know that to get a good fit, basically. So uh, if we look at fitting, uh, I would prefer a trial set fit because uh, that kind of gives you an uh, immediate picture of how the lens looks and for you to decide if you want to make changes. So we generally use a trial set to fit a scleral lens and uh, depending on the parameters that we get from our tomography and the scleral pro profiler, if we have, then we choose the first lens and uh, it's inserted in the eye and then we check the fit similar to any GP lens. So before inserting, the only difference will be we need to fill it up with saline and then we insert it. Since it's going to be filled with saline, we can't just stand and insert it. We have to bend down and uh, get parallel to the, so the corneal, uh, sorry, the lens, uh, the cup, and then fit it in the eye. And after insertion, if in case there's a bubble, then we need to remove the lens and uh, apply it again. So that uh, image that you see down is a insertion bubble. So step one uh, is the diameter to decide uh, on which lens to choose. So we have to look at the, well, we choose the diameter of a scleral lens. It's going to be depending on the HPID, uh, the limbus width, and the corneal sagittal height. So all these three parameters need to be taken into account. And then we decide the diameter, the total diameter of a scleral lens. And step two will be the clearance. We need to check uh, how much of uh, clearance is there in the center, uh, on the uh, just in the center below the lens and even in the limbus. And we'll need to look uh, all 360 degrees around. So we'll need to see that there's adequate uh, fluorescein or tear layer between the lens and the cornea. So here in this image, if you see, the green layer is where the, the saline is between the lens and the cornea. And the green is of course, because of the fluorescein. And we generally use fluorescent with white light to assess the fit of a scleral lens. And with practice, probably uh, you even don't need the fluorescent. You can assess it just with the white light. And this fluorescent uh, layer is going to be measured in comparison with uh, another layer, mostly the uh, thickness of the lens, because that's a fixed value, because the corneal thickness might change. So we cannot compare it with the corneal thickness. And uh, we compare it generally with the known thickness of the lens, and we need to get the uh, optimum of uh, clearance uh, there for the uh, for a good fit. So optimum clearance can be, like I said before, anywhere from uh, 100 microns to 300 microns, depending on which lens you're using and what's the diameter of the lens. And the limbal clearance again should be checked separately because it's uh, very uh, essential that the lens doesn't touch the limbal area. So there should be a minimum of 50 microns at least over the limbus. And the third step in assessing the fit is the landing zone, uh, which is a very important because that's where the lens lands on the ocular surface. Uh, all over the cornea and the limbus, it's going to vault over and then it's going to land on the uh, sclera uh, at the landing zone. So the fit of a landing zone is very uh, important because if it's going to be tight or if it's going to be loose, it's going to decide if there's going to be any uh, impingement on the blood vessels causing blanching. So down here in this image, you can see that uh, there is a very tight fit here under this white area. So that means the blood vessels are compressed and uh, there's no flow of blood vessels there in the fringing diverse. So that's not a good fit. So that's why assessment of the landing zone is very important so that we get a better fit, uh, which can uh, otherwise cause uh, trouble in the eye. So the step four is the lens edge. We have to assess the, how the lens edge fits. Uh, similar to a corneal GP lens, there should be a little bit of uh, lens edge. There should be a lift, but it should be optimum. Again, like this is an OCT image. Uh, we can assess, it, assess the scleral lens fit even with an OCT. Uh, if not, or if we don't have an OCT, we can do it on the slit lamp. So this is just an example to show that, you know, generally with OCT, there's a 50-50 rule that the edge of the lens should impinge, or uh, the edge should be like 50% outside and 50% just touching the conjunctiva. So that is a good fit. And uh, how you assess this is with the push-in method. So push-in is like they, you slightly nudge the lower lid 
okay uh, over the over the or uh, into the sclera you should not touch the conjunctiva directly with your finger you just nudge the lower lid slightly and then you see how much pressure is needed to cause a slight stand off of the lens edge okay so if you're going to gently push then it's a well fitting lens the edge is a well fitted and if you have to push hard to get that stand off that means it's a tight fit and if you like a uh, very little pressure is needed then it's uh, a loose fit so that's how you assess the lens edge fitting so this is another uh, image by uh, from by these uh, authors so they have just given a comparison as to how a uh, lens edge can be a loose fit like with the first image or if the there's a good alignment at the lens edge you can see the second image where there's you know it's all even so they've shown you one quadrant but of course we got to check all around 360 degrees and there's no any pressing on the blood vessels there's no blanching like how we see here in the second last image there's quite a bit of uh, impingement there and like total blanching here in the last image so this is a bad uh, fit so we need to loosen that fit a bit and the second image is how a good fit will look for the edge and the next step is we'll have to assess if we need a asymmetric back surface design so basically if the sclera is uh, too toric if it's not like a, a similar curvature all around then the lens is not going to fit or align well so we need to decide if we have to go for a toric periphery lens so that is what is an asymmetric back surface design assessment is and uh, how we apply and remove these lenses it's definitely uh, different from the gp lens because here we'll either use a plunger because we're going to hold the lens and fill it with saline and then apply it on the eye so either the plunger or a uh, you can use your three fingers uh, to use it like a tripod and insert the lens so and the removal is also with a smaller plunger uh, for applying the lens on the eye it's better to with practice probably the patient usually gets adapted to the finger method initially you might have to give a plunger but it's better to avoid these many gadgets or as many as possible so that there's less risk of infection uh, but till the patient can learn we can still give a holder to apply the lens and for removal like i said there's a smaller plunger with a smaller diameter where we use to like uh, create a suction on the lens just slightly press it on the lens not in the center but slightly below and then pull it out so that the lens just comes out like how it's shown in the image there so and this is something that we have to teach the patient also uh, definitely a sclera lens there's a little more effort in insertion or sorry applying or uh, removing the lens uh but that comes with practice so we we'll need to kind of most of the time patients get a little worried about this longer process but uh, generally they learn it and then with practice they are okay so uh to conclude the scleral lenses are a very uh, effective method for uh, visual rehabilitation in irregular corneas and also a therapeutic treatment of, of ocular surface diseases they work very well and they also work for correction of refractive errors in healthy eyes particularly when now uh, other modalities fail and also in my opinion it's also a very excellent skill set for optometrists so that we can improve the quality of life for people who have you know a uh, compromised vision because of that these are my references and thank you very much thank you miss irene uh, for your wonderful session uh the forum is open for the panel discussion stay tuned for the few seconds while you find the questions on the screen kindly select the answers meantime we will shift to the other room for the discussion which of this type of therapeutic contact lenses can be used to uh, severe dry eye kindly select the right answer below the main reason to fit the toric back surface rgp in case of astigmatism cornea is kindly select the answers below uh, for a patient with minus 3 with minus 150 at 180 axis which is a ideal kindly answer, answer the questions below uh, a patient uh, complaining of uh, flare at night driving with rgp uh, minus 5 adapter power by examination noted 2.5 mm of the 
superior temporal uh, decentration what will be your choice first choice kindly answer the questions below mr jack uh, there is one interesting question from the audience uh, regarding the myopia control as a beginner uh, can i jump directly to the ortho k lenses or to start with the soft multifocal contact lenses or the progressive lenses first um that will depend a lot on your experience so with the spectacle lenses uh, slor has some really really great um teaching tools if we're going to start with the spectacles and that's something that every practice should have access to um there are a few other brands out there for example hoya have their um my smart lenses um but yeah if you chat to some of the manufacturers that you regularly use and um, they'll be able to do teaching on that for you uh, atropine is something that will not be available in the high street but it will be available to the hospital practitioners and with the ortho K, we primarily use number seven um, for our ortho Ks. And they have a, an ortho K um, a basically training session specifically designed um, with the use of whichever topographer you have in practice. So reach out to the manufacturers um, for specific training on each of the um, on each of the you know myopic myopic um, preventative strategies and they'll definitely be able to help there was another one Shareth, sorry just in the questions as well um about the age don't know if you saw that um it was from samaya thomas uh first of all you've said here uh, at what age of child can we start the myopia control first of all um very naughty of you to say myopia control we're going to try and stick to uh, myopia management going forward and age of the child it uh, there is no set cutoff so when i'm talking about contact lenses it's when the patient's sensible enough to use contact lenses um there's some 17 year old boys i wouldn't let anywhere near contact lenses there's some 10 year old girls that are more than capable of handling ortho k lenses atropine drops you can start that very young um you know, three, four years old, and um, the drops don't sting. And it depends on, you know, the discussions you have with the parents and what you feel is in the best interest of the child. So there's no age cutoff. Thank you, Zach, uh, for your answer. Uh, we have another interesting question for uh, Professor Premjit from the audience regarding the Roski fitting. How many diopters of astigmatism can be neutralized with the rose K or the RGP lenses? Also, when we should order toric lenses? Well, uh, the question is really uh, important. Uh, thing is that when we correct uh, astigmatism with rose K or any GP lens, uh, if it is a spherical power, then what happens is the TR lens corrects the astigmatism. And as we know, it's 90% of the astigmatism which TR lens can correct. Mm -hmm. So even if a PMD or a very high toricity, let's say nine after of astigmatism or 10 after astigmatism is there, then uh, ideally by nine after you should be able to correct. But remaining one after that you have to manage with spherical equivalent, uh, that is how it is. So that totally depends upon what is the irregularity is there and how well you get the fit. But more or less, yes, you can manage 90% of corneal astigmatism with the toric lenses. Uh, now, second part of the question is the when we fit the toric lenses. That is what the question is? Yes, yes. Okay. Now, for the rose K, the toric lenses are basically to improve the fitting. As you see, this is the one of the modification when you fit a rose K lenses. And you don't, because of the nature of the cornea, if the vertical meridian is behaving differently than the horizontal meridian. So by playing with the uh, meridian, you can actually achieve a good fit. It is not to correct the corneal elastic method, it's to improve the fitting. Uh, thank you, Professor Premji. Uh, we have one more question for uh, Ms. Irene uh, regarding the scleral lenses fitting. 
can we fit a advanced case with the high drops with the scleral lenses give me some tips to keep in mind while approaching such cases okay uh, yeah you can fit advanced teratoconus with scleral lens but uh, i don't understand uh, why high drops came in is it like post high drops because yeah if high drops needs uh, like immediate treatment and once it's settled then yes we can fit scleral lenses and depending on if there's a scar or no then your visual improvement is going to depend on that so it needs uh, treatment first and then we can do scleral lens yes okay thank you all uh, for your wonderful uh, panel discussion uh, now we would like to welcome one of our sponsor ayun care medical equipment to give the presentation on behalf of them miss kavya tareja going to present uh, over to miss kavya um hello good evening everyone hope all are doing good uh, i would like to share the presentation can you open your camera please uh, yeah surely one second um, uh, uh hello yes am i audible can... yeah yes 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 yeah one second i would like to share the uh, screen with you all uh, good evening everyone hope all are doing good one second um, yeah this is a presentation of my company we are unke vision and equipment solutions we um, started our company in uae market in 2017 we are a company of uh, we are the trading company of uh, ophthalmic surgical equipment and contact lenses and uh, implantable fecic uh, contact lenses vision therapy uh, instruments low vision devices and medical equipment based in dubai uh, uae market our vision is to uh, we are very focused on quality care improving the top line and bottom line performance of ik centers and hospitals and improving operations to boost customer satisfaction and overall health uh, we will continue to grow our niche as a premium eye care solutions we uh, and uh, our best uh, sorry our main motto is customer uh, satisfaction and trust on our company Our specialty lenses are corneal RGP hybrid contact lenses, ortho keratology lenses, easy soft lenses. Uh, we do provide vision therapy instrument, including home kit and software, and we do a uh, prosthetic eye. Uh, we provide low vision devices, surgical instruments, and uh, consumables. Uh, our products are registered with UAE uh, Ministry of Health and uh, Prevention. So ours is very trustworthy company. And for any inquiry or uh, any related to any uh, discussion, if you want to do further, you can drop in the mail to you info yun at the rate yuncare dot com, or you can contact uh, on the following number, which is mentioned on our presentation. So thank you so much for your time. and have a great evening thank you thank you miss uh, kavya tareja uh, now we are i'm going to over to the host thank you thank you so much thank you thank you sharad and all the panelists now we'll be going to our last session but before we set up the panel for the last session so we'll be having poll questions now so kindly see the questions and answer yeah i hope everybody can see the questions the father of modern optometry so there are options so you can select what is the right option according to you world then second world optometry day celebrating on which date then the third question first glass contact lens fitted by fick and edward on which year so you can give your poll when optometry was first introduced in india by gandhi eye hospital aligarh 
So if you know the right answer, click on the answer. Okay, thank you. By this, we end our poll and we go forward to our sessions. Now we have come to the last session of the day. An interesting session too. Yes, it's about optometry journey. I'll call upon Optum Niras Dabra. He's professional with 27 years of multi-industry, multi-location, multi-function experience in business development, training, operation, product marketing. Managed multiple optical businesses with function, functional expertise in developing new markets, product launch, and customer skill development. Currently heading Astra DM Optical Division. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Swarna. Uh, I would now, being the moderator of this session, want to introduce the other panelists in the in the group here. I would first like to introduce Ms. Daisy Balbuena Teduran. She is having 19 years of experience in the field of optometry. Uh, currently is based out of Abu Dhabi. She did her optometry from Philippines and uh, is, has practiced in UAE as well as in Bahrain. She has the elected president of Integrated Philippine Association of Optometry, UAE chapter. This organization primarily uh, looks at uh, Filipino optometrists and helps them in uh, attaining knowledge through conferences, seminars, and workshops. She's also a member of Bahanian Council of Abu Dhabi, as well as member of Philippine professional organization, UAE. So welcome, uh, Ms. Daisy. Um, other panelist is McHillary. He has clinical optometry background with doctor of optometry from University of Benin, Nigeria, and has more than 10 years of practice experience. He moved to Abu Dhabi in 2015 and evolved uh, into including behavioral optometry and public health research along with clinical optometry. Enrolled into master of public health from University of Roehampton, London. In, 1920, uh, in 2021, he completed a professional development certificate program at University of Washington. And that's not all. He has been improving on his educational journey. And in 2022, recently, he uh, completed a course from UK College of Optometry, which was a professional certification in low vision from Cardiff University. And currently, he's preparing for his multi- uh, interdisciplinary PhD research in the area of intersection of global eye health and global mental health. So welcome, uh, Mr. McClary. And over to uh, another gentleman here, uh, Mr. Othman Boshnak. He is an optometrist who graduated from Jordan in 2000, has more than uh, 15 years of experience in the retail segment, more than seven years of experience in professional uh, services at SLR Middle East, and currently, he is part of the uh, SLO team handling international as well as Middle East markets, including African countries for SLO instruments. So welcome to the panelists. Uh, I would start with the question since the subject is uh, the optometry journey. So please, uh, the panelists are requested to take us through their professional journey from their country where they started their optometry journey and how it uh, was when they ended up being in United Arab Emirates, which is UAE. So please, if you could have the lady on, on the panel first, so that's Miss Daisy to give us and take us through the, her experience. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Well, um, first, uh, let me just introduce to you uh, the Philippine optometries, what Philippine optometry is all about. The uh, optometry course was increased from four to six years. Uh, the first batch of optometrists who graduated from the six-year curriculum in 2004 were authorized by law to use diagnostic pharmaceutical agents or the DPAs in their practice 
uh, a special pharmacology course was likewise offered in different optometry institutions to give practitioners who graduated from the four-year course the privilege to use DPAs. To be a registered optometrist in the Philippines, one must pass the licensure examination and be registered in uh, Professional Regulation Commission. Uh, prior to that criteria for application of licensure examination, uh, he must be a Filipino citizen of good moral character. He should obtain the degree doctor of optometry granted by schools accredited or recognized by the Philippine government, particularly the Commission on Higher Education. The uh, program of doctor of optometry is six years. First two years with general education subjects are being taught, must be passed and be progressed to a third, fourth and fifth year while major optometry subjects and clinical subjects are being taught. The final will be the internship. The sub-technical panel for optometry education was likewise organized by the Commission on Higher Education to oversee the development of the optometry curriculum and tasked to evaluate and maintain the standards of optometry education in the Philippines. Once completed or passed, then they will graduate as doctor of optometry. Um, but of course, uh, to take the board examination after the review. So there. Sure. Over to uh, Mr. McLeary. <coughs> Hi, hello everyone, good evening. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, you are audible, Mr. McLeary. All right, all right then. So I'm joining in from um, Benin City, Edo State, Nigeria. Right. So and um, it's um, six twenty p.m. here. So we are three hours behind the United Arab Emirates. Yeah. So um, before I touched on my own personal journey in optometry from Nigeria to the UAE, and of course, back to Nigeria. Uh, I'd like to quickly take us through the, uh, the optometry profile or progression in Nigeria. Um, over the years, um, just like it is in the Philippines, uh, Nigeria optometry training has moved from a bachelor's degree, four years program to a doctor of optometry, six years clinical training with a compulsory graduate internship in an approved um, uh, hospitals. So the currently we have about um, seven at fully accredited in, um, universe, University of Nigeria offering the program of doctor of optometry and about five more are under um, um, under the approval process or accreditation process. And so you can get into the optometry program to, through, through two routes. You can go in from the direct entry route, which gives the, in the, the student access to start from the second year because the individual have done a first degree in a biological science related course. And then the other stream is to start from the first year, uh, writing the um, post university matriculation exam to begin at first year. And so the program is structured, the first three years is the preclinical year. And the third year, the, the student is supposed to take uh, an exam that would qualify them to progress to the clinical phase beginning from the fourth year. So from the fourth year up to the sixth year, the students would have done quite a number of courses in, psych let's say in psychology, in computer science, in um, pharmacology, in, in um, uh, biochemistry, and of course, in op 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 um, ocular courses like in ocular, 
pathology and, and the likes. Then from the 50, 50 and 60 are strictly clinicals where the student goes for clinic rotations. And then they have hands, uh, hands on opportunity to see patients with, under street supervision. Then at the, upon graduation, there is the induction ceremony, which is conducted by the regulatory body of Nigeria. It's called the Optometrist and Dispensing Optician Registration Board. So they regulate both the optometry and the optician uh, profession. So the board, they also are the ones that are responsible for accreditation of the institution. So then the, in, the student after the internship takes a final exam and case presentation is submitted to the board council for final assessment before full registration is granted to the individual for the license for, license, for the oh. annual licensure to continue. So and um, after the internship year, the individual could work either in the hospital based as an hospital based optometrist or in the private sector. Either um, you can also work in industries like in HMOs or the insurance companies. You could work with multinational NGOs and the, the list just goes on and on because the training was really grounded. So the an optometrist can find himself in different industry. But again, given the um, resource limit, limited region we are from, we always find ourselves seeking greener pastures. And so that was also my case after about three years of practice experience in Nigeria. I looked, I was looking to migrate to Canada, but that was taking a bit of time. And so I looked at the UAE and I, at the time I found a Nigerian who was working in Yatim Optician in the administrative department as the professional head of professional affairs. So he at the time would come to Nigeria to recruit optometrists into the UAE. And so and one of the times I applied and took the um, assessment and I passed. And so that's how I came into the UAE. So maybe I should stop there for now. I can progress <laughs> later. Sure, thank you, Mr. McLeary. Over to Mr. Othman. Thank you, Niraj, and uh, good evening to all my friends and uh, colleagues. I'm uh, really very happy to attend uh, this webinar. It was really very informative, especially for me, because I uh, not in a practice, let's say, for more than uh, seven, eight years. Uh, and it's refreshed a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, I was with a group of optometry in the cafe, and one of uh, my colleagues uh, asked me if the time back 20, 25 years ago, do you study optometry? And my answer, or what you, uh, if not what you're going to study, my answer, I will study one thing only, optometry. <laughs> Even who anyone who advised uh, me, uh, my daughter is going to graduate from high school. What do you think? I say immediately, optometry, optometry, and optometry. The reason behind uh, that it's uh, our field. It's unlimited. It's expanding every day. We have a lot of things uh, new. Just a few years ago, no one from us hearing about uh, myopia uh, management. Today, most of the optometry uh, talking about uh, it, and it's uh, it's it's going to be our futures of uh, of the future of the optometry, especially if, uh, World Health Organizations announced that's 50% of the population will become myopic soon, which is uh, 2050. So yes, optometry. Uh, 
I'm uh, as a, as a Mr. Niraj introduced me. I am uh, uh, graduated from Jordan from 2000. Uh, from 2000, and that time uh, Jordan only the country in the Middle East graduated uh, optometry, and then many countries in the region start also developing the optometry uh, university college and even the uh, regulations. Uh, after that, we uh, today, or for example, today we have a four uh, college and university uh, for optometry in Jordan, three in Lebanon, uh, one in Oman, and uh, two in K uh, KSA. The majority of them graduated bachelor of optometry, uh, except KSA, where the, the only country in the Middle East graduated uh, graduating a doctor of uh, optometry. Uh, during uh, 20 years uh, experience in the Middle East, there is a huge uh, development, let's say, in optometry field in terms of uh, professional uh, edu ed education. Uh, as I mentioned now, I, uh, 20 years ago, we started in the entire Middle East in one university. Now we have more than uh, seven or eight uh, uh, university. In terms of your uh, regulations, the optometry become stronger and stronger in all uh, the fields. Uh, my experience, entire my uh, journey, it was uh, as an optometry uh, in re retail business. So uh, during this uh, discussions, I will focus more on not a clinical experience, on the uh, uh, retail experience, uh, because here where I can really add uh, value to uh, uh, to the audience. So, uh, let's... thank you, thank thank you, Mr. Othman and the panelists. Uh, just to give you a background of since I did my optometry from India, uh, at that time optometry courses had varying uh, durations, but yes, now as we speak. Optometry is fairly standard four-year uh, courses for bachelors. There are a lot of options available to optometrists, whether they want to graduate and do masters, even research options are available. Uh, when I uh, graduated, very few optometrists were looking at uh, a professional career in the industry. And uh, now I see a lot of them being very open to, they are part of professional services of various organizations. They are into research. They are uh, doing, uh, they are in academia. So yes, and it is uh, becoming a regulated profession also. So there is a lot of standardization which is coming in and, and optometrists have a, a bright future. So that's why more and more youngsters, when they graduate or from their schools, they want to uh, become an optometrist and adopt this as a, as a profession. Uh, so panelists, uh, thank you for sharing your views. But another question is, when you moved on to uh, UAE from your respective countries, what differences did you observe from the way optometry was practiced back home to what it was in UAE? Any of the uh, panelists can answer this. To begin with. Okay, uh, let me let me start. Okay, yeah. So given my our clinical training and background or practice background in Nigeria, moving to the UAE, um, I, I felt like our scope became narrow, really, really narrow in scope, especially because we were in the retail optical sector and not in the hospital, yeah, because a few of the Nigerian I met had managed to move from the retail sector to the hospital. And so those ones, even though their scope is still a bit um, limited, but they had more access to instrumentation and interpretation of, of results because they're working with the ophthalmologist now directly. But in the optical retail sector where we were, well, we just noticed that you have, first of all, you have a very limited time to deal with your patient. So you don't have all the time to, to engage with your patient in a more clinical setting that you're used to back home. And then, like I said, scope is reduced. You just focus on refraction and then dispensing of contact lens or fitting of contact lens and dispensing of spectacle lenses. So scope 
was reduced. And um, I, I struggled with that a lot because at some point I would have, I would have this friction with the sales team saying I'm, I'm taking too much time with patients because I come from a background where we take time with patients, educate them, we do a lot of things. So but after a while, I need I, I got to adjust into that, you know, spending less time with patients, but at least quality time, given our background. Then I also realized that, uh, well, in the UAE, because there are no optometry school, there are no optometry school, I, I quickly noticed that there were no locals who were optometrists at the time. I don't know about now. At the time, there are no locals who are optometrists. And what that means is that optometry will get really, really, really little attention from the, the, health, um, the health sector. And yeah, so these are what I noticed. And, and while I was not really happy with that, I had to, I felt my other skills would become rusty. So I took up my master's immediately to keep me studying. So I did my master's in, of course, public health. Then in my thesis, I did my study in color vision deficiency in Alain, because I was in Alain at the time. So I looked at color vision deficiency amongst the male drivers in Alain. And that was my thesis I submitted for my M MPH. And yeah, so, and because maybe because I wasn't satisfied, I, was, I saw myself moving from practice into academy. So I became more and more focused in developing my career path in academics, which I, I, I still am till this moment. That's very nice, McClary, Mr. McClary. Good to hear from you, your views. Over to Ms. Daisy, Mr. Wotman. Uh, yeah. For me, I think um, clinical setting is the same since I started working in an optical shop. So for me, there's really nothing uh, changed or whatsoever. It's, it's, it's the same. It's just like um, from the Philippines to here, the, the, my practice is the same. It is just like that. Um, uh, one more thing, aside from uh, the practice, practicing in an optical field, optical facility, is um, uh, we Filipino optometrists here, uh, we are with the organization, um, which is the uh, Integrated Philippine Association of Optometries, which is the only uh, organization accredited by the Professional Regulation Commission in the Philippines. So this uh, organization is uh, focusing mainly on, oh, by the way, it was, it was uh, a CPD provider. It, uh, the, the EPAO was accredited by the PRC as a CPD provider or the Continuing Professional Development and uh, has embarked on continuing education programs since then in compliance with the code of ethics for optometries. So um, the uh, mission is to uh, help Filipino optometries gain global recognition in their practice for our fellow men by providing quality service adhering to um, standards and ethical practices for our colleagues by um, uh, fostering an environmental uh, collaboration, mutual respect and sharing of expertise and skills for the betterment of the profession uh, that we are engaged in. So, um yeah um the organization has survived the test of time and while it has adapted to changes for several decades the emphasis from um sight to vision from spectacle peddling to refraction to brain injury rehabilitation optometry in the philippines has indeed evolved to what it is today 
through sound leadership, good, governa good governance, transparency, regulation, and education. And all these accomplishments, the uh, Integrated Philippine Association of Optometrists has been in the forefront of active change and evolution to make Philippine optometry what it is today. For almost 45 years, the organization members have remained faithful to its vision and identity as a true representative organization of the optometrists. So by the optometrists and for the optometrists. Thank you, Ms. Daisy. Thank you, Ms. Daisy. Uh, Mr. Othman, your views. From my side, because I came from the same region in the, from Middle East, to be honest, I'm not feel, uh, seen or feel uh, a big difference between what I was practice in my uh, home country and uh, in DCC, for, because we are always sharing a lot of uh, cultures. So I not feel uh, a big uh, difference, except uh, uh, that's here in, uh, let's say, in UAE or in, in, in all, most uh, Gulf countries, we don't have a, like a strong association or a legal association to influence uh, the Ministry of Health for, uh, for example, em empower more uh, the optometrist or sometimes changing uh, some rules. So here everything com coming from up, which is uh, from Ministry of Health, while in our country we have our own association and the society. Through that society, we, uh, uh, we uh, can or we have a power as with the limit power, but at least we have some power to make a, a change uh, in the regulation of the optometry in uh, that uh, country. And we uh, success a lot uh, there to uh, get a lot of uh, benefits for optometry. While here, yes, in, in UAE, by the way, it's uh, well uh, regulated comparing to uh, other uh, uh, others uh, uh, country in the uh, Middle East, but there is always ro room uh, to improve. And as an optometry, we don't have that society to uh, uh, influence uh, the uh, regulatory borders to uh, change some regulation to empower optometry. Thank you. In fact, uh, just to add to what Mr. McClary said, uh, currently, yes, UA doesn't have a school of optometry. And in fact, one of our participants have also mentioned the same. Uh, and uh, also, while I understand, uh, you know, possibly when you have a clinical background and you move into uh, dispensing and optics, uh, one might find that, you know, it might have restricted as possibly was the view which Mr. McClary shared. But what also happens in the process is that, you know, your other skills get developed, which possibly would have not got the kind of due attention they deserved, especially the dispensing skills, the optics part, which you would have really found taking precedence when uh, you were practicing in, in UAE. Very well. Very yeah, and in Very fact, true. even things like, you know, engagement and understanding customers, these are the skills, the softer skills tend to uh, be taught more uh, than, than only the clinical skills. So it's kind of makes you, if I if I look at that way, a, a well-rounded professional in some way. Uh, and in the interest of time, this is one, uh, my final question to all of you. What would be your piece of advice for the new optometrists who uh, are either just come to UAE or want to uh, practice in UAE? What would you advise them? If, if we start with uh, me, because I have a, a retail uh, experience for all my uh, life, so I can advise any uh, optometrist want to do, uh, come to UAE and join any, uh, let's say, uh, uh, not a clinical, uh, retail uh, uh, business. Uh, and maybe here I'm going to add more what you mentioned, uh, Mr. Miraj. That's to success in retail, you need to complete the customer satisfaction uh, circle. 
when I say complete the satisfaction uh, circle, one point is the uh, improve the scale of uh, optometry to get a good a pro and proper refraction. This is the uh, first point to success in the retail. Yes, I totally agree uh, with uh, Mr. Hillary that we have a lot of limitation because in retail, we not do a full optometry. Actually, I can call uh, name us in uh, retail like a refractionist more than uh, fully op optometry. So I totally agree with you. But as I mentioned uh, by uh, Niraj, there is a lot of skills you need to development in order to grow and to success in retail business. One of the most uh, and the key success there is the uh, dispensing skills. So for any of uh, my uh, uh, new colleagues going to come to UAE and working in retail business, please, please, please work hard to improve your dispensing skills. Without dispensing skills, you are not going to complete the circle and to fully satisfy your customers. The third, and which is uh, not least important than others, is that try to involve more and more in on, in business. Uh, yes, uh, retail, you need to have a business mindset, and it's very important to satisfy your customers, not only for you to grow, also to satisfy your customer. Selecting the right frame, uh, selecting the right collection, uh, the way, as you say, the uh, selling uh, skills, the in engagement uh, skills, managing the, the store uh, 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 itself. All these skills is really important uh, for the optometry uh, to success and grow in the uh, re re uh, retail business. And I can uh, say one point here without business mindset in retail business you will not grow thank you, you mr Othman. in the interest of time my humble request to other pa uh, panelists would be that if they can be brief and give us their views on the subject yeah <laughs> i agree with mr Othman. it's um a totally uh, this is our core our core as an optometrist in retail market is um develop or uh, the the mindset of the retail is different from the clinical or hospital setup so our our core is to, to be um focused in our refraction because that is our uh, that is our main um core as optometry is the refraction and the dispensing and the troubleshooting it's all there so I, I definitely agree with Mr. Otman. This is what we are, where we are right now in uh, the setup of uh, the retail. I'm, I'm talking on, 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 on the retail side because I'm actually working on the retail ever since. So yeah, I, I can say that um, troubleshooting is uh, definitely uh, one thing to focus and the refraction. Yeah, selling is a second, but focus on your refraction. That's all. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, I'll say I can say this too. Yeah, I think I agree totally. Agree with um, what you other panelists have said. Given that the uh, in the UAE we the optometrists have about ninety ninety five percent chance of working in the retail sector than in the hospital sector. So if I have any colleague coming in, so I tell them to prepare their mindset towards soft skills that they could use to grow in the optical retail sector. Uh, like uh, my other colleague has highlighted, it has to be patient-centered. And so once it is patient-centered, it will help you to because uh, there's a saying, there's a popular saying that, that goes this way, that a satisfied customer is your best advertiser. So in the, in the, in the bit of growing the business, uh, meeting financial targets, you have to satisfy, put your patient in the center, make sure that they are satisfied so that they can make more, more visits and referrals to you. And that way you meet the... Uh, you know, the financial target of the organization. So yes, it's more about, uh, and uh, making it patient-centered means you have to understand, like uh, you have to understand 
customer relationship and then um, customer management and all of that. So it will be more of managerial skills coupled with your technical optometry skills, which is different than when you're in the, clean, in the hospital settings. You, you're mostly to, 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 to thrive in clinical environment. But now in the optical sector, you'll be a manager of patients and also um, you come to a soft skills in sales and general management too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McClary. Uh, thank you for the pa to the panel for their sharing their valuable views with us. Uh, over to Mr. Swarna Kamal for the closing comments. Thanks, Mr. Neeraj and all the panelists for sharing your experience in the journey of optometry. It was a wonderful discussion, which we hope will be useful to many who are planning to start their career in their respective country. We hope this webinar created an opportunity for young optometrists to meet pioneers of the field from all over the world. Now, I would like to call upon Dr. Amna Almazmi from ESO to speak a few words. Hi, everybody, again. Uh, I think uh, this had been an amazing opportunity for uh, us in ESO and uh, the optometrists who are practicing here in the Emirates, as well as in other parts to come together. I think uh, the, I believe that the organizing committee had uh, done an amazing work behind the scene to do all this collaboration because it does not come uh, out of free. It's the time and the energy, the enthusiasm that everybody had put into this amazing work. Um, I speak even behind the, from understanding how conferences are run. It's not an easy task. It's not like attending uh, uh, as an um, as a as a as a member of the audience, but uh, as um, the 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 effort is just uh, amazing. The energy that you brought up, uh, the time that other people had uh, uh, shared, uh, took to share the place with us here as well is. I think is uh, showing us all that uh, we are capable of spreading the knowledge that we have earned throughout the years. This is something that we know we can give constantly um, and it gives us happiness in return. Uh, so I uh, absolutely salute every one of you for the amazing work uh, that you had uh, demonstrated. And uh, obviously I take this opportunity to uh, uh, remind you all of the amazing conferences that are happening here in the Emirates, especially ADOR. It's happening uh, early uh, in the year at, on the 20th of uh, January. And following to that, we have the Emirates Society of Ophthalmology, where people from all over the world, they get to come. And we hope to meet you guys in person. Now that COVID the restrictions are being lifted, it's time for us to have that one-on-one -on -one and uh, face interactions. It makes the uh, value of our community even stronger. Us as ophthalmologists, we cannot thank you guys enough. You make our daily work a heaven and uh, keep doing what you do best. And thank you very much. And I really hope to have more opportunities to collaborate with every single one of you again. Uh, thank you, really thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your support. And uh, thank you for your Always time. Always a also. pleasure. Always a pleasure. Come on. Now I'll call upon Ms. Sana for giving vote of thanks. Thank you all for all the participants and world, happy okay. World Side Day to all, everyone. Over to you, Sana. Good evening, everyone. As we come to the end of our session today, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers who have spent their time in helping us improve our knowledge. They have shared their experiences and enlightened us with the trends of practices in eye care. I would also like to thank the, take this opportunity and thank Dr. Omnia Hamam from ESO to help us getting CME accreditation points for this session. I would also like to thank our sponsors Ion Care and Atomic Drug Store, and all our organizers who have worked behind the scenes to get this event a success. 
Also, to get your CME points, we will be sharing a feedback form on your registered email address. Kindly fill in that feedback form to avail your CME points and your certificates will be on your email. Also, we would like to announce that we will uh, soon be having offline session and continue to have online sessions like this. Stay tuned with us while we sign off for now until next time we meet again for our next webinar. Happy Worldside Day to all. See you all again. Goodbye.